Thank you, Chair. We're now live on YouTube. When you're ready, would you like to start the meeting? Mute. Thank you, Wendy. Um, good morning and welcome to East Devon District Council Virtual Planning Committee on the 16th of February 2022. I am your Chair, Councillor Eileen Rag. Um, based on the decision of the Council to continue virtual meetings until the 11th of May this year, I would like to remind both members and public attending or watching that this council has de delegated much of its decision-making power to our senior officers. We will continue to adhere as possible to the procedure, as closely as possible to the procedural rules detailed in our constitution. In the event of a break in the internet connection, please bear with us as we try to reconnect. After 15 minutes, if we are not able to reconnect, we will consider the meeting adjourned and reconvene at a later date. If you wish to comment, please raise your electronic hand and wait to be called. Any members of the public can view the agenda by visiting our website at www.eastdevon.gov.uk. We will now start the meeting by doing a roll call of committee members here present. So over to you, Wendy, for the roll call, please. Thank you, Chair. So I'll start with you, Councillor Rag. Present. Thank you. Vice Chair, Councillor Chamberlain. Present, thank you. Councillor Brown. Present, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Coleman, hopefully we'll make it later. So I'll move on to Councillor Davy. Present, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tessera. Present, thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Councillor Gazard. Present, thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Councillor Howe, hopefully we'll be joining us later as well. So I'll move on to Councillor Lawrence. Present, Wendy, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pook. Present. Thank you, Councillor Pratt. Present, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Skinner. Present. Thank you. And Councillor Woodward. Present. Thank you. Back to you, Chair. Back. Thank, thank you, Wendy. Um, agenda item one, the running order for today's meeting and the speakers can be viewed under agenda item one on pages five to six. Agenda item two, minutes of the consultative meeting held on 19th of January, 2022, pages seven to 11. If anyone has a comment on these minutes, please raise your electronic hand. If there are no raised hands, I will take this as an indication that you are happy that the minutes are noted. I see no raised hands, so those minutes are noted. Agenda item three, apologies. Wendy? We've received apologies from Councillor Bloxham, Councillor Key, <laughs> Councillor Whibley. And um, if Councillor Howe and Councillor Coleman aren't able to make it, I'll um, note their apologies as well. Thank, thank you, Wendy. Um, right, declaration of interest. There'll be a roll call for any declarations. So, Wendy, over to you. Thank you. If I could just remind members, uh, when I call your name, if you could just um, state the item number, what type of interest you're declaring and why you're declaring that interest. So I'll start with you first, Councillor Rag. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> in the past, I've had correspondence regarding um, item eight, that is 210103 full application for chestnuts. Um, I also had a phone call last week for item 11. That was for 55 Peaslands Road. So that would have been um, a lobbying. And for the item 17, Fifth Exmouth Sea Scouts, um, that's in the town ward. So I'll step out of the chair for that one. Thank you. Thank you. For item eight, you say correspondence. Uh, would you say that was lobbying as well, or just um, just general? It's hard to remember, but I think it was lobbying. 
It was some time ago. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Chamberlain. <coughs> Good morning. Thank you, Wendy. I don't have any declarations that I'm aware of at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Brown. Um, I'm the ward member for um, uh, 21 stroke 1497 and also the ward member for 21 stroke 2888. Thank you. Councillor Davey. <coughs> Thank you, Wendy. Um, I'm an Exmouth Town Councillor, so that's relevant to items 8 and 17. Uh, which are both in Exmouth and item 17 is also in my ward um, and I'll be speaking on that and I've also had correspondence with regard to the scout hut mainly um, reports of vandalism um, with an acquaintance of mine um, and we've been in correspondence recently where I asked him for a bit of background information about that building as well um, so those are all personal interests. Thank you. Councillor Tessera. Yes, Wendy, just, just two items. Um, item eight as a board member, which I will be speaking about when it comes to the committee stage. Um, I'm one of the board members. And item 17, because although it's, it's not in my ward, it says that the application relates to, is in the ownership of the East Devon District Council. So I'm also an expert town councillor, but I also note the fact that because it's in the ownership of East Devon District Council, the land, um, we have a, a, an interest in it that way to declare. So those are the two that I wish to declare. And thank you so much, Wendy. Thank you. Councillor Gazard. Yes, Wendy. I, item eight, I'm an Exmouth Town Councillor. Item 17, I'm an Exmouth Town Councillor. And as Bruce Tassaram, or Councillor Bruce Tassaram has said, um, item 17 is on East Devon District Council land. So just declaring an interest that I'm a, a East Devon District Councillor. And I also do know the, the person that runs the uh, scout, but that's just personal. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lawrence. Thank you, Wendy. Um, item 14, uh, 21 slash 1972. I'm the ward member and I will be speaking on that subject when it comes up. Um, and also based on uh, what Councillor Desarum said, item 17, because it's land belonging to East Devon District Council. Thank you. Councillor Pook. Thank you, Wendy. Item 18, uh, 1971 on the agenda. No, not 10. 9 on the agenda. 20, 28, 65. Commercial interest, as I'm connected with the um, the applicant, as I'll be, re I'll just remove. You know, you'll remove me from the room, I'm sure. Thank you. Sorry, okay. just making a note of that. Thank you, Councillor Pratt. Thank you. I'm a member of the East Devon AONB partnership, and this relates to item ten. It's a personal interest. Councillor Skinner. Um, unusual for me. I don't think I got anything, but if anything pops up, Wendy, I'll be sure to let you know. Thank oh, you. I will I will declare the obvious one, the one that was about the East Devon District Council land, which I would just assume would be a blanket that all of us yeah. would be covering ourselves with that one anyway. But I just made that point that uh, I've got no others that I'm aware of at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, um, Councillor Woodward. Just unmuting myself. Um, yes, as a uh, Exmouth Town Councillor, so items eight and the 17. And just for the sake of completeness, um, the public speaker on number eight, Gary Norton. Uh, good morning, Gary, is known to me, although um, only through we used to work together some 20 years ago. Um, but I just should declare that, that we've not had any correspondence or communications about this particular application. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Back to you, Chair. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, agenda item five, matters of urgency. There are no matters of urgency to discuss. Um, number six, confidential exempt items. Again, no confidential 
items or exempt items. Um, and agenda item seven, we go to planning appeals statistics, pages 12 to 24. Um, over to you, Mr. Rose, for an update. I note that we've had three which have been allowed. I don't know if you want to comment on any of those. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Morning, everybody. Yeah, so there's there's five decisions listed uh, this month, two of which were dismissed, but three of which were allowed. Uh, the first one, uh, Manor Crescent, related to a, a shed, large shed building in a flood zone that we refused on the basis it was in the flood zone. But you'll see that the uh, inspector considered the, the levels there were such that the building wouldn't be likely to flood. So allowed that appeal. Mm. Um, the second one is the water tower at Mount Pleasant. So that was for a uh, demolition of the water tower and a storage building. And that, that had followed a couple of appeal decisions on the site that were dismissed uh, but on this and, and for this scheme the inspector found that the removal of the tower uh, had a visual benefit to the area and that the provision of the uh, appeal building itself was had a, had a low impact uh, so concluded on that basis that the, the the reuse of the site for the storage was uh, was acceptable uh, and finally uh, sundown uh, at little mead in exmouth uh, it was a scheme where someone had come in to amend and make the size of the plot substantially smaller than what we had uh, had originally granted. We raised concerns about that, about being out of character with the area, uh, but the inspector uh, disagreed with that and, um, and allowed that appeal, uh, as I say, on the basis of uh, not feeling it had a harmful impact on the, on the character of that area. So three, uh, well, three appeals lost, but e each for different reasons. I suppose the only thing I would say is it does show that, uh, uh, as time goes on, the you know the, the the harm that has to be caused from development to be able to justify a refusal is 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 getting uh, has to be has to be uh, more significant as we move on for an inspector to uh, to uh, dismiss an appeal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Skinner. Your hands up. Do you have a comment on appeals? Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, quite an interesting one, um, Chair. Through you, and and we have overturned a few. I've led led one or two myself with with um, the flooding ones, and it's quite interesting that we've got one uh, that has been overturned by the planning inspector. And I just I just make the point really not not to over elaborate, but just to make the point of try to get where I wonder. If, through you to Mr. Rose, the understanding between flood issues and where the planning inspector is, because it's it's quite an interesting one. And you know, Chair, that we've had one or two um, mm -hmm. goes, haven't we, with, with flooding yeah. and, and different things, and we've overturned them. And I felt yeah. quite rightly that we did in some cases, but that doesn't mean overturning them all. It means you take each case as they come, and they're all quite different. And as Mr. Rose pointed out, the ones that have been turned over are all different in their own way. But the flooding one is a of particular interest because I just think it's a bit of guidance for us to understand where, uh, say, a little bit of perhaps common sense, but how we go with common sense against evidence base of the EA and and those sorts of things. So I don't think it's an open door to to just uh, go against um, flooding issues per se, but it would be interesting to have a discussion, perhaps not at this moment in time, but at another time about uh, where that stands with flooding and the environment agency and our decision making thank you yeah i, I agree but you know it, it's not been consistent um and i think it might be worth i don't know what mr rose thinks about having that conversation with the environment agency at some point perhaps we could invite somebody along for more clarification because it is it can be a gray area yeah i'm, ha I'm happy to do that Chair, I think um, we, we, we we've, not we, but the, the planning system has got to a position where I think a few years ago, if there was an objection from the Environment Agency, then that would probably be the end of a scheme. Mm. Whereas now, yeah. I think us and the inspectors are probably looking at a bit more detail about, well, what are those circumstances that have led to those objections? So in this case, for example, the inspector made their own assessment of the levels in relation to the flood zone and, and came yep. to their own conclusion. Yeah. And I think there's, there's, so I can certainly arrange that with the environment agency. And there's also a, a, an issue that um, as time goes on, I think the EA's mapping um, is getting, is being questioned more and more in certain circumstances. Um, I, can, I can see an agent on this call, nodding their head, knowing that uh, sometimes uh, their, their mapping and their comments don't, 
necessarily relate to what's on the ground, as in this case. And I think there's, there's, there's a good example of uh, even if they do object, we need to look what's behind that and look at the levels and make it make a decision based on that. Yeah, and I think in preparation for that might be helpful if members had any questions that they wanted to ask the Environment Agency prepared before we meet with them. So thank you for that, Mr. Rose. Um, right, agenda item eight. Um, here we have um, 210103 full application. It's minor one for chestnuts. 65 Salterdam Road, Exmouth, and that's pages 25 to 52. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Robert Masterson, uh, Gary Norton, who are objectors. Welcome to the meeting. Morning. <clears throat> and Thank you. Uh, Malcolm Gig, the agent, uh, familiar face here. Uh, I was, wouldn't say old face. Um, and then councillors Hookway and the Sarum Ward members who will speak on it. So over to you, Mr. Rose, to present um, the application, please. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so hopefully you can you can see my screen. So this uh, application relates to demolition of the, the buildings you can see in the red line here, which are a 14 bed house in Mock multiple occupation mm -hmm. and construction in its place of nine apartments. And you'll see in the report that there's objections from the ward members. The sites in the built up area bounce boundary so that the principle of residential development is acceptable and the building isn't listed, uh, isn't in a conservation area. Um, and if I just run through, so you, you can hopefully see the outline, dotted outline here. That's the footprint of the existing building on the site. And then you can see the footprint of the, the proposed building. You'll see from the photos that that this these wings at the rear are mainly single story at the moment, and there's a greater element of two story proposed through this scheme. And you'll also notice when you see the photos that whilst there's parking to this part of the front of the site, parking's proposed to be extended to cover more of that that front area. And in terms of elevations, this is this is what the building looks like. So we've got the the elevation to the, the street down here. So you can see two floors with the, the rooms in the roof. Uh, and then we've got the, the rear elevation where you can see that there's some single story and two story uh, rear. And then you can see the, the two side elevations. Mm. Uh, and then the, the floor plan. So uh, as, as I pointed out, we've got uh, the main bulk of the building here. And then we've got the two story wings off the back then a, this single story uh, element off the barrier as well. Um, and then we get the sections and you can see that the site is raised above the level of the road. So this is the, the front of the building. And then you can see it, the building in relation to the two adjoining properties that I'll mention uh, in a minute, Bronte Court, uh, and then the adjoining property. Uh, and you can just make out here, I think that the dotted line is the ridge height of the existing building. So other than this pitch here, we've got a very similar ridge height to the existing building. Uh, and this is the this is the aerial here of the site. So as I mentioned, parking covering half of the front area. Uh, and then you can see that the wings that are coming off the, the rear of the building. Um, I should say uh, the, the application has been amended since it was originally submitted um, and there was at the start of the application a further dwelling in the rear garden, mm -hmm. but that's been removed from this proposal. So these, this is the view from the street and you can see the car parking area with the existing access that's proposed to be moved. Uh, so car parking put on, the on, on some of the remainder of the frontage. Uh, and then you can see the relationship here with um, number 67 Salterton Road off this side. Um, and you can just make out Bronte Court to the, the opposite side. Uh, and then to the rear, we have the, these uh, rear extensions. So this is Bronte Court. So you can see quite sizable footprint, but uh, mainly single story offshoots to the rear at the moment. Uh, and this is the boundary with number 67. And then this is as you approach Bronte Court. So at the application sites off to the right, and then you can see the uh, retaining wall here. So the site's slightly higher and then the boundary planting. Uh, this is Bronte Court. So this is the rear uh, courtyard and parking area. And then these are the photos from the adjoining property number 67. So you can see the relationship there uh, with the house. And again here, 
Um, and in relation to this, there's, uh, as, as I say, similar footprint and height, but there's a two-story element projection coming off the rear here before you then get to a, a single-story uh, extension or, or wing, sorry. Um, so, uh, and there's 18 parking spaces proposed for the nine apartments. You'll see in the report, uh, the, the main issues to consider are the character appearance. So we've got uh, policies in the local plan and in the neighborhood plan that say that development should be mindful of the surrounding styles. We've also got an avenues design guide uh, here, which uh, replicates or talks you through the character of the area. And as you can see from this and oh, where are we? from the aerial, if I can get it. Um, what we've got here, the character is very large buildings, but in very large plots and those buildings being set back from the road uh, in substantial or in landscaped grounds. So that, that's the character of the area that the, the Avenues Design Guide seeks to, to retain and protect. We've got a fairly attractive building on the site at the moment, but it isn't, it isn't listed. Uh, there's no justification necessarily to retain it in itself, so it, its removal is, is acceptable. You'll see in the report that there's reference to a dismissed appeal back in 2005, 2006, where a scheme came forward, where the inspector considered that to be cramped out of character. The parking was unduly prominent to the front, uh, the greater noise to neighbours from the vehicles uh, and a lack of turning space on the site resulting in a highway safety issue at the junction. Whilst that appeal is relevant, it is 15 years ago. Uh, we've got a different plan in policy context to we had 15 years ago. Members will be aware there's more pressure now to reuse and make efficient use of brownfield land. And we've also got manual for streets, which is, a, which is the guide in terms of highway safety and parking. So whilst that appeal decision is relevant to a degree, you know, times have changed in that, in that 15 years. Um, and in terms of the design, we, as I say, we've got the same ridge line, we've got a similar footprint. It's still set back out in the site. There's land, some landscaping proposed to the frontage. It's a modern design building, but it's not, um, it's not unattractive in itself. Uh, oh, try and get the elevation. Not unattractive uh, in itself. And as I say, it's red brick and it's render. And there's a variety of styles in this in this area, as you can see from this aerial in terms of footprints and designs. Um, so it, I don't think the, the building will be out of character in terms of its design. There is car, the car parking to the front will be more visible at the moment, because as I say, the car parking is going to extend onto this other green area, a part of the site. And that does that does weigh against the proposal to an extent in terms of um, impacting on the character of that area where you've got limited parking areas to the frontages and quite a bit of landscaping. Um, but uh, in, in itself, that's not considered to be strong enough reason to uh, justify refusal. So on balance, those design and layout and car parking issues are, are considered to be acceptable. With regard to uh, amenity, so assessing, obviously the, the, the two adjoining properties will be impacted or could be impacted from this development. Uh, in terms of the impact on this property here, number 67, uh, which is uh, this property, uh, the removal of the dwelling to the rear, uh, well, it was requested by us because we felt that had an unacceptable impact looking back at the, uh, at the two neighboring <laughs> properties. But as you can see, this property in itself has a large garden. Uh, there will be a, a small sort of two and a half, three metre projection at two storey off the back here, but that's not considered to uh, be harmful enough to recommend refusal. And then single storey coming off the back. And again, given the boundary treatment, I don't think the level of harm is, is uh, great enough to justify uh, refusal. And uh, again, also don't feel that the building uh, would be uh, overbearing or, or oppressive. There will be a change, but not, not to a degree that's uh, harmful enough to justify refusal. And there will be uh, windows in the rear and windows in the roof. But again, they're considered to look down the garden and not create any greater levels of overlooking than, than you would already get from the existing windows. And the parking to the front, although it's going to be uh, increased in its area, the parking is already along the boundary with that property there. Mm. Moving on to... Bronte Court. Uh, this, 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 this. Uh, I think it was a McCarthy and Stone scheme yeah. off to the side. You can see yeah. that there's.
buildings here there's windows in the side facing this boundary treatment and they've got a car parking area to the to the rear uh, there are ground first and second floor windows here but they face onto the access road um, the site's raised slightly but it is set with the the proposed building is going to be set in slightly further from the boundary than the uh the existing building you can just see here it's set back ever so slightly to give a bit more of a, a, an area um, so there will be a, an increased presence. You know, you wouldn't, if you're in these flats, you will notice this increased depth mm. of projection and building there. But the retention of the planting boundary will uh, will help. And given it's across the access road, uh, and given that the windows in here are either high level obscured or they are angled, uh, there's not considered to be any overlooking on that property either. So. Whilst these two neighbours will notice a change uh, from the development, the, the impact isn't considered to be severe enough or harmful enough to, to re uh, justify refusal. And finally, with regard to highway safety and parking, as I say, there's two parking spaces per unit. I acknowledge the inspector's determination of the appeal some 15 years ago, but as I say, times have changed. We now have manual for streets. Um, DCC is the county highways have looked at the new access position. They are happy with it. They're happy with the visibility splays that are proposed. They're happy with the parking layout and there's adequate space within the site for those vehicles to turn and drive out to, onto the road. Um, and I think that's it from a highway safety uh, perspective. Uh, I think there is a, a bus that stops across the front here. So that bus, that stop will have to be moved as part of the development. Um, uh, but in terms of any other matters, all other matters of ecology, drainage, et cetera, are addressed. So on that basis, uh, the application is recommended for approval. Thank you. It, uh, I don't know if anyone remembers, but uh, a former clerk to this council used to live a couple of doors away from there. Um, a long time ago. Anyway, welcome to the meeting, Mr. Masterson. Would you like to speak now? You have three minutes. Yes, th thanks very much all. So this is uh, just uh, my, my four objections on uh, the pro proposed planning at 60, uh, 65 Chestnut Sorterton Road. The first one is that it's my understanding that the statutory time limits for local authorities deciding on applications for planning permissions are set out in Article 34 of the Town and Country uh, Development Management Procedure, England, of uh, 2015, <laughs> as amended. Again, my understanding of these time limits are 13 weeks for applications uh, for major developments, 10 weeks for applications for technical details consent, and from 1st of August 2021, applications for public service infrastructure development, and finally, eight weeks for all types of other development, unless an application is subject to an environmental impact assessment, which in, in that case is a 16 week time limit. So even if an environmental impact assessment, which I cannot really see on the planning portal, was required a 16 week decision period was applicable. A decision should th therefore, therefore have been made by Thursday, the 13th of May, 2021. Please can you confirm my understanding is correct? And if so, why a decision wasn't made within the statutory time limits? Objection to is loss of privacy due to the windows on the southwest elevation of the proposed building, whereas there are no, uh, no windows on the existing property that currently look into Mrs. Brantingham's property, who I'm representing, and there's also three more windows. Uh, objection three is disruption during construction. I note the proposed site plan shows a construction exclusion zone along the southwest elevation. Please can you confirm that the principal designer under the construction design and management regulations 2015 has sufficiently discharged their duties to eliminate foreseeable health and safety risks to anybody affected by the work, in particular the elderly residents of Bronte Court. Objection four is on road safety and non-motorised user considerations, in particular the uh, proposed site plan. 18 parking spaces, cycle and bin storage are identified this is a substantial increase to the existing provisions. There is no sign that this is the bus stop or where it's going to be relocated to. Two 70 metre visibility displays are identified, and I'm not too sure if uh, these are for Bronte Court or whether uh, for Bronte Court, but actually one of them runs through par parking space number one. The existing uh, traffic safety camera markings are shown, but not the location of the camera itself. 
with the above road safety and non-motorised user considerations in mind, please can you confirm that a road safety audit in accordance with GG119 and a walking, cycling and horse riding assessment um, and review in accordance with GG142, both of the design manual for roads and bridges have been undertaken. I notice as well, um, there's reference to the manual for streets as well, and, and that, I believe those contain the provisions of road safety audits. Furthermore, please can you contain if, uh, please can you confirm if any pro problems raised in either have been fully addressed. I also note that Planning Inspectors Appeal Decision Report of the Hi. 3rd of November dismissed the appeal and concluded that the proposal uh, would have harmful effects in terms of highway safety. Please can you confirm what measures have been undertaken in the revised application to address these harmful uh, effects. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Masterson. <clears throat> um, I'll go after the speakers have um, spoken. I'll go to um, Mr. Rose and Mr. Gig. Um, Gary Norton, I believe you're dialing in. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. You have three minutes. Thank you. OK, um, thank you very much. Um, objectors have submitted very justifiable arguments to the various applications for chestnuts during the last two years alone. But as these were submitted some time ago, I fear that the valid points raised may now have been forgotten by committee members. Instead, you have a very lengthy report setting out the reasons why you should approve the application and just a few bullet points without any real explanation as to why it should be refused. Chestnuts is not a dilapidated property needing demolition. It is a recently refurbished landmark building providing 14 much needed studio apartments for people in need at the lower end of the rental market. These individuals have apparently not been formally notified of the plan to demolish their homes. The proposal is for nine higher end apartments which will undoubtedly attract more second homeowners. Chestnuts was previously a rest home before the current studio apartments. Because of the nature of these uses, car ownership and car movements have always been relatively small on this site. The bedrooms in apartment nine will overlook our garden and more than one apartment will overlook Bronte Court. Development would generate an increased traffic movements near a bend on a busy road. Planners may feel that a rarely loaded speed camera on the opposite side of the road improves the safety aspect of the anticipated increase in vehicle movements but the main issue is the speeding vehicles coming round the bend travelling up Salterton Road and the close proximity to the Bronte Court entrance. Provision of a cycle store is good for recreational use, but won't replace planned car journeys. Do you think that someone is going to cycle to work in Exeter, go to Tesco's for the weekly shop, for a night out, or venture out in winter weather rather than take the car? Devon Highways have provided minimal guidance or no comment to planners throughout even though the applications have not followed their own rules, guidance and recommendations. We were pleased when the plans for the detached house in the back garden and second driveway arriving in the adjacent bus stop were finally dropped from the application. During 2021, following Devon Highway's apparent lack of interest and comment, I asked a highways consultant to look at the application and comment as though this was an appeal. Those comments were submitted in previous objection letters and mentioned in my email to Chris Rose on 20th of April 21. Even if you choose to ignore these observations, the members should refer to the Planning Inspectorate's report dated 3rd of November 2006 as someone completely independent. The recommendation report states that time has moved on and local residents don't understand why it doesn't apply today. Safety standards to protect pedestrians and car drivers apply as much today as they did in 2006, as do many of his comments contained in sections 14, 15, 17, etc. His report findings are even more relevant today, as the 44 retirement apartments in Bronte Court were not built at the time of Mr. Isaac's decision. These elderly residents now either own a car or use the bus stop outside number 67 as pedestrians or via their mobility scooters. Hi. Committee members can see that the proposed car park layout doesn't work on several levels. There are no visitor or delivery spaces, no disabled spaces, no electric charging points and no turning area. Car spaces 1, 2 and 10 will prove difficult to access and create potential safety issues as previously highlighted. It would have been beneficial to all concern if the developer had engaged with neighbours during the last two years to discuss and address their genuine concerns. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Norton. Um, now there's a statement to be read um, from Jean Brantingham. Do you have that one, Wendy? No, that was um, Robert Masterson spoke on behalf I see. of okay. Jean Brantingham. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Right, um, now to the agent, Malcolm Gig. Uh, welcome to the meeting. You have three minutes. Thank you, Chair. Chair, thank you for allowing me to talk before you today. We've worked very closely with the planning team to prepare and submit an application that would be supported. <coughs> We've therefore happy to see the office of support before you today is written for approval. However, we're aware of concerns. Apologies, um, Malcolm. Malcolm, I muted you by mistake. I was meant to mute Gary Norton. Sorry. Can, can we have that again then, please, and that time be added on? You just need, yeah, sorry. Sorry, Malcolm. Oh, yeah. Not a problem. Okay, off you go, Malcolm. All right, Chairman, thank you for allowing me to talk before you today. We've worked very closely with the planning team to prepare and submit an application that will be supported by the team. We are therefore happy to see the officer's report before you today is written for approval. However, we're aware of concerns and objections that from both residents and district councillors that have been put forward. We're content that the officer's report and the explanation by Mr. Rose has addressed all of the points raised. However, we'd like to address a few points. The main concern appears to be overlooking uh, Bronte Court um, to the southwest of the development site. Residents and councillors have stated that the proposals will be overbearing and offer overlooking of the site as the height of the building is increased on this side of the development from that of the original building. I can confirm that the building is higher on that side, though offers no overlooking as stated. The side elevations on both sides of the proposed building have fixed obscured glazing or high level glazing from bathrooms and secondary bedroom windows, neither offering overlooking. The officer's report and councillor's comments refer to a three-storey elevation on the boundary, though I'd like to draw your attention to the elevations on the drawings proposed and provided, these clearly indicating a two-storey building with a pitched roof over. In fact, the proposed eaves line matches that of the adjacent Bronte Court building. The elevation is on raised ground, though this makes up for the Bronte Court three-storey elevation against the proposed two-storey elevation of the new development. It's important to identify that the proposed building sits within the outline of the original footprint and the majority of the height of the building is lower than or matching that of the existing, with the exception of the elevation that I've just mentioned. The site is within the built up area boundary of Exmouth and is in a brownfield site and complies with the neighborhood plan. The design has been directed by the planners as a modern design was initially proposed on the site. Therefore, brick, render, pitch tiled roof is both in keeping and sits well within the street scene. The existing boundary hedge to Bronte Court has been retained and this only reinforces the screening and mature nature of landscaping on the site. The existing car park area is a very similar to that of the existing and has been moved over though the boundary to 67 now has grass in an area where it was tarmac so moving the vehicles further away. In conclusion, no overlooking has been created by the scheme. The building will have the same level eaves as the adjacent apartments. The scheme has the support of the town council, East Devon Tree Officer, East Devon Environmental Health, Devon Highways, Southwest Water, Devon County Flood, and the East Devon Planning Team. We would therefore ask the committee to follow the planning officer's recommendations and approve this scheme before you today. Thank you. Thank you. And I think I would substitute has the support of the various agencies as that they have no objection, um, which is a little bit different. Um, right, now we go to the ward members. Councillor Hookway, please. Thank you, Chair. I'm speaking to the committee today as I wish to object to the planning application for the demolition of the existing property and the redevelopment to provide nine apartments. I also wish to reiterate that I have been lobbied 
by the architect of the application. Further to my comments in the officer's report, I wish to stress to the committee that I believe that the design that is presented in the application, which has been described as, quote, traditional local vernacular architecture, unquote, whatever that means, is inappropriate for this location. I consider that this application has presented a design that is unpleasant to the eye, with an inappropriate style, is too large, and has a mass that is too great. However, my main concern with this application is the harm it, it will cause to the residents of Bronte Court. I'm going to say something that hopefully will be apparent to this committee, which is at present that the property of number 65 does not overlook Bronte Court. So if this application is approved, then the apartment block will overlook Bronte Court by its height and increased mass. And that is a situation that I find completely unacceptable. The proposed apartment block by overlooking Bronte Court will cause, quote from the report, significant harm to the residential amenities of the occupiers of such surrounding properties, unquote. If this does not show up clearly on the plans, and I have looked at the site and seen it, then please my recommend a site visit. <coughs> I believe that it is the duty of this committee to protect those people who live in sheltered accommodation, such as Bronte Court. These residents I classify as vulnerable. Let's face it, many of us will end up in such accommodation, and it's not a pleasant prospect. In my experience, being in sheltered accommodation can be very hard to bear. I have noted in the past that some residents in such situations literally lose the will to live, especially when they have to deal with the ongoing pressure and hassle that a planning application like this can bring. As a council, I believe that we should be protecting vulnerable residents from this type of pressure. I do appreciate that all involved have gone to some lengths with this application, but I feel that the development at the site needs to be reappraised and reconsidered to be more considerate of the surrounding residents and properties. As I've said, Bronte, Co Bronte Court is not overlooked at present. Therefore, why would we allow a development that would overlook it? Please, committee, refuse this application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hookway. Councillor Desarum, please. Um, I'm happy to go into it with committee at the committee level, uh, Chair. Are, 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 we, are we there yet? No, we're not there yet. I'll, um, I'll wait till committee then and speak at committee, please. Bit like Donkey from Shrek. Um, right. Uh, I'm going to take questions, please. Or, or Mr Rose and Mr Gabe will take questions. Um, particularly in response to the questions asked by the objectors. Um, can I go to Mr. Rose first, please? Can you take any of those questions, Mr. Rose, or would you yep. rather? I no, I'm happy. To, no, I'm happy to. Um, yes. Yeah, so um, the first one raised was about the timescales. Um, yes, there are eight and thirteen week timescales for consideration of applications, but they're they're purely timescales after which, if we don't make a decision, an applicant can appeal a decision. In this case, we've worked with the uh, with the applicant's agreement to see if we can get get a scheme that uh, has improved on that originally submitted. Yeah. Yeah. With regard to uh, windows, I think has been mentioned as well by Councillor Hookway, this is the elevation that faces mm -hmm. Bronte Court and you can see ground floor level uh, that there's existing uh, tree planting there, but you can see there's high level windows along the side and there's angled windows that only give uh, oblique views. And at the, this, this uh, upper floor level, we have high level windows or the other windows are obscure glaze to prevent any overlooking back towards uh, Bronte Court. So I appreciate that the occupiers of Bronte Court will um, be able to uh, uh, see the side of this building and a slight increase in height, um, but, uh, but there's an access where uh, there's the driveway between, uh, there's this hedge, and as I say, they're either high level or obscure glazed uh, windows in that elevation to prevent uh, any overlooking. Uh, and there's also a condition on the application to, to ensure that. Um, there was a concern about or a question about uh, construction, uh, you know, complying with uh, construction 
legislation requirements will be for the developer, but there is a Kemp condition proposed on the application to uh, control the construction times and deliveries, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a further question about road safety audit. That's not considered to be required by Devon County. Oh. And you'll see from their assessment of the application that they're, they're happy with the parking numbers, which is two spaces per dwelling, which accords with our design, uh, with our parking requirements, there's turning for the vehicles on site, the distance between junctions, the uh, county highways ex are acceptable with, they're happy with the visibility displays, and therefore they feel that the proposal complies with manual for streets, the current um, you know, assessment uh, uh, for yeah. highway safety. Um, I, think, I think that was it. Thank you very much, Mr. Rose. A lot of those points were well made and um, I think, Many committee members will be aware of them anyway. Um, Mr. Gig, would you like to respond to any of the points made, questions asked? Yes, happily. Um, as Mr. Rose has quite clearly shown on the side elevations, um, the windows are at high level. They're either fixed glazed um, or they are um, oblique to a 45 degree angle. So looking front and rear rather than head on. Um, the important thing to remember in this area is, as Mr. Rose has said, all the foliage on the site plan is clearly shown to the boundary to be retained. Um, you had an image looking, that's the one, you had an image looking down the side there, you can see the height of the mature um, foliage on the boundary, and you can clearly see that this is going to screen the, um, the ground floor windows, which are the ones looking out onto this area. Um, the, the upper windows um, are set above 1750 so it's not eye level you can only look up at the sky because they're secondary windows within the rooms just letting borrowed light in they're not actually um, allowing um, any views out or being able to open them yes. the two dormers to the rear on the second story element at the back where the arrow is adjacent to um, they're both for bathrooms and kitchens and they have a top fan light only and they're they're fixed obscured otherwise now, if you look on the site plan, what you can see is um, the back element of the building is actually beyond that um, side elevation of Bronte Court. So you can actually see on the roof plan, you can see the dormers outlined um, and you can see that even if they were visible, they would be looking across a car park of Bronte Court. However, I can assure you they are not um, able to look out of them. Um, with regards to um, the, um, the road safety, um, I agree, Devon County have confirmed that the six metre gap between the parking spaces, one of the objectors raised there would be concern being able to park in some of the parking um, spaces, is in line with the, the streets manual um, and reversing the six metres is the allowable distance um, between parking spaces. Um, also, the entrance and highway have all been dealt with with highways to ensure that they comply with their requirements. Um, I suppose the final point that um, Mr. Rose has mentioned previously, but didn't just now, is this appeal decision that's been raised from um, some time ago, some 15 years ago. Um, we've looked into this with the planning consultant as well. And the points, as Chris, uh, Mr. Rose has raised, are that this is out of date information and the new highways reports and documents that have now come into place um, supersede this decision. Um, and therefore we followed the advice that is set out currently um, for this site. Um, I don't think at this time there's anything else I'd like to add, but thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Gig. Now <clears throat> I'm going to go to members for questions only. So. Oh, can you lower your electronic hand, please, unless you have a question? Right, I've got Councillor Davey. Do you have a question for Mr. Gig, please? I do, Chair, thank you. Um, I, I'm just interested in why it is considered necessary to demolish that building. It doesn't appear to me um, a particularly poor state of a building. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Um, it's quite an attractive building and to my mind it, it's got a nice symmetrical frontage which is going to be replaced with what to me is a slight mishmash of a frontage um, which isn't so attractive. Um, 
I'd also like to ask um, whether there's any affordable housing included in this. I haven't seen any mention of that, and I wonder if that's the reason why 14 apartments are being replaced with nine because it brings it below the requirement um, to uh, provide some affordable housing. So I'd just be uh, um, grateful if Mr Gig could answer those two questions. Thank you. Mr Gig. Yes, happily, thank you. Um, the replacement of the building um, is twofold. One, um, the existing structure due to its depth on the main structure and it, the, the building itself is difficult to convert. However, um, I've had a client come to me with a site asking to redevelop. Um, I wouldn't normally be in a position to be able to um, argue with him and say, we can't demolish it um because you purchased it if you want to so unfortunately i i've taken an instruction from a client um i agree the building is very attractive uh, i used to live opposite it um for many years um so i know it very well um however the the affordable side that you've mentioned yes 10 is the threshold um we've looked at the footprint of what is the existing building and as you can see on the site plan that was um, provided before we have tried to stay within that so that we are looking at a building which fits on the site and doesn't a feel like it's wider which it isn't it's narrower um that it's deeper which would cause impact to neighbors um or make it higher which i'd have to add an additional story to be able to get more units in so unfortunately working with the footprint that we have and we've created three and two bedroom apartments i actually feel we've maximized that site that has ended up with nine units. If I was trying to maximize that site and, and squeeze as many in as I could, I'd go for 10 um, or 11. Um, the threshold, unfortunately, for affordable is 10, and we are at nine. It, it's simply through design, that's how it's ended up. Um, I don't know how to explain that any further, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Gig. Um, Councillor Skinner, you have a question? Yes, just, just a quick one, and I, I threw Mr. Rosely, and may, maybe Mr. Gig could help, but uh, what I am, as we're moving forward, and especially uh, going forward with our plans, is there, would there be any any way that um, there would be some provision for electric car charging on the site? Is that something that could be incorporated into the scheme through condition at this point, or is that not something we could particularly ask for? Yes, yeah, so through you, Chair. So our, our policies at the moment say that we can uh, secure car charging points on major developments, and this isn't a major development. Yeah. But um, I, I suppose the question would be to Mr. Gig whether his client might be willing to willing to provide that anyway. Mr. Gig, this is a conversation we've actually had with the client because we're trying to add EV charges onto as many developments as we can do. Um, the client would be um, happy to add a couple of EV charging points into the site. Yes. We need to make sure there's enough KVA to be able to run them. But um, we found some low inviscity ones that can run in the evenings. So, yes, that, that we'd be quite happy to look at that. that thank you, Mr Gig. I um, answer your questions to, as Councillor Skinner. Yes, thank you. Just ready to rock on to the next part. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. OK, thank you. Um, my concern about this is, although I accept there's no overlooking uh, into Bronte Court, it's the mass it is a mass, and I just wonder, I know this came up quite some time ago, whether it was on this council or another council I was on, um, about the psychological effect on residents, just knowing it's there. Would that be um, a factor which might be taken into consideration? Over to you, Mr Rose. Yeah, so we need to look at, uh, as the report does, the, the overlooking from the windows, which I think I've addressed, and then yeah. any any uh, oppressive or impact from the, the bulk of the building. Um, yeah. And yes, you, you can you can get such a thing as some sort of perception of harm from being mm. caused from a from a development. But uh, I think as we've, we've tried to explain here, the the you know we've you've got an existing footprint of building. This one's being set in slightly slightly further from the boundary this rear wing actually faces into the car parking area here um, and, and it's not an unusual situation to have um, you know windows at the sides of properties um, so I, I understand that that 
from these windows to these properties in Bronte Court, uh, they will perceive a change in their outlook. But I, I don't think that change is, is, is harmful enough to justify a refusal. Okay, thank you. And one uh, comment that's come through on the WhatsApp is that um, screening foliage can be removed, but in condition five, it says that any loss of foliage um, or tree planting would have to be replaced with similar species. Um, and I, I think that that answers that question. Right, then we'll go into committee now. Um, Councillor Desarum. Good morning. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, having, having listened very carefully to the debate, I find that this is a difficult one simply because the starting point is the fact that we are in the built-up area boundary for Exmouth. However, I'd like to point out that the NPPF at para 130 suggests that developments should be vis visually attractive as a result of good architecture, layout and appropriate and effective landscaping, are sympathetic to local character and history, including the surrounding built environment and landscape setting, while not preventing or discouraging appropriate innovation or change. The reason why ward members have raised their concerns are the fact that they feel that this proposal will have a harmful impact to the residents of Bronte Court, as the report clearly indicates, where it states the proposed apartment block would have a degree of impact on the amenities of the occupiers of surrounding properties as a result of its increase in height, bulk and massing. This is the issue for the committee members to consider today. Members can see from the report that this site has a history of development proposals, of which this one is the latest version. As I said in my comments in the report, I acknowledge the fact that the proposal has been amended and no longer includes the construction of a detached two-storey four-bedroom dwelling at the rear of the proposed apartment block, as it clearly states at page 36. I am also aware, as the report indicates, and as Mr Rose has pointed out this morning, that the policy position has changed since the 2005 appeal. However, I am still of the opinion that the proposed harm to the residents of Bronte Court is significantly greater than or equal to that of the situation in the 2005-2006 appeal, because as it says at page 41 of the report, the submitted section drawing demonstrates that the building would significantly increase in height over the existing single story element of the building and would introduce a three story building where the two stories would reach the height of one e of the eaves of Bronte Court with a pitched roof form sloping away from Bronte Court. Furthermore, it could be suggested that it doesn't meet policy D1 because as I've mentioned, the issue to consider is about height, bulk and massing. Policy D1 is very clear where it states, proposals will only be permitted where they respect the key characteristics and special qualities of the area in which the development is proposed and ensure that scale, massing, density, height, fenestration and materials of the building relate well to their context. The ward members have argued today that they do not believe that this is to be the case and so I've asked the committee to refuse this application, even though it has been argued it's been on a similar footprint. And I'd asked the refusal by virtue of its increase in height, bulk and massing, and its relationship with the surrounding property, Bronte Court, which would lead to a degree of overlooking, or a high degree of overlooking and a loss of privacy and significant harm for Bronte Court residents. And it would appear out of character with its surroundings being of much higher density. It is therefore my opinion, and that of my fellow ward councillors, that is contrary to policy D1 and the NPPF at para 130. I I fully understand and appreciate we've taken on board the agent's comments that the windows are at high level, looking front and rear, but I still feel, as my fellow ward member said, that the design could be classified as unpleasant, too large, and a mass too great. So for those reasons, uh, as I've just discussed, I would ask the committee to go for a refusal, and obviously I would await to see whether I have a seconder willing, willing to support such a proposal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So we have a proposer. Uh, I'll second. refusal and councillor skinner was that you no can no I, no i won't be seconding that I, i'll be going the other way so don't not me i don't know who it is yes councillor gazard councillor gazard so we've had a proposal for refusal and it's been seconded councillor skinner oh councillor gazard would you like to speak on it no, I think Councillor Desarum has put it extremely well, Chair. Um, Thank you. I, 
I fully endorse what he says, and I'm also really disappointed, um, as one of the um, objectors said, that there's been no consultation with neighbours. Um, you know, it, it, it's a shame that that hasn't taken place, but I fully support what Councillor Desiree has said. Thank you, Chair. Um, I see Mr Gig uh, shaking his head. Would you, I think it's fair that you should be allowed to respond to that. Thank you. Um, Mr Norton and myself have stood in his rear garden. I've taken photos of the property and provided 3D images of the original schemes. Um, we have met with Mr Norton. We have been open and transparent with him. We've listened to him and that's where this redesign has come from. So I'm sorry, I, I have to disagree with that comment. But thank you for giving me that. Thank you, Mr. Gabe. Can, uh, can I, sorry, Jack, then can I um, apologise to, to uh, Mr. Giggs um, uh, for making that aware to me? I wasn't aware of that. Thank you. Yes, of course. And I think there's been a lot of um, negotiation with um, the, the officers as well. Uh, Councillor Skinner. Uh, just well done to Councillor Gazzard. Well done for, for, for apologising. But the pro you're a proper man, a proper chap. The gazelle, that's why you do the right thing. Um, yes, as far as this application is concerned, when we talk about mass and we're talking about scale and we're talking about size, um, I, I would have, if Mr. Rose, I don't know, could you flick the pictures to the um, the the drawing that was um, that one, that one, that one there? That's it, yeah, yeah thank you. Um, because really, what this does is it sets out and sets the scene for actually where where, where things are, and, the, and and you know, we've heard lots of discussions about overpowering overlooking and, and and all the rest of it and, and regarding the issue that was raised earlier uh to mr gig um and and of course they, you know of course he has an applicant comes to him and says i'd like to knock this building down and, and do something else uh this this to me um is is how i believe development will need to take place not only next month but in other parts of east devon as well by Having buildings that were built for a certain purpose and then they turn into apartments and they, they set, set a function for a certain, a certain period of time and then it becomes an investment value and, and how it could be set out better. And for me, um, having this building where it is, I don't think it increases anything too much. I think it, uh, I think it looks well. It fits well. I think it fits into the modern day society and it's actually going to uh, increase the amount of people uh, my understanding is by having nine apartments increase the amount of people being able to use this site. What we've got to do, having a little bit more height, we've got to start to go up a little bit within our major towns and some of our areas because we've got to accept we either go up a little or we're going to go out into the countryside even more. And that debate's been taking place within strategic planning on many occasions with views one way and views another. Um, in this particular circumstance, I think it's making really good use of a particular building and bring it in, into the modern day as I suggested. And I see that the overlooking the part has all been, all those questions have been answered. I was pleased that Mr. Gig was, and through Mr. Uh, Rose as well, was able to answer uh, regarding the um, um, electric car generation. And I, I understand going forward how that would be taken on. And that's really quite important how we go on because that is, I believe, going to be the future. So we need to set that in stone at these points. And I, and I actually believe that the, the the way that this is set out, the building set, is, is really quite a credit, really, to be honest with you. And I think it, uh, it only, uh, I won't say it enhances the area exactly, but it certainly doesn't demigrate it from a position from knocking something else down to making something, putting something worse. I think it sits very well. I like the design of the building. And I think it's a modern building and no doubt there'll be other factors that come into this that haven't been suggested. And that is probably the economics of running a building, a new building like this is going to be far cheaper than running probably the older house that was there in, in running that one before. And obviously the owners of this have gone through all that particular process and, and want to uh, uh, ensure that they get into a place of having something, something better. I think it benefits the town. It fits within, I, I believe, um, I'm right in saying through you, Chair, that it, that it fitted the neighbourhood plan. I think it was uh, suggested earlier, and Mr Rose can neither confirm or deny that. If I've got that wrong, I'll put my hand up and apologise now. But I think it did fit the Exmouth town plan, the neighbourhood plan that they put forward. And it ticks many boxes of what I believe is the way forward that we will probably be needing. And I think I think we're going to see applications such as this coming forward even more in Exmouth. So I'm going to, well, I can't, I can't move, can I, to uh, chat? No, 
move. But um, I'm, I'm not going to be supporting a refusal of this. I'm going to be going with the officers. I think they've worked quite hard on this over a long period of time and with the agent and obviously worked quite hard together to come up with something that will really work. And I'm really supportive of it. And I shall be, if, if, if it were to fail, I would like to put forward that I'll put forward the nomination of going with the officers' recommendation of approval. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not against this plan, um, and I don't feel that the, the harm to the uh, inhabitants of Bronte Court um, it is a particular problem. What I do find is a problem, it is it's a social problem and, a, and an issue, is that at the moment, as I understand it, um, this property has 14 affordable um, small apartments. Um, and what's going to happen to these people? Because they won't be able to afford to buy these, these apartments when they're built. The nine new apartments are going to be sold probably as holiday homes or, or, or second homes or, or whatever. And, and, and it means that 14 people or families are going to be moved out. Well, where are they going to go? That's not a planning consideration. I, I, I know it isn't, but it is a social consideration. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, well, it's not for this committee. Um, there are no more speakers, I see. So unless anyone raises their hand, I'll go to Mrs Shaw then. Sum up, please, Mrs Shaw. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I couldn't get unmuted. Right, members, before you have... You've gone quiet, Mrs. Shaw. You're on mute. I can you can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. <laughs> Lovely. Right, members, you have a motion to recommend refusal by reason of height, bulk, and mass, the high a high degree of overlooking and out of keeping with the setting, uh, contrary to policies D1 and paragraph 130 of the MPPF. When your name is called, please would you indicate whether you're in support of the motion to recommend refusal, whether you're against the motion to recommend refusal, or whether you're abstaining from the vote. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll start with Councillor Brown. Support the motion for refusal. Thank you. Councillor Chamberlain. Councillor Chamberlain. Okay, I'll come back. Councillor Davy. Support refusal. Thank you. Councillor De Serum. Support motion to recommend refusal. Councillor Gazard. Support refusal. Councillor Lawrence. Support refusal. Councillor Pook. Against refusal. Councillor Pratt. Support refusal. Councillor Skinner. Yep. Against refusal. Councillor Woodward. Against refusal. Councillor Rag. Abstain. And Councillor Chamberlain. Are you able to hear me? Yes, I am. I'm back now. I'm sorry. I keep getting disconnected for some reason. Um, I got to the part where you were just going to the vote. I heard the rest, but I'm going to abstain on this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we have two abstentions. We have three votes against refusal and one, two, three, four, five votes for refusal. So that application is recommended for refusal. Thank you, Wendy. And uh, thank you to all the speakers. That was quite a tricky one. Um, we go on to agenda item 10, application 213255, full application, building north of Harbour Close, Coombe Pine, and that's on pages 68 to 83. Um, I'd like to welcome to the meeting Nicholas Wright, Anna Ball, Catherine Bromage, and Ward Member Councillor Thomas. Welcome to the meeting and over to Mr Rose to present his report, please. 
Thank you, Chair. So this application is for a change of use of part of a building to B2 use or more specifically for shot blasting uh, and retention of a small extension at the side that comprises an air compressor. And it's here because there's an objection from the ward member. Um, and as uh, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about uh, and related to the app this application is about uh, a noise and a noise assessment, uh, Ian Winter, an environmental health officer that's been involved in this application, is on this call today if members have any particular questions about uh, the noise impact and calculations. Um, just before I run through these plans, uh, yesterday we received uh, two further letters of support for the proposal, uh, which aren't listed in your, in your report. Um, so this is the, the location of the site. You can see its relationship to uh, the dwellings in the, in the settlement here. And the, the blue is the land owned from the applicant. And the red is the part that relates to this, uh, this building. And we've got the existing elevations of this uh, building here, existing uh, floor plans. And then we've got the proposed elevation. So there's the retention of this, this small extension on the side. And then this is where the shot blasting is proposed to be to be carried out. Oh, um, so these are the aerial photos. You can see the amount of, of tree planting. You can see the relationship of the building to the closest uh, residential properties. Um, and this is the, the building itself on the site. Um, and I'll talk about its lawful use in a minute. And this is the, the shot blasting area uh, that you can see there. Uh, and then the, the, uh, the small building with the, the houses, the compressor uh, off to the side there that's proposed to be retained. There we go. Um, so the site's in the ARMB, um, but the use of the site for plant for a plant hire business is lawful. So over time, that's gained uh, lawfulness. Uh, that was um, supported by a, a certificate of lawfulness that was granted in 2020 for the B8 use of the site and a further certificate of lawfulness for the office and store on the site uh, in 2021. So uh, everything else that's going on at the site uh, is lawful other than in relation to this, uh, this shot blasting room, this part of the building itself, everything else uh, that's happening on the site uh, is lawful. Um, the, there was a previous application on the site to allow the B to use shot blasting that was refused last year uh, on noise grounds and an enforcement notice was served to to cease the use that refusal and enforcement notice are the subject of a current appeal. And that appeal uh, is in abeyance at the moment awaiting the outcome of this application. Um, but as I stress that all we're dealing with as part of this application and the appeal is this uh, shot blasting area here and that that small extension. Uh, so, as I say, can't, I can't reiterate enough that the, the lawful use of the remainder of the site and this part of the site for plant hire uh, is established and it has been carried out over the last 20 odd years. Um, and it's important to recognize that because that's the, the current or the lawful noise that's been going on there is the sort of base level for, for what has happened historically. Um, it, is a, it is a fairly quiet area in the ARMB. Um, we're about 80 meters to the nearest residential dwelling. Uh, and you can't really see the buildings from outside of the site. So there's no wider visual impact uh, proposed from, the, uh, from that small extension. And there's support in principle uh, in the local plan under policy E5 to the expansion and support of existing businesses in the countryside. So mm -hmm. in light of that, the main issues outlined in the report are the noise impact from the shot blasting and the impact on residential amenity. Um, now that you can see, hopefully from the photos, that, that shot blasting is an enclosed area and the compressor is in that lean to extension. Um, an acoustic report was submitted with the last application that was refused that proposed uh, mitigation to the building. So uh, insulation, noise insulation to the walls, ceiling of gaps, heavy duty door, etc. Th those enhancements have now been implemented since that previous refusal. Uh, and, um, and there's been further acoustic work carried out to the compressor. Um, so in light of that work, a new noise assessment has been submitted with that, this application and that noise assessment has carried out readings uh, at the site and next to the closest uh, dwelling to the site. Um, and that's showing that over the previous application, there's a reduction in the noise levels 
uh, of depending where you are between eight decibels and five uh, and therefore we're at or lower than the background noise level now that those mitigation uh, factors and, and works have been put in place. And in addition to that, the applicant has agreed that the shot blasting only be carried out at 9 a.m. to 12 or to noon, Monday to Friday. So that's three hours a day, Monday to Friday. Mm -hmm. So it's considered that those mitigation works that have been carried out plus those hours uh, will, will mean that there'll be no harm to neighbors from uh, noise from the shot blasting. Despite that, you'll see in the report, there still are concerns from the neighbors raised about noise from the site. Um, some of that hasn't, well, I don't think all of any of that's been picked up in the noise survey. Some of that could be from the lawful use on the site. So the moving of these vehicles and this stuff you can see in the picture is lawful and by itself will, will make a noise. There will be some noise from the metal being moved in and out of the, the shot blasting room, but that should be very infrequent. There may be additional vehicles from the use proposed, but again, that should be quite low level. Um, so it, so I, I don't think the noise or we don't feel the noise level will be uh, significantly above uh, anything that can lawfully happen on the site at the moment. In terms of the AOMB, the report gob on to talk about the impact on the AOMB because as well as the visual impact on the AOMB, we have to protect its tranquility uh, and we need to give that great weight. But as I've talked through, we've had those noise reports that mitigation has been put in place. Uh, and ourselves and the environmental health officer are satisfied that with that mitigation in place, there'll be no greater noise uh, over and above what can already happen on the site. So no greater impact on the AOMB. So in conclusion, we've got expansion of an existing business in a rural area that has uh, support in principle. There's mitigation being proposed for the shot blasting, plus there's hours proposed uh, or recommended uh, as part of any approval to control the hours that can be carried out, that there will still be other noise carried out from the site, but that's lawful from those lawful uses. Uh, so there's not considered to be any greater harm to the immunity or residents or the AOMB subject to those work and hours. So in light of that, the application is recommended for approval. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rose. I have to say, I was somewhat surprised to see that shot blasting um, could be operational in an AOMB. Um, is is that usual? Well, it, well I, I, as I was trying to explain, it comes. It, well, it's not that usual to have uh, yeah. noisy businesses in there and B, which is why, um, well, Ian Winter from Environmental Health has been so heavily involved to make sure that there's no mm. greater noise impact on either the, the residents nearby or the tranquility of the A and B. Right. Thank, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll bring him in after all the speakers uh, have spoken for any questions from co committee members. So um, please put your hands up only if you have a, a question for the environmental health officer. Right, uh, Nicholas Wright, welcome to the meeting. You have three minutes. Okay, so uh, thank you. That This application for B2 is implicit acknowledgement that the activity causes detriment to the amenity of the surrounding area. If this shot, shot blasting process didn't cause nuisance, then an application for B1 would be sufficient. The case officer states that the insulation has effectively contained the noise. Well, if that's the case, why does it need B2? B1 should be sufficient. The officer also states that some, if not all of the noise, may be attributed to the current lawful activity. Those who actually know the site know that statement to be grossly untrue. Residents are all familiar with the noise associated with the site prior to the shot blasting, and we, all, we know all too well the shout sound of shot blasting. The noise that causes distress to the residents comes from the shot blasting. The officer gives credence to the applicant's noise level data, which is questionable. In December, environmental health recommended an additional noise assessment. We question why that has changed. But the issue for neighbours isn't as simple as the level of noise. It's the type of noise, the duration. It's like tinnitus, unending. The report also suggests that there are other sources of noise in the village environment. Well, of course there are. Tractors, mowers, strimmers, chainsaws. All of those noises are part of our life. But they last for minutes, maybe hours, maybe a few days. But they end. Whereas this shot blasting goes on for hour after hour, day after day, unending. The case officer suggests that this application is supported by policy E5, creating jobs for local people. Where is the evidence for that? What supporting information is there? What full-time jobs are nine to 12? Employing the son of a friend for a few hours recently is no evidence of job creation. 
what effects will creation of more jobs have on the amenities of the local area? So I would argue that E5 is not relevant and the recommendation is contrary to the local plan. In planning applications, there is often weight given to sustainability of the application, but not surprisingly in this case. These items for shop blasting need to be transported from Chard to Coombe Pine, then transported back. Would it not be more sustainable for the shop blasting to be done in Chard on an industrial estate? So we would argue that this proposal is contrary to the local plan and the conditions suggested are unenforceable. The activity causes detriment to the amenity of the surrounding area and the AOMB. The majority of residents, the parish council, the ward member all oppose this application. So I would implore the members voting on this proposal to imagine the permanent impact that approval would have on this village and to come and justify their vote to the people whose lives may be permanently blighted. The case officer's summary is flawed. There are incorrect assumptions. The applicant's submissions are unquestioned. The resident's concerns are ignored and policy is misapplied. This application should be rejected. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Anna Ball, you have three minutes. Welcome to the meeting. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Coombe Pine is a small, secluded Devon village in an area of outstanding natural beauty. It has no village amenities such as a pub, shop or school, and all the properties lie snugly in a steep-sided valley along a single track lane. In the centre of the village lie several grade two homes and a delightful grade one 12th century church. This is all directly opposite the site under planning consideration, which is visual. We moved here 11 years ago seeking a home in such a, a peaceful place. While we understand this is a farming community and accept short-lived noise levels, all of us in these few houses are elderly. And at our age, we should not have to fight our own council for the right to a peaceful retirement. I'm sure you would not want to accept the level of annoyance around your own homes. We and many other residents are deeply concerned that if B2 permission were to be granted, an irrevocable precedent would be set for this lovely tranquil village, jeopardizing not only us, but future generations. Future decisions and actions stemming from granting B2 would have grave consequences on this peaceful village. Owners of grade two properties are obligated by the council to maintain and preserve our homes to strict standards. It would therefore seem unsound to spoil the environment with unwarranted industrial business and constant levels of disruptive noise. There is no other industrial process in Coombe Pine. Sadly, these noise levels that we have experienced over the last three years have had detrimental effect on the health and general well being of myself my husband and other nearby residents. Contrary to the executive summary, we and other residents of Coombe Pine are still experiencing significant noise from Mr. Perry's site with both shop blasting and large vehicle movements. Mr. Perry's conduct towards us and other residents has been extreme, damaging our property in relation to us for objecting to the past planning application. The police advised us to install CCT and they have logged three incidents. Therefore, in conclusion, we feel it would be totally inappropriate to further jeopardize the quality of life of this 12th century village of Coombe Pine by approving B2. I trust you will vote with integrity, and I thank you for listening. Thank you, Mrs. Ball. <clears throat> and now we have the agent, I believe she's dialing in, Catherine Bromage. Hello, good morning. Morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. You have three minutes. Fantastic. Thank you. 
Thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of the applicant and in support of your officer's recommendation this morning. Um, the application that is before the committee today was submitted to the council in agreement with officers following the installation of sound attenuation at the site. I'm sorry, uh, can I stop you there? Um, you're very muffled. Is me better now? That's better. Right. Better. Close to a window, that's all. Um, shall I start again? Yeah. Um, yes, please. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so thank you for obviously allowing me to speak on behalf of the applicant and in support of your officer's recommendation for approval. Um, the application that's before clipped today was submitted to the council in agreement with officers following the installation of sound attenuation at the site and to enable formal reconsideration of the proposal. The applicant is a local business owner with a strong connection to the village. Harbour Farm previously belonged to the applicant's parents who also lived at Harbour Close. The applicant has operated and repaired business from Harbour Farm since the mid-1980s has relatively recently diversified the business to include shop lasting. Specifically, the applicant cleans and prepares um, new tarmac hoppers ready for painting. The hoppers are collected in an assembled kit form and later delivered to painting assembly off-site. The hoppers are eventually installed onto vehicles owned by the county council. The operation is a part-time venture undertaken around existing work commitments and therefore occurs for only a few hours a day part-time worker has been taken on to assist. The scale of the operation is very small and as such sorry, I just lost my place. And as such not adversely um, adversely affect local residents or the relative tranquility of the air and the development plan contains no in principle objection to BT uses and locations such as the application site. The A and B is a working environment and is not that unusual to find BT uses operating within such areas. The wider site has an extant lawful use of plant hire and repair, which is subject to no limitations. There's been a compressor on site for decades, which is used to power air tools in addition to the shop blaster, with some shop blasting undertaken from time to time to assist in the cleaning and repair of plants. The application therefore presents an opportunity for the council to exert greater control over such activity by the planning process than has been the case to date. We are aware that there um, that some have questioned the user classification applied for. Now that noise attenuation measures have been installed, in our view, the application proposals are akin in their impact to a Class E or formal B1C use. That said, shot blasting is widely accepted as falling within a B2 use, hence the use has been applied for. The matter is, however, somewhat of a red herring. Irrespective of the use class, the impact will be the same, given that the same conditions will be imposed. Should the applicant wish to vary any of those conditions, then he would need to submit a formal application to the council with any such application assessed on its own merits. While we acknowledge that there remains some local objection, there is also support, as well as a silent majority who did not feel strongly enough to comment. It is also noted that the environmental health officer has removed his objection. The applicant has worked hard with the council to mitigate the noise concerns that have been raised, taking advice from both officers of this council and his own specialist noise consultant, the result of which has been to mitigate the impact of the shot blasting to the extent that it has a negligible impact outside the site. I therefore hope that you will support your officer's recommendation and grant planning permission subject to the conditions that have been recommended. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right, would member, Councillor Thomas. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, Firstly, I think we're going to look at that. I'm not going to repeat all the bits that have gone through before. It's already been identified that Coombe Pine is a tranquil hamlet that lies within the East Devon area of outstanding natural beauty. It has very little background noise. I, I don't follow a lot of the details of the noise report, but I want to talk about something a little bit different. The application here relates to previous application 20 stroke 115 stroke change of use where I commented in August 2020. Now this application was subsequent, was as you know refused um, and I do apologise because I understood the appeal had, had actually been upheld at appeal but I understand the appeal has not yet been determined and remains on file as 210034. Um, I note the environmental health comments, although I'm really disappointed with the comment that, the, that shot blasting can be noisy. I've got to be honest, having worked in a vehicle haulage environment and, and in historically, 
the idea that shock uh, that shock blasting may be noisy is probably the ultimate understatement, as I'm sure those of others who've worked in that area will equally show. I think the problem here is that we've got, and I'd go back to the certificate of, of, of use, the acceptable use. The activities on the on the site came forward um, earlier, uh, quite as Mr. as Mr. Rhodes quite correctly says, where there were activities that had been going on since the 1990s, which related to B1 activity and the buildings uh, that were involved in that. And that's absolutely correct. They're not disputed as representing an agreed activity. However, the activity of sandblast, sorry, of shot blasting, not sandblasting, started, I understand, in the, in the late 2020, about three, four years ago. And as such, wasn't supported in the, in the Certificate of lawful, lawful Use for obvious reasons, in terms of the length of time that it had been in activity, and, and obviously that didn't cover it. I think it's fair to say that this site has never, had, actually its accepted uses were all achieved by, largely by uh, Certificate of Uses rather than planning approvals. And it's important, I think, to draw the distinction that there's never been an authorised B2 use on this site. Now, as members will know, B1C class is a light industrial typically that's accepted as being likely to be reasonable within a resident and around a residential area. B2 is not, it's general industrial. And, and as we probably all know, that it's been more suited to the likes of Hill Barton and Greendale in terms of the noise involvement and the inevitable traffic movements. Um, there's also, a couple of interesting points here because I'm looking at it clearly there is a how should a retrospective application be treated because obviously that's what we're talking about here it's a retrospective application for B2 use. Firstly retrospective applications clearly need to be considered in the same way as, as normal applications if it was coming fresh so then members should consider whether they'd be sympathetic to a B2 use in the AOMB next to a, a tranquil residential area. Secondly, in relation to respective, retrospective applications, my understanding is that there's actually a, an applicant is only allowed one opportunity to obtain planning permission after the event, which is the case here. This can either be by way of a retrospective planning application or by means of an appeal against an enforcement notice on the grounds that a planning permission ought to be granted, all the conditions or limited limitation concerns should be discharged. Now, of course, we actually do have here through application 21115 change of use, we do have a previous application already. So um, my question with this, and I think this is something Shirley will hopefully answer is, I was drawn to, as you know, by one of the comments to section 70 of the Town and Country Planning Act 1990, so which was sec section 70A. Well, reading on as one or two, you know, all, some of us do, if you go to actually 70C, which is the power to decline or determine retrospective applications, it says there that a planning authority may decline to determine an application for planning permission or permission in principle for the development of any land if granting permission for that development would involve granting whether in relation to the whole or any part of the land to which a pre-existing enforcement notice relates, planning permission in respect of whole or part of any of the matters specified in the enforcement notice as constituting a breach. Now, we do have... Pardon? That's your five minutes, Councillor Thomas. Sorry, well, as I think, I, I just I, so I would appreciate some confirmation on this because I'm not actually sure that the way we're looking at this application now is appropriate. Um, and I do support, without going through them all again, the fact that B2 use, in my mind, is fundamentally unsuitable for the AOMB. And, uh, and also, if you look at the, the policies, we've dismissed almost out of hand, the policies relating to conserving, enhancing the landscape and environment okay. of the OMB itself. So there you go. I, I would seriously, though, I appreciate some clarification on the way this application has been dealt with, because I, I think it raises significant questions. Thank you, Councillor yeah. Thomas. Can I go to Mr Rose to answer any of those points, please, particularly about the appeal, which is um, said to be have been allowed, but is in abeyance. 
Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, so the, the, the appeals in abeyance uh, awaiting the outcome of, of this application. The count. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Thomas is quite right. We, we can decline to receive further applications where we've already dealt with them and they've been at appeal and we've had um, enforcement notices. But I think the, the, the key word in what he said is may decline. Uh, mm. In this case, uh, as I think it says in the report, since the previous approval, the applicant has put in the mitigation measures to the building uh, and we only felt it was fair to give them an opportunity to demonstrate to us the suitability or otherwise of that mitigation that's gone in and through the further report uh, and that's why we have entertained the application and uh, it's on that basis the inspectorate have uh, put the appeal uh, in, a, in a the current appeal in abeyance. Um, with regard to the B2 use that there's, there's nothing to say you can't have a B2 use in the AOMB it comes down to its impact which is what you as members are assessing today there's no visual impact from this so it comes down to the impact on the immunity of of residents and the tranquility of the AOMB from from the noise impact um, which, which I've which which I've outlined and uh, of which uh, you might want to have some questions to uh, the environmental health officer about about that noise assessment and the impact as as he's assessed it. Right, thank you. Um, right, can we go now to Ian Winter, the environmental health officer? Um, oh, I had you there a minute ago. Is Ian Winter here? He is in the meeting. Yes, I see him now. Yeah. yeah. Um, Ian, could, could you answer any of the questions or the issues that have been raised so far, please? You're on mute. We can't hear we can't you, Ian. No. no. I don't think you are on mute. Have you got your speaker or headset or turned on? Still can't hear you. Chris, he may he may need to log out, log back in if his if his kit's lost connection. If, if he's looking looking vis visible, but you can't hear him. Well, yeah, we can we we can see you, Ian. Uh, you're not on mute, but we got no no sound from you at all. You might need to dial out and dial back in again or alternatively if you've got have you got a, a headset you might be able to plug in <clears throat> chair do you want to stop for a, a five minute break while we while ian tries to connect Yes, I think we will. Um, okay, okay, try the new headset. <laughs> ah, there we go. Oh, uh, there we go. Oh, he's there. Okay. Ian. Can anyone pick me up on the new headset? Yeah, lovely. Yes. Oh, technology. Do you want to go ahead, Ian? Do you want to answer any of those questions or maybe give members a, an idea of the, the noise report and the assessment that's been carried out? Okay, sorry, can anyone hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, morning everyone. Glad we've managed to sort that out quite quickly. Um, right, yes, in relation to the noise, I'd just like to clarify on the first application, um, the, as has been, has been previously said, the acoustic um, measures hadn't been undertaken um, in, in relation to the uh, mitigation measures, whereas for this application they have. So that's ch certainly changed the stance of environmental health in relation to our recommendations. Um, also in relation to the noise assessments that have been undertaken by the applicant noise consultant um, in the first application, background noise levels of 45 decibels were detailed as uh, representative to the, to the um, 
local area, uh, and we weren't happy with this. It, it, we, we felt it wasn't in in line with certainly with the, the measurements we'd taken on site. Um, however, in the latest noise assessment that was submitted, um, they actually did detail lower background noise measurements for the um, amenity areas of some of the nearby residential properties, and they were very much in line with the uh, background noise measurements that uh, we obtained on site as well. So we felt that this was more representative for the area and that we felt then that we could look at imposing a relevant condition that would offer the sufficient protection um, for local residents and the AONB. Okay, are there any specific questions in relation to the noise assessment or the noise condition that we're looking at imposing? I have um, a comment to make. Um, the first speaker said that the noise went on hour after hour after hour. Um, had you had complaints about this in the past? Um, yes, we did have um, historic complaints in relation to the noise, um, and we, these were investigated um, under the statutory nuisance provisions, um, and we were in the process of taking enforcement action, but then the um, mitigation works were undertaken by the applicant um, in attendance with ourselves as well. Um, and once the um, installation works had been undertaken and further measurements were taken, uh, we confirmed that there was no longer um, a noise nuisance being generated from the operation of the sand bl uh, shop blasting on site. Uh, and with the time restrictions, 9 till 12, Monday to, fr to Friday, um, how will that be monitored? Well, I mean, this this the, these, this condition would be put on as a planning condition, um, so that would be monitored either through um, assessment through, by the installation of noise recording equipment um, and the activity of the enforcement officers for the planning. Thank you, Ian. Um, Councillor Skinner, you've got a question. Yes, thank you, and, and it's... Um... Yeah, this is uh, this is quite a complex one, isn't it? It's uh, quite quite difficult. I can see I can see the confliction between B two use and people living in a tranquil area like Coombe, but this is planning, and we must deal with it in that light. So, um, so I think one of the questions I, I may ask, if I may, to Ian, please, if I could. Mm -hmm. So the the complaints that were uh, being made before about the noise, obviously there were complaints prior to the uh, noise reduction. Um, process that took place had the has there been uh has it been operational since then with the noise reduction um, operation or process taking place and has there been uh, noticeable um complaints after that was put in place because i think the th the real issue we've got here is that people are are, are saying or, or certainly neighbors and, and and the board member to a degree that we're actually in a place whereby we've got a conflict between a B2 use, which is quite a, it, it, it's a B2 is heavy industrial. That's the nature of the beast of B2, whether it is heavy industrial or not, but that's the of what it sits under um, in a very tranquil village. And that's, that's, that's the balance we got here. And it, so where we are is that we just need to understand what noise levels that is and are they acceptable? And this is really the crux of the whole of this application. So having this information correct is really, really important. Thank you. Darren, any comments? Mr. Winter? Um, yeah, certainly. Um, in, in relation to the numbers of complaints received, certainly um, prior to or during our statutory nuisance investigation, which is separate to the planning investigation, um, we did have ongoing complaints in relation to the noise. Um, we concluded our investigation and the, the acoustic performance or the installation was increased. Since that point, we haven't had further complaints in relation to the noise um, from the site. That's not to say that residents aren't still being affected by the noise. It's just that obviously following our investigation, we wrote to the, to the objects and informed them of, of our outcome. Thank you. 
Councillor Pratt, you have a question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr Winter, when uh, did the uh, insulated enclosure being put into the building? Have you got a date for that? I don't have a specific date for that, but I know that we did noise readings. It would have been back in June, July time um, to test the um, qualities of the sound insulation. So it would have been around that time. And you're saying since uh, since that date, you've received no complaints. Is that I don't correct? I don't believe so, no. No. Um, Chair, if I may, I, I do need to speak to uh, Nicholas Wright and Anna Ball. Again, I wanted to find out what they have to say about that. Yes, I think that would be helpful. Um, could we have um, Anna Ball first, please? <laughs> Anna Ball? Yes, I'm here now. Sorry. All right. Councillor Pratt has a question for you. OK, thank you. Good morning, Mrs Ball. Good morning. Um, I just heard from Mr Winter that the... Okay insulated enclosure was inserted in June, July of last year. And since that date, have there been any cases of noise problems for you? Yes, all the time. Um, when Mr. Winters came to do his noise assessment in my garden, he spent five minutes there. Whereas previous to that, when we had noise assessment done, it was meticulously done over a period of half an hour, 30 minutes. Mm. So I was surprised at that. And Mr. Winter seemed to spend more time over at Mr. Mark Perry's property than he did where the noise was um, causing us grievance and trouble, myself and our neighbors. Mm. Also, the other thing is when he left that morning, he told me that it wasn't complete although it was better now, it wasn't complete. So on that basis, we've all been waiting for it to be completed. And um, yes, there is noise, definitely. And it's underpinning. It's um, a noise that drives you crazy because it's a real roll of engine noise. And um, it's disruptive. It abuses our, con our conversation and our con concentration. And quite frankly, we're sick and tired of it. Yes. Thank you. So this this is an, in effect ongoing. Well, that's what noise. I was told when Mr. Winter left. Thank you, Mr. Winter. Would you like to respond to that, please? Uh, yes, I can. Um, Mrs. Ball was sent a letter um, back following our recordings that were, that, that were undertaken um, in June, actually concluding the investigation, saying that the uh, investigation had concluded. Um, the uh, time on site, um, yes, there, there were different times spent in, in different properties, but the recording equipment was set to record for the whole period. So it wasn't just a five minute recording. It was, um, a, a, I think it was around a, a, a 20, 25 minute recording. Um, but there were other noise sources that were also going uh, taking place at the time, which we had to stop in order to us to get um, a realistic level of the um, same uh, shot blasting that was taking place at the time um, but to, f that that to say we did get sufficient uh, noise data to confirm what the, the the noise levels were and we were able to make it draw a conclusion from that thank you um uh, uh, chair can i go back to mrs ball please yes for one further question yes i'm here yes uh did you make any complaints uh to the uh to the Environment Agency since the uh, insulated enclosure has been put in? Environmental health, it would be, not the environmental health. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Um, no, we didn't because we felt it was ongoing. And to be perfectly frank, for the last three years, we've submitted so many times of noise when it starts, when it finishes, the volume. Um, three times, loads and loads of times, we've submitted the noise levels to that office. So this time, having um, Mr. Winter say to me that it wasn't complete, um, we felt that we would just let it go until there was completion. And actually, I don't recall 
a letter being sent to me saying that it actually was finished and done with. Um, because I think if it had been, I would have been on the phone complaining day after day after day after day. Thank you. Um, can we have confirmation that that letter was sent, please? There seems uh, to be done some discrepancy here. Um, yes, I, um, I've just found a copy of the letter that was sent out on the 14th of July, um, and it confirming that um, noise measurements on the 30th of June um, that the sound blasting activities are undertaken at your property. The results have confirmed that the additional works have improved the situation and reduced the noise levels. Um, I can send a copy of that letter to, to, to anyone if you like, but that letter was sent out on the 14th of July. Thank you. The letter was sent out. There have been no complaints since. Measures were taken to mitigate the effects of the noise. Um, so I think we have to take uh, into account the equipment that was used to measure it um, and the visits by the environmental health officer and the letter that was sent out, which resulted in no further complaints. Okay, Councillor Pratt. Well, I'd like to hear from Mr. Wright. If, yes, if Mr. Mr. Wright. We will hear from Mr. Wright. I was going to bring him in. Thank uh, you. Mr. Wright, would you like to come in and answer questions, please? Uh, yes, I'm, uh, I'm here. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Pratt. Mr. Mr. Wright, uh, the uh, insulated enclosure was uh, put in on or in June or July of uh, last year. Uh, since that date, have you had uh, further cause for complaints to the Environment uh, Health, sorry, the Health Authority regarding uh, the noise? Uh, no. The the reason that people haven't been complaining to environmental health because, is because this planning application was ongoing. It was initially refused, so we thought that's the end of it. There was an enforcement notice put in place, so we thought that was the end of it. We were waiting then for the appeal to be, to be done. So what was the point in complaining? The chat will just carry on doing it day after day anyway. Um, so you know, the, so the, the noise is continuing, is that noise, correct? If, I will be absolutely honest, and the noise is less than it was, without a doubt, but it is still a noise. It is still a constant background noise when it's, when it's operational. Thank you. And it will be operational, if, if approved, just three hours a day. Councillor Woodward, would you like to ask a question? Yes, um, if um, possibly Mr Winter, uh, it's, it's relating to page 77 of the report. Uh, so maybe that um, was Mr. Rose as well. But, uh, help me with my uh, or maths or understanding of the, the noise measurements. It says in 2020, the background noise level was 43 decibels. I presume that's what dB means. Um, that's the background noise. So I take that to mean that's the noise that's going on without any um, blasting taking place. Um, and then in, it says after mitigations, that's four paragraphs down, this is all in the same place at MP1. When shot blasting was taking place, the noise level was 38. I just don't understand how, when there's shot blasting, you can have a, a lesser value for decibels than when there's no shot blasting taking place. It seems to be um, not logical for that to take place. I don't know who can answer that question for me. This calls into question the validity of the report. Mr. Winter, can you respond to that, please? Yeah, not a problem. Um, certainly, when you when you take a background noise measurement, it's it's you take a representative um, parameter. It's called an LA ninety, which is um, a sound parameter for ninety percent of the time. So, in theory, you can have a, a background noise level of uh, of forty three. And when you take a specific noise level of a, of, a, of a noise source that's going on, you would use the average noise level of that of the source. So you'd use an LAEQ. Um, so you can, in, in certain circumstances, get an increased background noise level, um, but the, the average noise level is actually below. But, but I would agree that you'd, you'd, you would normally always expect the, um, the average noise level to be higher than the, than the LA90. Um, the only difference it would be if there's a time difference in when those recordings were taken, um, that, that could explain a difference, but it would normally be the other way around. You would expect a higher background noise, uh, sorry, a higher 
average noise level and a lower background noise level. Does that answer your question, Councillor Woodward? Yes, it, uh, well, it, yes, it does in the yeah. it explains, but the, it still means that the shot blasting gives a lower figure than the background noise, which just doesn't seem logical. Yes, yeah. So, so, yeah, well, so, certainly when we've looked at this and when we've undertaken background noise measurements in the area, um, a background noise measurement of, of between 37 and 39 is more representative of the area. And we had concerns with the background noise measurement of 43 um, be, be, being too high for that area mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't until the latest um, noise assessment came back out which did detail um, a lower background noise level of 39 which then caused us to um, remove our um, concerns in relation to it because we felt that was more in um, mm -hmm. comparison with the with the rural setting and the AONB. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Pook. Thank you. It's just following on from that, and it's really a bit of a um, uh, something I'd like to say about the report. The all the figures are all in sort of um, narrative form, and it just makes it very difficult to, to read. Um, uh, a report with a nice little chart at the bottom would be much easier. And Mr. Winter, please correct me if I've got these wrong. Background noise between twenty and twenty-one was forty-three, then thirty-nine. Noise measured. Um, before mitigation was 51, noise measured after mitigation 38. What we need also, and I couldn't see there, was an acceptable noise level. If we'd had all those figures in a nice little chart, which would have been saved an awful lot of the, the it would have been much easier to understand. So first of all, could you confirm my understanding of those numbers? Give us what's an acceptable, back, uh, an acceptable uh, noise level. Um, and then you know, it makes it easy to make decisions. Thank you. Mr. Winter. Um, yes, I agree with you. I think a, a, a table there detailing um, that information would have been far more helpful. Um, in, in relation to what's an acceptable level, we, we tend to base our acceptable levels on the, on the background noise levels for the area. So uh, what would be deemed acceptable in a noisier area would be also would be higher than what would, would be deemed um, acceptable in a quiet area. So in, in, this, in this instance, we're looking at a background noise level of around 39 decibels. So an acceptable level would be around the background noise level of 39. Yeah. Thank you for that. Councillor Davey. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask Mr. Winter if um, any mitigation has taken place on the noise from the compressor, because there's a separate building with the compressor in it. Um, and I, I'm, I mean, obviously, you've taken the readings, but I just wondered whether any mitigation has been done on that housing as well. Thank you. Um, yes, um, uh, sound insulation has been provided to the um, compressor housing. Thank you. Councillor Skinner. Oh, Chair, sorry, I think Councillor Pookie just about summed up all what I was going to say. I wanted to know, you know, what was acceptable and what wasn't, because that's okay. the crux of this case, really. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you to the speakers. Um, questions are over now. There are no more hands to go up, so we move into debate, please. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I can't get my hand up for some reason, um, Chairman. <laughs> Okay. I've just gone into Mr. Google and um, it says quite rural areas should be at 30 decibels. So that's sort of, and if he's 38, he's over what a quiet area should be. Yeah, that, that's background noise, I think. And perhaps Mr. Winter can clarify that. Yep, yeah, um, background noise um, levels can vary in rural areas. Um, they can go anywhere between 25 to, to 60, depending on the wind conditions and, uh, uh, um, and uh, the like. So, um, yes, you can get levels of 30 decibels in, in a rural area, but where we've gone unmeasured in, in this particular area, the, the average noise, uh, background noise level was coming out um, in between 37 and 39 decibels. Thank you. Um, Councillor Davy. your hand is up. Was that for a belated question or is it part of the debate now? No, Chair, I just thought I'd try and get in before Councillor Skinner for once. All right, carry uh, on, Councillor uh, Davy. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I mean, I noted the report that in 1994, the, the usage uh, became lawful. Um, 
uh, or was accepted as having become yeah. lawful. Now, reading between the lines, I suspect that means that very little action had been taken on the activities that were going on, um, and they'd gone on for so long that we, we had to accept that. So I think we're, we're probably, from the starting point, this is probably not where we'd want to be. Uh, with this kind of activity taking place in an AONB and in a small quiet hamlet, which it has been acknowledged is a is a peaceful uh, place, um, and I think we have to give some consideration to the type of noise as well, not just the volume. As a musician, I'm well aware of decibel levels. I've lived with them all my life, um, but as as one of the uh, the the speakers said it's like tinnitus um, and anybody who suffered from tinnitus knows how just how trying and wearing that can be so I think we have to consider the type of noise and not just the volume um, and I did I, I never heard of shot blasting I'd heard of sand blasting I had to look it up to find out what it was um, and I could see that uh, somebody said it's an understatement to say it's a noisy activity. I can imagine it's absolutely deafening. Um, so I, I think that as well as the decibel levels, we have to think about the type of noise that's going to be generated by this. Um, and tinnitus is, is very low level noise, but it goes on and on and on. Um, and I just feel that it's it's starting to erode the protection that we give to AONBs if we start allowing B2 industrial use um, in that area. I know that the industrial use is only for the purpose of the shop blasting. We're not allowing all kinds of general industrial use. Um, but I just feel this is an inappropriate um, sort of activity to be carrying on in an AONB. I'm also concerned about the additional traffic. I note in the report it says that it thinks that the amount of traffic um, won't be very different from what's already taking place as part of the lawful activity. Um, but we have again heard from one of the speakers that the, the shot has to be brought and um, transported back to Chard. Um, so I feel that this is going to generate additional vehicle movements as uh, stuff is brought in for um, uh, for for sound uh, shot blasting. So I just feel this is inappropriate um, in this location. I have every sympathy with the residents, um, and I'm going to recommend that this is refused, and we'll see what happens at appeal. Thank you. I'm, I'd like to point out that this was granted lawful use uh, in 1994. The AONB Blackdown Hills was came into being in 1991. So I think it's worth bearing that in mind. Right, you've proposed a refusal. Is there a seconder, please? Yes. Who's that? That's Councillor Woodward. Oh, okay, Councillor Woodward, go ahead. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so Woodward, did you second? I did, yes. Yeah, okay. Would you like to speak? I would. I um, don't want to repeat what Councillor Davy said, but I um, endorse everything that he has said. It seems incongruous to have a, an industrial process um, in the AOMB in this quiet hamlet. The parish council object, the ward members object. And I think we need to look at this uh, on a balance. Yes, it's um, a part time business. Um, which uh, has obviously benefits for, to Mr. Perry, but I think we need to balance the business against those of the residents. We've heard um, the residents say it drives them crazy. I think it was the quote that was used. Um, still experiencing noise, but they didn't make a noise or complaint because um, they thought the matter was ongoing. Um, so I think we need to be balance the benefit to the business to the detriment to the residents and so that's why I'm supporting the refusal. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I think the residents might have uh, moved to the area um, after uh, this sort of work was um, introduced there. Uh, Councillor Desarum. 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair. I was just going to say that if we look at page 79 of our report, paragraph 176 of the NPPF says that great weight should be given to conserving and enhancing landscape and scenic beauty in national parks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think that um, this application hasn't shown what would outweigh this harm. We've, be, we've been told that it's uh, obviously necessary for the smooth running of the business, but we've also heard from ward members, uh, ward member Thomas, how, how it's um, you know now a B2 use, uh, and I think that all these factors clearly unfortunately way against it obviously we, we've understood the need to have the business but clearly we need to balance up what para 176 of the NPPF says so for that reason I'm also going to support the the uh, recommendations as put forward today thank you chair thank you um councillor Thomas you're not on this committee and you did have more than your point, five point of correction the correction factual correction okay it was just that to correct your comment you made about the use, B, the B2 use being uh, granted a lawful use in 1994. That wasn't correct. There is, there's, the B2 use was not included in that and didn't, I didn't have to take effect till more recently. My apologies. I, I just thought it was worth correcting. No, I didn't say B2 use had been granted. said the earliest application on the site in 94 was withdrawn and the documentary evidence indicates that this was because a lawful development certificate had been granted for the same use. So it's use of an industrial nature. I didn't say Peter. My apologies if it was incorrect. Okay, uh, Councillor Pratt. Yes, uh, I think uh, paragraph uh, 185 of the NPPF uh, is the uh, the uh, paragraph which uh, deals with this matter, and uh, the decision today should uh, mitigate and reduce to a minimum potential adverse impacts resulting from noise from from new developments, and avoid noise giving rise to significant adverse impacts on health and the quality of life. So. Uh, the impact on the AONB is uh, quite clear in my view, and uh, I support refusal. Thank you, Councillor Pratt. Councillor Skinner? Yes, and it's just a, a one for Mr Rose. I, Mr Rose, I wonder if you could just, just clear in my head, please, the, the outstanding um, appeal that is outstanding that we're, we're, is, is in abatement, uh, my understanding, on the, which right. was on... On the outcome of this, could, could you just put a bit of give me a bit more clarity on that? Because we've talked about lots of other stuff, but I just want to know. See, I think this is very much about um, uh, it's plan, planning policy, planning policy, planning law, and it's where we stand with planning law. I, and I don't take the view that that we should make perhaps make a wrong decision and let the planning inspector, if we've got it wrong, let them take the view. I don't like to do it that way, Ren. I like to get it right first time, Ren, if we can. So I just like that point clear it up for me if, if I could just to get that right in my head. Mr Thanks. Rose. Yeah sure so so yeah there's, there's, there's an appeal sat there with the inspectorate the outcome of this yep. uh, application and the applicant's case and the, our, well, ours and the members of the public will be before that inspector to make a decision on that previous application which is similar to this and the enforcement notice. Um, so in effect what we have to do is put our reasoning to the inspectorate on why this application has been refused you know yeah. which goes alongside why the previous one was refused and why the enforcement notice should be upheld held and the inspector will make that decision I, I suppose what I, I suppose what I do is take this opportunity to say I, I, I hear what members are saying about the b2 use being inappropriate and there being noise uh, from the use, but that's not the evidence I can put forward to the inspector. No. I've got an environmental health officer here who's the expert in noise coming out and saying that the proposal will cause no noise, greater noise above the background level. I don't know where I turn for my evidence that no. this use in this area is going to cause harm to the AOMB. I, I, I don't have that evidence to hand. And members of the public will be able to put their 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 letters and their, their case forward as as I hope they already have done. Um, but it 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 it's easy to say there'll be harm on the AOMB, but I don't feel I have that evidence to be able to put to the inspector, given that uh, case that you've been given by our own environmental health officer. So I am worried that um, we we shouldn't be re relying on uh, the current appeal. Uh, and the inspector, um, because we're going to have to put forward evidence to justify this refusal. And I'm not sure that I have that strong evidence at the moment. 
uh, you're quite correct, Mr. Rose. Uh, Chair. We have scientific data there. Um, and um, all, all we can balance that against is, is the anecdotal uh, evidence from or witness statements. Um, I think we have to be very careful with this one. Very Chair, careful. may I come in, please? Um, I'm going to take um, Councillor Pook next and then you after that, Councillor Brown. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I sympathise very much with the residents because I find noise uh, as much an annoyance as anyone. But unfortunately on this, we've got, you know, as uh, Mr Rose has said, there's, there's, there's a factual data there and yeah. I don't quite see what we've got there to actually refuse it um, because you've got the existing use there already. Um, and so, unfortunately, whilst I sympathise with them, I would ha I, I can't support a refusal. Yeah, we have very little grounds for appeal to stand up at appeal. Uh, Councillor Pratt. Yes, but well, we've we have heard today evidence from two residents and that evidence is uh, can be relied on, in my view. And uh, we should uh, make the decision on that basis. Well, I would disagree with that. We have the scientific evidence and uh, that's what an inspector would look at. There are no more hands up. So over to you, uh, Mrs Shaw, to sum up, please. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm wondering if we could possibly go back to the reasons for this refusal by councillor put forward by councillor davy i have that um it would erode the protection of the aomnb um and there's concern about additional traffic is that a reason for refusal or is it is it the noise what what exactly are the grounds for refusal councillor davy and yep. councillor um, woodward if i could Go to um, paragraph 185, which is quoted on page 79, um, that planning policies and decisions uh, should ensure that new development is appropriate for its location, um, mitigate and reduce to a minimum potential adverse impacts resulting from noise, um, and identify and protect tranquil areas which have been relatively <clears throat> undisturbed by noise and I would submit that although we've heard all kinds of facts and figures it is the type of noise that noise may be no louder than the noise of a river next door but I know which one I'd want to listen to so my submission is that it is the type of noise and not the actual decibel levels that we should be concerned with here yeah. Um, could I just go back to Mr. Rose? Uh, Mr. Rose, traffic movements have been mentioned. There's nothing in the report that I can see from county highways. No, I think with regard to traffic, we, 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 you know, we've got a use here that would be carried out for three hours, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. The traffic yeah. that would be associated with that will be fairly low mm. uh, against the traffic that's already going to the site for the lawful <laughs> use. Um, so I, I think traffic's really very hard to, to, yeah. to justify and point to the fact that, that, you know, maybe one or two vehicle movements across a three hour period, five days a week is, 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 is causing harm in itself. Um, I, I, I take Councillor Davies' point with regard to the type of noise, but I wonder if it's something we should have a comment from Mr. Winter over, how, how he's factored that type of noise into the noise assessment and his assessment. Right, Mr. Winter. Yeah, no, certainly. I mean, in um, reaching the decisions in, in looking at um, the, a suitable condition for the site, we have um, gone through the relevant planning guidance, including the, the noise policy statement for England. Um, and with the, with the measured, measured response that we're looking to put in, um, it has drawn the conclusion that there'll be no observed ad adverse effect within the amenities of any nearby noise sensitive properties. And there would be no observed effect within any noise sensitive properties at all. Um, taking this further, we've also looked at the um, BS4142, which is a, a method for rating industrial noise 
affecting um, mixed residential and um, industrial areas. And this specifically looks at the type of industrial noise that's there. So yes, it does take into consideration then your low frequency noise content, the intermittency of the noise, and the fact that the noise is just very different to um, normal environmental noise that you would get into those situations. Um, mm. And the 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 the, um, the guidance in there details that the lower low, the lower the rating level in re relative to the measured background sound level the less likely the pacific sound of the shot blasting will have an adverse or significant adverse impact and where the rating level does not exceed the background sound level this is an indication that the, that the pacific noise source will have a low impact and, and therefore regardless to what what i think about the operation and the location it's in it's it's deemed compliant with the planning guidance in terms of noise mm -hmm. and our own british standards in relation to the noise as well and and, and as a final one there is the world, world health organization um guidance levels for environmental noise um and these levels are far higher than um a level that we would consider to be um a appropriate for outdoor amenity areas and um, they detail uh, noise levels of 50 decibels outside um, and that's desir desirable to prevent any significant community annoyance. Um, however there is also the section in the um, noise policy for England that does detail about the, the keeping of tranquil areas and mm. that's something that lo local authority needs to protect and uh, and offer some protection for. Um, and uh, the way we've, we've detailed this is in order to ensure that the acoustic character of the area is not changed and further protection of the AOMB is recommended, um, that, that it is recommended that shot blast and activities are restricted to the hours of um, nine till 12, just during the weekdays. Um, therefore, this would ensure that the other times, the quieter times where the AOMB can be enjoyed, it's that this noise source isn't a problem. Thank you, Mr. Winter. Okay. Right, back to you, Mr. Shaw, is that any clearer? In light of that, does the mover and seconder wish to amend their reasons for the recommendations? Um, Do you wish to retain the traffic, having an adverse, the in increased yes, traffic? I, I still think there'll be an increase in traffic. Um, and okay, there's there's traffic movements associated with lawful use, but it's still an increase, and it, all these little things are incremental, aren't they? Um, so I, I still think it will give rise to an increase in traffic movements. But if um, there's going to be a reduction in hours, surely you know I don't understand the logic of that. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Sorry, well, Chair, I can't raise my hand. Can I just say something on this? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, with the AOMB, you're supposed to preserve and enhance. Um, there's no way this application is either preserving or enhancing the AOMB. No, but the operation started after the AOMB was created, Councillor Brown. Not, not for this type of use. Well, you've had, you've had the report from the Environmental Health Officer which is in compliance with national standards. So, um, Councillor they... Pratt, you want to come back? Well, I can only say again that we've heard evidence from the residents that they are still continuing to hear noise, and that must be taken into account. And my view is paragraph 185 of the MPPF covers that point clearly. Thank you. So, um, bearing in that in mind, would the proposer and seconder want to add the NPPF relevant paragraph in? Um, I, yes, I'm just going to keep the same objections, Chair. It, just to confirm that it's uh, paragraph 185A with the impact on health and quality of life. I think that's in the important, what we've heard. It's not anecdotal evidence, it's actually evidence direct from the residents about the quality of their life. They've yes. we've heard that it says drives Thank them crazy. So Thank I think, you, Councillor uh, Woodward. Thank you. 
Right, thank you. thank you, Mrs Shaw. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the clarification, members, of your reasons. Therefore, members, when your name is called, please would you indicate whether you support the recommendation to refuse, you're against the motion to recommend refusal, or whether you're abstaining from the vote. Councillor Brown. Supports refusal. Councillor Chamberlain. Abstain. Councillor Davy. Support refusal. Councillor De Serum. Support recommendation to refuse. Councillor Gazard. Abstain. Councillor Lawrence. Support refusal. Councillor Pook. Against refusal. Councillor Pratt. Support refusal. Councillor Skinner. Against refusal. Councillor Woodward. I support refusal. Councillor Rag. Against refusal. Okay, so we have two abstentions, three against refusal, and one, two, three, six, four refusal. So that is recommended for refusal. Thank you. Thank you, members. Um, we'll take one more and then we'll have a break. Um, so, item 15, application 213011, full application, minor for Three Spring Meadow, Jackson Meadow, Limpston, pages 134 to 141. Uh, I'd like to welcome Alexandra Summerton, uh, Kevin Clements, um, ward members, councillors Ingham and Young, please. Um, over to you, Mr. Rose. Thank you, Chair. Here we go. Yeah, so Three Spring Meadow uh, in Limpston. Uh, this is the location of the site uh, on, on the screen there. And it's an application for a single story rear extension. And this has been uh, referred from chair delegation due to the concerns of the, of the ward members. Um, so we've got an application here for uh, single story extensions here shaded uh, on this plan. So we've got an existing garage to the side of this property and it concerns the impact on this property here to the to the north so you can see that the extension is pro proposed albeit single story to the to the south so the concern relates to the impact on the rear garden and rear of uh, of number two uh, so these are the elevations we've got the existing uh, elevations uh, at the top and then the proposed uh, below so it's this rear extension flat roof rear extension here that we're, we're concerned about uh, and when you look at it in plan form so we've got the existing ground floor, existing garage, and then you can see here, we have the single story extension that's right on the boundary with the uh, neighboring property. And then this extension that, that wraps around to create this, this larger kitchen area. Um, <coughs> and these are the, the photos. So this is, this is the garage. So the single story extensions to the, to the rear side of this garage, and you can see the close relationship with the neighbor. Then this is the view from that neighbor's patio. So the, this, the flat roof extension is proposed along here, uh, about a meter, 1.1 meters above the height of this fence coming, coming out 3.3 meters. So, you know, roughly in line with where, where my cursor is showing uh, right on that, that boundary there. And this is a view of that boundary. So we're looking back the single story extension off the rear of this, this garage coming out along this hedge. And you can see the relationship with the, the rear garden and the and the patio doors to the to the neighbouring property, which you can see there. Um, so uh, there was a you'll see from the report that there was a previous refusal on this site last year for a larger extension to this property that included a two storey extension above this garage here. That application uh, was refused uh, on the basis of the impact of the two storey extension on the windows to the side of uh, the neighbouring property here. That is relevant because that application also included the very similar or almost identical single story rear extension that's proposed as part of this application. And as part of the refusal of that previous application, we didn't raise any concerns or refuse the application on the basis of the single story extension. 
Um, it, as, it's uh, it's 2.9 meters high, 3.3 meters long uh, on the boundary here. So it'll project about a meet, 1.1 meters above the height of this of this fence along the boundary, rendered wall with a with a flat roof. So the main uh, issue to consider in the report is the amenity impact on the neighbour. There's no design objection. You won't see this uh, this extension from the from the public domain. So it's really about the impact on the amenity of this uh, neighbour. As I said, we've previously assessed, uh, assessed it and found it to be acceptable, uh, um, but we've got the application in again. There will be some effect on this neighbour. There's no doubt that you can see standing in this photo, a building uh, about 1.1 metre higher along this boundary, created a rendered wall, will be perceivable, will be noticeable when you're in this, this rear garden area. And it is to the, to the south of the property, so you will get an element of, of additional shade in over and above the shadow cast by this fence uh, from the, the building at certain times of the day and certain times of the year. Uh, but this, this wall isn't directly in front of those patio doors. They still get their outlook down the garden and across the garden, and they'll still get the light in above the, extent, the extension to the neighbouring property. And it's, it's also pertinent to note that they, there could be a similar, uh, not quite the same, but a similar impact from a, an extension or a shed that they could put there under permitted development rights. There's no impact from overlooking. There's no doors or windows in that, that elevation. Uh, and as I say, that open aspect would be retained. So <laughs> the neighbor will notice the extension on the boundary here. You, you could argue that maybe it's unneighborly to be so close and run so far down the garden along the side of their patio. Uh, but it, but to, to officer's mind, it isn't refusable. And that's reflected in the fact we didn't refuse it as part of the previous application. I said before, as part of the appeals section, that the harm that gets caused to neighbours from these house extensions really does have to be significant for us to be able to justify an appeal. And whilst this will be noticeable, they still gain all of the view out from the rear of this down their garden, across their garden, above the height of the neighbor's extension. And given that, given that they could put some building there quite similar <laughs> under PD, uh, they could uh, plant, put planting across the boundary there. Um, the, the view of officers is whilst um, a, a, a better design of extension could have been proposed maybe on the opposite side of the property. This scheme in itself isn't harmful enough to justify refusal. Therefore, we're recommended approval. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Uh, now the objector, Alexandra Summerton, welcome to the yes. meeting. You have Hello. three minutes. Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, so I'm asking you to reject this application on the grounds of impact on my property and loss of amenity. Um, so my garden is only five and a half meters square and the wall of the extension will run along nearly the whole southeast side of my garden, which is the side on which the sun rises. It will be almost three metres high, half as high again as the existing wooden fence. You can appreciate the relative proportions of the size of the extension and the size of the garden. I've observed the movement of the sunlight across my garden. The wall of the extension will impact on the garden by casting a shadow over two thirds of the garden until after midday and will result in obsessive circumstances. The wall itself, the wall will result in significant loss of light to the rear facing windows of my primary accommodation. The outlook from my living room will be overshadowed by the wall of the extension. I have a bright open aspect from my living room. Once the wall has been built, I will no longer be able to see the sky through the French windows while I'm seated on my sofa which is against the southwest wall facing the fence. Again, this is a question of appreciating the relative proportions of the extension to my tiny living room and the oppressive result of the construction. The original design and access statement 
for spring med the spring meadow development approved by EDDC stated, great care has been given to both the layout, changes to floor levels and orientation of the rooms. The building of a flat roofed extension on the boundary of the two gardens is not in keeping with the original design design approved by DDC. I ask the committee to bear in mind the benefits of daylight and sunlight in providing a, present, a pleasant living environment. The bright open aspect of my main living area and my small garden have been very important to me. So I have asked my neighbor to consider the construction on the other side of his property. Uh, and he's refused to do that, that would not imp impact on anybody. And I know that um, Mr. Rose said that there, there isn't significant impact, but the fact is there will be impact. Now I did ask for a, um, a daylight sunlight overshadowing assessment to be made. And I have asked, Sorry, I can't hear. So I have asked whether this assessment has been made and whether it's been placed in front of the committee prior to this committee meeting. And whether the uh, members have been able to use this document in their decision-making process. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kevin Clements, the applicant now, please, you have three minutes. Welcome to the meeting. See there, Wendy? I believe he's on the telephone, but he's still muted, Chair. Mr. Clements, can you please press um, star six to unmute your telephone? Yep, sorry. Hello? Hello, we can hear you. Welcome ah, to sorry, I thought I was unmuted to start with, sorry. Hello. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, okay. my name is, yeah, my name is uh, Kevin Clements, um, and I... I've been asked to speak on behalf of my son, Jonathan Clements, who is obviously the applicant, and Chris Baker, the architect, at this meeting. This is, uh, this is because, unfortunately, John is away, away on company business in Ireland at the moment, and Chris has a uh, business commitment at Portsmouth. Um, you know, they're long-standing commitments, so I've been asked to stand in. So forgive me if I stammer a bit, but... Uh, it's short notice. Um, right. Uh, can I please refer to the notes uh, to, to support the, the uh, revised application that Chris Baker sent in to the council? I don't know if you've got a copy of that in front of you. But uh, I wish to reiterate a few points for consideration for the uh, planning authority and the district councillors from this document. Um, Mr. Rose has touched on the original application, uh, which was for the first floor and ground floor works. Um, and on that application, just to state that there was um, a councillor supported the application on the 10th of September. The parish council supported it on the 16th of September. The, on the 14th of October, there was the officer's report objecting to the first floor extension but does not consider the single story extension to warrant objection and subsequent refusal. Now, if I may, can I just read out or what that actually says word for word in the delegated report? It says there is no objection to the single story extension as although there would be some effect from the wall of the rear single story element running alongside the rear garden boundary with number two, it is considered the effect to light ingress would not be 
not be significant enough to warrant objection and subsequent refusal. This is because the space immediately behind the French doors of the neighbouring property is not affected by the proposal. Uh, so that was that. And then on the uh, 28th of October last year, a councillor uh, agreed with this officer's report, but with ultimately on the 28th of October, it was refused because of the uh, first floor works. The revised application was put in uh, with the first floor works omitted with single story works as per the original application. I, I, it must be stressed that that constituted no cha changes at all from the original. Surprisingly, on the uh, 7th of December, a councillor objected. He made various comments, but not in support of the application. Um, and then on the 10th of December, the parish stroke town council objected. And on the 13th and the 10th of January this year, um, councillors objected and recommended refusal. Now, therefore, it was, you know, it was very disappointing and indeed upsetting to be told that support of the original stroke revised single story works had in fact disappeared, even though no changes have been made. It is believed that no one from the committee has indeed visited Three Spring Meadow to view or discuss the proposed works with the applicant. This seems a little odd considering we believe a committee member or members have indeed visited uh, next door with Alex at Two Spring Meadow. Surely it is prudent to have visited both sides of the fence before considering a, no pun intended, but before considering a decision on the planning application. I understand the architect has submitted daylight stroke sunlight information or data regarding the apparent loss and visitor at Two Spring Meadow with the uh, proposal of the works. I believe it proves to be a minimal loss, if indeed any loss at all. That's three minutes taken. Is it? Oh, sorry. No, that's gone quick. Um, um, well, uh, well, can I just in, can I just quickly summarise then? No, um, I think we, we've heard you. Thank you, um, okay. Mr. Clements. Um, the committee will, will have taken all that in. Uh, thank okay. you. Uh, okay, Councillor Thank you. Councillor Ringham, ward member. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. morning. I think it's quite clear from what um, Mr. Rose said and the objector said with regards to uh, the decision you have to take this morning is, do you believe this application uh, the, the net effect is overbearing on the neighbour? Is it oppressive on the neighbour? And is there a relevant, significant loss of light? That's what I put to you, uh, are the, the questions. You see, if there were no alternative for the applicant, then I could understand perhaps you're supporting this application. But there is plenty of room on that site to get this right and to make sure it is not overbearing, it is not oppressive, and there is no loss of light to the neighboring property. And that is the essence of my argument, Chair. I think this could be resolved with a, a new application that is satisfactory to all and doesn't have such um, a negative impact on the neighbor. It can be done. And I believe it should be done. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm sure your committee will take the right decision. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you, Councillor Ingham. I hope they do. <laughs> Councillor Young, please. Thank, uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair, and good morning, Committee. I realise this is a very small and minor application compared to others uh, that you have to deal with today. I, I fully appreciate uh, the applicant uh, wants a home office. And 
he has a growing family and therefore it makes total sense to add to his existing home. However, I fully appreciate the uh, severe concern and fear that this small addition will have to the neighbour's house, uh, removing her enjoyment of her main living room and her tiny patio garden. Uh, with probably uh, will probably mean that her very reason she purchased this uh, home would uh, be totally lost and therefore she would need to relocate. That to me is severe. Unfortunately, the NPPF uh, does not help when you relate a national policy that is designed to cover um, every single house in this country uh, to a, a small postage stamp size patio serving a, a small house in a rural Limston. This catch all policy that covers from Pimlico to Plymouth does not, in my view, help. Uh, it's a great pity that neighbours don't seem to engage with each other like they used to. The, uh, the first this neighbour knew of this proposed extension was the letter from the council. I'm always advocating discussing any development proposals first to see if there are any concerns so a solution can be found. If this, uh, if the, in this case, uh, the building on, on the boundary uh, may not have the same impact on its, re uh, on its residents um, um, as, a, 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 as the graveyard, which is on the op opposite side. This proposal is literally on the boundary uh, and the builders will require permission from the neighbor to access the scaffolding and construction. So if you do approve this application, I do hope the two parties will agree to a legally binding access agreement to allow safe access to, uh, to the building works. However, as this is a planning application and not a permitted development, you, the committee, are allowed to be subjective. My subjective view is that it will make a severe detrimental effect on the neighbour's property. And I do hope that you will share that view um, and vote against the proposal. Thank you for your time and being the arbitrator to finally decide this extension, if this should, extension should be built uh, or not. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Young. And uh, although other solutions have been hinted at, uh, we have to deal with the application that's before us, as we, as we all know. Councillor Skinner. Thank you, Chair. And I wonder if Mr. Rose might just take the photo. We've got the photo of there, the doors, one as it looks down through. Yeah, that's it. That's the one. That's it. That's that's the picture. Um, when we see that these houses and these developments were built, the almost the lineage taken before developers is to actually take those lines uh, in a way that doesn't impinge on the next door neighbor's house. And in fact, actually had that building, the, the brick one of the neighbor of the extension being put forward. Uh, and that had already been built out in that way, it would have probably, it may severely have affected the value of the house that's next door, and it would have been quite difficult to sell on the basis of saying, how does it do that? Of course, somebody might buy it on the basis of sale. That, 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 that works in that way. So I, I believe, I actually, you know, I, I really accept a lot of what both the ward members, members have said. The problem is there's there's how I feel, and, and I think it's it's unacceptable, but there's how I feel, and then there's planning law. And Kent, uh, Mr. Rose, Kent, God, you don't want to be a councillor, Mr. Rose, I'll show you. Um, you uh, Mr. Rose has pointed out a very poignant fact. So the facts are this. The fact is, is, that, is that in planning law, we don't really have much choice other than to accept this. There's another factor. And the factor is they could actually, through permitted development rights, actually put up a building that could have almost to the same effect as what's going on there, maybe in a, in a wooden building or something like that, which is not, not, not to the suiting of what this is, but something could, that could happen there anyway. So we're really caught between um, sort of a hard place and a rock, really. Uh, and, and I don't feel, as much as I feel aggrieved through gritted teeth, partly that I have to go along to accept this. I think that's what we have to do. And I think I'm going to um, propose, um, Chair, through you, uh, the officer's recommendation of approval. Although I do wish, and, and 
Councillor Young was quite right. What a shame. And, and Councillor Ingham as well. What a shame that the neighbours didn't speak and perhaps it could have been put the other side, which would have had no impact on, on both both of them, um, or certainly not, not this this neighbour. I'm not sure what impact it would have. I don't have the knowledge that the ward members have on, on the existing uh, applicant. Um, but what a shame we couldn't come to some sort of agreement and, and it could have all been sort of resolved in a better way. But we are where we are. They have put the application in. I don't see the way we would have grounds that this would not be, if it went to appeal, that it would be one. And I, I think the officers have written this up in, in, in the best way that they see fit. And I'm just going to have to go along with their recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Skinner. Is there a seconder, please? Councillor Brown, is that are you seconding? No, I'm not. All right. There, it seems to be no seconder. Yes. So, Councillor Gazard. Councillor Gazard? Yes, Chair. I, I will uh, reluctantly um, support uh, the um, recommendation to approve. Thank you. Okay. So, it's been proposed and seconded. Count, uh, counts, oh, did you want to speak on it, Councillor Gazard? No, I think Councillor Skinner said it all. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Desarum. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, very quickly, I, I totally understand, I totally get the point which Councillor Skinner uh, put over so eloquently. And, and I also um, understood what Mr. Rose has said. But I, I think that the neighbour has made a very, the neighbour and the ward members have made very, uh, very strong uh, appeals to me um, to understand that what, what the situation is. And if we look at the pictures, we can clearly see um, that, that something you know, un, uh, is going to happen in terms of the impact of the views um, to that particular owner of that property so uh, I, I and they, they, she's touched on the impact to her garden she's touched on her living room being overshadowed and, and 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 basically it's one of these situations where we want to support home working because we know with the pandemic uh, more more people have needed to work from home so I, I fully understand and appreciate that but in, in keeping with my personal thoughts on it having heard the debate I don't think I can support this one uh, for these these reasons as put forward I, I think that it fails policy d1 that to me is, is what it does it fails d1 and it goes too far out um, and and that's what I would suggest but I've, obviously I wait to hear what other members will say thank you ever so much chair thank, thank you councillor uh councillor davy thank you well i'm, I'm grateful to councillor de serum for uh suggesting policy d1 there um of course it is an extension rather than a new build um I, I mean, you have to ask yourself why you buy a new house and then immediately start extending it. But I, I can see the the applicant has good reasons for doing it. So what we come down to is the impact significant or not. And it's being suggested that we haven't got a leg to stand on here. And I, I don't accept that. Um, that's why it's here before the planning committee. Um, and uh, it seems to me that it's very obvious looking at the illustration that we're looking at now, uh, the impact this is going to have. And it is going to result in loss of light and loss of amenity for the neighbor. Um, and I, I feel we should refuse it um, because I, I don't think it's um, uh, appropriate in that location. Um, it, it, as has been pointed out, these houses were designed in such a way uh, that they didn't overshadow each other, and this will cause overshadowing. And if, if I was living in that house, I would want to sit out there of a morning and get a nice bit of winter sunlight, and I'm simply not going to get that anymore. Um, so I do feel that we have got grounds for refusal there. Thank you. Councillor Pook. Yeah, and I, I take everything that um, Mr. Rose said about the potential for permitted development and sheds and all that, all that. But I think the applic the um, the neighbour had a very good point, um, and I, this would be, this would be the uh, grounds for refusal. It's not just the impact on the um, the the neighbour's property, but the proportional impact on the neighbour's property. And I think if we put proportion in there, that'll show that'll give indication if it does go to appeal why we did it. If you had a you know a five acre site and you lost a couple of square meters through a shading, um, you know it's minimal percentage. But in this case, you know, I'm sure it can be worked out. 
the additional um, impact is probably, you know, a good 20 percent or something. I'm just guessing at the moment. But so I, I would recommend I will, I will support the refusal based on the proportional impact on the site. Thank you. Councillor Pratt. You're on mute, Councillor Pratt. Do beg your pardon. I support the neighbour on this one. Um, it's uh, it's not not right to uh, to build an extension on the boundary line, and uh, there's space on the other side, as Councillor Ingham said, where he can easily do a, a similar type of uh, extension without causing any of the neighbours any problems. So th that that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Woodward. Yeah, I think the point that Councillor Pook made about proportion is most relevant in that it would obscure above that fence for like two thirds of that fence, um, which is a, a quite significant. And also, the if you want a home office, then put one at the bottom of the garden against the screening there under the trees, um, which would not then impact upon um, the neighbour's property. So I, I, I'm for refusal. Um, I think we need to pay more attention to the, the health and well-being of neighbours in this context. Thank you, Councillor Woodward. Right, then uh, go back to the proposer and seconder. Can you give your reasons? Um, wait a minute. For I can assist, Chair, oh, we are going with the officer's recommendation. Absolutely, yeah, I've got that right. I had it written down wrongly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, but we will need reasons if this is refused, why it's been refused. Um, so anyway, we'll go now to you, Mrs Shaw, to sum up. Yes, Chair, thank you very much. So members, you have the uh, motion to recommend approval with the conditions as listed in the report. Please, when your name is called, would you indicate whether you support the recommendation to approve, whether you're against the recommendation to approve, or whether you're abstaining from the vote? Councillor Brown. Against. Councillor Chamberlain. Against. Councillor Davy. Against. Councillor Deseram. Against recommendation to approve. Councillor Gazard. For a support, Councillor, sorry. Thank you. Councillor Lawrence. Against. Councillor Pook. Against. Councillor Pratt. Against. Councillor Woodward. Against. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, Councillor Woodward. Councillor Skinner, sorry, apologies. Support. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Woodward was against. Uh, Councillor Rag. Abstain. Sorry, Councillor Rag, what was that? Abstain. Abstain, thank you. So that has fallen. Thank you. So um, that has fallen. Um, now we go back to... Has anyone got another recommendation, please? Recommendation to refuse. Uh, to Thank refuse. you, seconder. As, well, Councillor Pook said it better than I, on propor proportionality, proximity to, to the neighbour's boundary, a design is out of scope because the design is too big. So um, those are kind of ideas I'd, I'd like to throw in the mix. But I'm, I'm sure, you know, Councillor Pook may have extra ideas as well. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Pook's got his hand up. You seconding, Councillor yeah. Pook? I'm seconding based on the proportional on the on the negative impact on the neighbour's property um, due to the proportion of the, uh, the the property that's that's affected, and I'm sure Shirley or someone else can write that better. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Mrs. Shaw, to sum up again. <laughs> <laughs> um. So I have refused for the reasons of the uh, proportional, the negative proportional impact of the development. Um, there was mentioned proximity by Councillor de Sarum, but he didn't say proximity to what or by what. Well, to the neighbour's property, as we can see from quite clearly from the photographs, it's going to you know, obscure light. And I would say it's against policy D1, where it's not, it's not properly, you know, the, the design isn't good. If it was good at design, it wouldn't have to go that far out possibly. As, as members have suggested. Thank you. And you also mentioned 
design too big. Um, yes, I just think that it's not. It's it's going to be too big because the impact will be visual. Lock out the sun, as the as the um, as your neighbour said. So it, it's it's not. You know, it's it's going to be very difficult to um, to live in that property as we've as we've all discussed. Okay. If um, I, I, I just wonder just, if councillor. Can, uh, can I just add in? Sorry, um, Bruce. I think you're overcomplicating no. it. All the other things which are inside the building that. line are over and above. It's ba it's a straightforward. Um, uh, uh, the the negative proportional negative input on the neighbour's property, considering the size of the neighbour's property, and I think yeah, the building on the building line you can build there anyway, and the size of the size of the building inside their site that's it, that's immaterial. Yeah, I think it's just a, a, it's a bit of a test as well because if it if it does go to appeal, then um, it'll be to it'll be to understand whether. You know, impact on a bill on a on a neighbour can be you know minimal or 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 significant because of the actual size. Um, so I th I'm happy with just a very straightforward. Um, yep, I, I go I go along with that, Councillor Pook. Yep, I'm I'm happy with that recommendation. Chair, yeah. I wonder if you'd like to bring in Counts, um, Chris Rose to make a comment for about the reason for refusal. Yes, Mr. Rose. Um, yeah, my comment is it's weak, but um, okay. Uh, I think we're going on the basis of a disproportionate impact on the neighbour, given the small size of their garden, uh, and that that impact is from overshadowing and an impact on their outlook, uh, and therefore it being a, an, an a overly impressive, uh, oppressive impact, even though it's small, but on the basis that the neighbour's garden is is small in itself, and that members feel that that's a that's a significant harm. Uh, contrary to D1, I think is the relevant uh, policy. I was, I was going to mention that, D1. Yeah, um, yeah. D1. Davey, you've got your hand up. I just wondered if we could add in loss of light and loss of amenity as well. Loss of light to what? Uh, to the neighbour's garden. The sunlight. Sunlight, yes. Isn't that the, okay, is that the disproportionate argument though, that, you know, it yes. might only overshadow 20%, but it's 20% of a small area? Exactly. Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay. Mrs. Shaw. Oh, it's Thank like a you. game of ping pong, isn't it? I do. <laughs> Thank you. We now have a motion to refuse um, in the names of Dis Councillor Desarm and Councillor Pook. Um, members, when your name is called, please would you indicate whether you support the motion to recommend refusal, whether you're against the motion to recommend <laughs> refusal, or whether you're abstaining from the vote? Councillor Brown. Support. Councillor Chamberlain. Support. Councillor Davy. Support refusal. Councillor De Serum. Support refusal. Councillor Gazard. Against. Councillor Lawrence. Support. Councillor Pook. Support. Councillor Pratt. Support. Councillor Skinner. Against. Councillor Woodward. Support refusal. Councillor Rag. Abstain. Thank you. So that uh, application is recommended for refusal. Thank you, Wendy. Right, members, we'll take a 30 minute break. Um, been quite um, a difficult, more challenging morning. <laughs> Okay, and back at half past one. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Members, can I just make sure that make sure you're all muted, please? Yeah. Um, and perhaps turn your cameras off as well. Yeah.
Okay, Chair, I've, um, I've put down the slide now, so when you're ready. Yeah, ready, Wendy, thank you. Would you like to do a roll call? Yes, certainly. So I'll start with you, Councillor Rag. Present. Thank you, Councillor Chamberlain. Present. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Brown. Present. Thank you. Do we have Councillor Coleman? Because I know he was trying to make it. No, it doesn't look like it. Councillor Davey? Present. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor De Serum. Good afternoon, Wendy. Present. Thank you. Councillor Gassard. Present. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Councillor Powell. No, still no sign. Councillor La La uh, Sorry. La <laughs> Let me start again. Councillor Lawrence. <laughs> yeah, yes, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Pook. Uh, yes, Wendy, I'm here. And also, apologies, I'm going to have to leave at three o'clock. I hadn't anticipated this meeting going on so long today. OK, thank you. Councillor Pratt. Present. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Skinner. Present. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Councillor Woodward. Present, thank you. Thank you. We are correct for today. Over to you, Chair. Thank you. I will go to agenda item 11, application number 212875, variation 55 Peaslands Road, Sidmouth, pages 84 to 93. I'd like to welcome Richard Don and the ward member, Councillor Gardner. Uh, so, Chris, can you present your report, please? There we go. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so this relates to 55 Peasland in Sidmouth. Uh, it's for a variation of condition to a previous consent mm -hmm. uh, to allow the removal of boundary hedging and replace that with a wall and fencing. Uh, and it's here because there's a, a ward member objection in terms of the background, there was a 2018 application for a dwelling on this site that uh, we as the local authority refused, but that was then allowed on appeal. Uh, so that, that, that was granted. Uh, subsequent to that, there's been two applications for some very fairly small minor design changes to the buildings that have been allowed. But in each of those three consents, the uh, boundary hedging that was already on site uh, was shown to be retained. <coughs> Um, so this 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 is the site where the, the building is under construction and was granted and you see it's on a, on a prominent corner. Uh, these are the elevations of the building that's uh, under under construction and here we can see how it sits on the plot. So as I say this was granted uh, on appeal uh, but you'll note from this that there's boundary the boundary hedging uh, and trees uh, were to be uh, retained. And this is the proposal now. So the boundary planting goes and gets replaced with a low wall with a fence above. There'll be new tree planting uh, put back. Uh, there's existing uh, budlier at the bottom here to be retained and a group of pines to be retained that you'll see from the photo. No other changes, no changes to the design of the building. And these sections show a low wall with, with fencing above. Um, and so this is the aerial uh, uh, image of the site before development commenced so you can see that it was it, there was hedging to all the boundaries uh, and this was the view the street view from the site before development commenced so again you can see uh, the plant into the site and its prominent location on this corner this is the view now so you can see that there are some planting retained here and these palm trees are retained but the boundary hedging uh, has all been removed uh, so again this was a view before showing the hedging and then the view now with that uh, extent of hedging removed. Uh, and again, you can see the, de the dwelling going in, uh, being built in it in its context here. Uh, and again, and then and this is views uh, up the road and back down uh, and again from the corner. So um, the application then purely relates to the removal of this hedging and uh, whether it's appropriate, the design of the fencing and the hedging that's proposed, uh, the fencing, the brick wall and the fencing that's proposed to be put back. Uh, the applicant, uh, and it's a shame they're not here <clears throat> or making a, a comment, uh, the applicant has said they've justified the change due to the poor condition of the boundary treatment that was there. 
uh, the impact on parked cars. So they they were saying that because cars parked along here, the fact that there was a hedge there before grown into the road impacted on the parking of those cars, uh, and that they they're planting trees and that will give a better appearance to the to the development. Um, but as you can see from the photos, the landscaping that landscaping or boundary fence hedging has already been removed. Um, so although the principle was allowed on appeal, the main issue here is the visual impact. So the acceptability of replacing that hedge planting with the low, the low wall and the fencing above. Um, and I don't think there's any doubt that, that removing that uh, hedging has slightly changed the character of the area and certainly the character of the site. And it is a prominent corner location. Uh, and the, the, you can see from these photos, the character of the area, there is quite a lot of planting in the area. So it's fairly green. So from that point of view, uh, you'll hopefully see from the report that there is sympathy officers have with the town council and the ward member and the objectors in relation to the visual change that it makes from removing that uh, hedgerow that uh, surrounds the site. <clears throat> and that's pertinent as well, because there's a Sid Valley neighbourhood plan policy uh, seeks to um, make sure that developments have regard to the character of the area. And I think this is where our assessment as officers starts to become a bit more balanced, because when you look at the uh, images of the area, there are there is greenery, but also there's walls and fencing in the area. And you can see here uh, retaining wall fences. Um, and if I flick through the photos, you'll see various other fences uh, in the area. Again, low wall, some fencing, low walls just further down the street with some fencing above. Um, Okay, and again, this property on the corner here, another wall with fencing above. So whilst it is disappointing that the applicant seen the fit and seen the need to remove that boundary hedging, um, I think given that the character of the area is mixed with hedges and with some of these boundary walls and fencing, <clears throat> on balance, you'll see that officers feel that uh, it, it's going to be difficult to resist an appeal on the basis of the change of the character of the area. Uh, there's been some concerns mentioned of ecology, but the hedging has already removed, been removed, although it's unlikely uh, from the photos we've got that the hedging was uh, likely to have any uh, wider ecological value other than other than nestings of birds. Um, and there is landscaping proposed in its place, as I say, the retention of this, these palm trees and some new trees behind the, the hedging. So. In conclusion, it will it will change the character of this this prominent corner. Um, it, ideally, they wouldn't have removed those hedges. They might have pruned them back and planted in any gaps. But I think the applicant uh, uh, is taken on board the fact that there's a sort of change, a, a slight variation in the character of the area. There are some low walls. There is fencing. There's a combination of walls and fences to some of the other properties in the area. And therefore, on balance, I think that that mix of boundary hedging and fencing in the area um, has, has to, brought us to a, a balanced recommendation of approval. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, just a question, um, Chris. Uh, it says in the report on page 87, appropriate trees will be planted behind the fence. Do we know what sort of trees those will be? Um, I think, uh, I don't know if I have it to hand, but I can come back to you uh, in a minute after you've heard from the other speakers, if you want me to confirm that. That that would be helpful because there is a lot of concern about the removal of the hedge. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Richard Don, objector, um, welcome to the meeting. You have three minutes. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, good afternoon now. Can you <laughs> clearly, please? Yes, we can. Brilliant. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Right, here we go then. Thank you very much. I wish to raise the following points in relation to this three story, three bedroom, three bathroom detached house. The developer is still presenting this as a two story dwelling. The original refused application only passed that appeal was for a small two-story, two-bedroom detached house surrounded by the existing mature hedging and more than two metres clearance to all public boundaries with all details to match and complement the existing dwelling. This has been marketed since December 
by Hall and Scott of Ottery as a three-storey, three-bedroom, three-bathroom house with wall and fence surround, but using the planning pictures of the original two-storey, two-bedroom house, not the three-storey timber-framed house that has actually been built. The first four conditions applied to approval 211148 have all been significantly contravened. The main contravention points from the plans are as follows. The roof pitch of the main north elevation on Peaslands Road has been increased from 45 to 53 degrees with subsequent ridge height increase and even more overbearing effect. This roof looks very odd, unlike any house anywhere in the entire outer area and over 10 feet forward of the building line. The third storey, floor to ridge board height, has been increased from 2.2 metres on the plans to 3.6 metres, with the significant rise of the ridge. The dormer has increased from 1 metre to over 2 metres in both width and height, with much steeper pitch, quite unlike the drawings and plans, looking very incongruous. There are no painted timber, barge or fascia boards, windows or doors, as the plan specified, only plastic. There is no pebble dash textured finish to the first floor. The turret roof has changed from 33 to 53 degrees and from one metre to over two metres in height. The finial is not fitted to the southeast ridge end, so there are only three, not four. The margin to the public boundary at Highfield is only 1.6 metres, not the assured two metres, as the site size did not grow. The hedges and habitats to be retained were totally removed in September, hence this retrospective application. This has caused a massive negative impact on the area, both through the street scene and increase of traffic noise and removal of the greenery. In conclusion, the proposed landscaping has been reviewed by Sidmouth Town Council, who find it also contravenes policy seven in their submitted letter. The wall, just like the other contraventions, has already been built anyway, regardless of the planning process. The changes to the timber frame building structure with a massively yeah. increased in bizarrely shaped roof structure. Okay, just finishing. Thank you very much. And bizarrely shaped roof structure will be in place for many generations and are visible from numbers 1 to 81 of Peaslands Road. This retrospective application for landscaping amendments is therefore the final straw of many contraventions and should not be permitted because it merely addresses the plants inside the fence where there is barely room to fit them anyway. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Dong. Now, uh, Ms. Rose, would you like to respond to, in particular, the increased height of the building, uh, the building line, and the fact that it's now three stories and not two, as alleged by the objector? Um, yeah, so the, the, w there's been there's been three applications on the site previous to this one. There was the original application in 2018 that went to the appeal that that we that we are following our refusal that the inspector approved. Right. Then we had a further application in 2019 uh, to make some changes to the parking arrangement and to the ground floor plan uh, that was then approved. And then we had a further amendment uh, in 2020. Uh, which allowed, sorry, there's been four applications. That was in 2020 that allowed the use of the loft space and had a slight increase in height. And then there was a further application last year in 2021, which changed the slight footprint of the building on the site. Um, to my knowledge, what's being constructed on site is as per the approvals. Um, but I, but I, but, Sorry to interject, but it, it absolutely is not 
OK, then if I let me continue, I will say I will ask the enforcement officer to go out and to do those measurements and to um, and to assess that. That doesn't that, that doesn't impact necessarily on this application because we need to assess the, um, you know, the, the acceptability or otherwise of the removal of the the hedge in. But to my knowledge, it, 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 it was being constructed as part of those consents. But I will ask the enforcement officer to go out and to check those issues that Mr. Don has raised in terms of the, the footprint and the bedrooms and the heights. Thank you, Mr. Rose. And presumably, if the enforcement officer uh, finds that it's not been built in accordance with the um, previous approval, then enforcement action could be taken. Yeah, so will there be, two, the, the, yeah, I mean, the applicant, uh, we could take enforcement action to get it um, put put back to as it was approved. Uh, alternatively, though, the applicant would have the opportunity to put in a plan and application and test the suitability of that. Okay, thank you. Right, ward member then, Councillor Gardner. Thank you. You have, you, five, very... you have five minutes. Thank you very much, Councillor Rag. Um, as uh, the previous speaker has said, this application um, appears to have breached four conditions from the original application, um, which are very, very concerning. But my concern today is that what the committee is looking at is a fait accompli. It isn't about whether we can uh, remove the condition about the boundary hedging, but just to basically wave through the fact that they've already taken all the hedging out. Mm. Um, and therefore, this is a retrospective application to approve what's already been done. Mm. Um, I'm also very concerned, and I would like uh, one of the officers or to come back to the committee about whether there is enough space around this property to put in the planting that they're suggesting. Mm. Um, having looked at it myself, it's very, very close to the pavement. There's hardly any land left available, any mud left available. Um, the pavement's been chewed away. You can see that in some of the photographs yeah. to allow the wall to go in without planning consent. Um, whatever plants will go in um, don't have a lot of room. Um, we are stuck with this as a retrospective, but it's a really appalling situation that the developer here has just decided to take the hedges out immediately and not even bother to ask at the beginning for permission to do that. Um, we've now got an extremely large property on a very small plot on a prominent position in the road. Um, it's so close to the pavement, I would question what can be done. But I think we should at least try to make sure that whatever planting can go in goes in. Um, I don't know what that means in terms of the wall and the fence. My preference would always be to have a hedge instead of a fence. Um, it's possible to grow hedges and keep them quite narrow. Um, but I realise this is a very difficult situation. But I think the committee is being asked to make a judgment on something that may not be as it is presented to you in the plans. I would question the amount of mud available for planting um, and whether that's even possible let alone the investigation of the other potential breaches of the application. So whether you want to defer this for further information from the officers or a site visit, um, I, I'm really not sure, but, but this application is, is, it just doesn't make any sense to make a decision on it today. It, for my, in my opinion, I think you need to understand the site, that what's left of it now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gardner. And that, that was the point I was making about what sort of trees could go in there. Um, right, when it comes to deferring, um, Mr. Rose, um, would, how close are, is this application? How likely would it be to go to non-determination for non-determination to appeal? Well, they, 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 well, they've they've got a they've got a right to they'll have a right to appeal against non determination. But I'm I'm not I'm in, I'm I'm not worried about that in this case because, okay. as Councillor Gardner said, they've taken out the they've taken out the hedge before getting consent to do so, and yeah. there seems to be questions, understandably, from the the resident about the build that's taken place and its accordance with the plan. So, yeah. from that point of view, if members wanted to defer it to allow us to go away and investigate what what if any further changes have happened and this issue about the space for the landscape and then I'd, I'd be I'd be happy for us to do that. Thank you. Right. I've got two hands up. Councillor Gazard. Thank you, Chair. Yes, deplorable. Um, I have to say that um, 
No, the developers decided just to rip the, the hedges out uh, and not given any thought to the damage that it's caused and let alone to um, the wildlife that were probably uh, nesting in there at any rate. But um, Councillor Gardner makes a, a very good um, um, case and, and I, I, I would support what um, she said and, and what um, Mr Rose has said. So I, th I think this one needs to be deferred to see whether or not, A, whether we do a site visit and um, if from looking at looking at the, the picture in front of me, um, I, I don't know whether there's enough room for for the for the trees to go in. And as as you said, chair, it depends what sort of trees they're going to put in. Um, yeah. But it, but it's a shocking state of affairs. This. Thank you. Thank you. I, so I, you're proposing deferral. I, I would support that. Yes. Support yes, chair. Please. Council. Um, I would support Councillor Gazard's um, deferral. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, chair. I would. would support, you like uh, to be I would, I would support Councillor Gazard's reasons for deferral, particularly as it's a prominent corner where it is located. And I think that's something we, we need to take into consideration, that uh, not only has the action happened with the wall disappearing, but it, it, it must be looked at properly. Um, and so I would definitely go along the lines of deferral. And the deferral, to be clear, is that for, for, for more information? Yes, I would say we need we need more information, and we need to know the impact it would have if we were to take to put the wall up. Would there, you know, would this be very negative? And also, would we be able to grow the plants if we wanted to grow the bush, the hedgerows? Because it is quite clear that we must must seek to preserve wildlife from amenities and habitats wherever we can. Yeah, thank thank you, Councillor De Sons. Councillor Skinner. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, and I think um, uh, I was very much going to support. A deferral, and I and I I'm actually wondering whether or not um, a site inspection might be applicable at this on this site, or, or may may not be. I, I I'll, I'll concede to Mr. Rosa on that one a little bit because I think probably lots of the information could come back. But from what Councillor Gardner was suggesting earlier is that the impact and, and the gentleman speaking before the impact on this um, house. Is, is it sounding to me like it's a little bit out of scale to what was started. So we've got an application that starts with three or four um, amendments to that in changing it. And, and now we've got the hedge ripped out, which is, uh, which is you know, it's, it's not good, to be honest. And I, and I think um, I'm definitely in support of a deferral, um, but I'm just wondering whether or not, um, I'm not sure really. I wonder what Mr. Rose, what would we gain from a, could I ask Mr. Rose through you, Chair? Well, you we can, I think we've got plenty of photographic evidence there, don't you? Um, yeah, well, I, ju I just wonder whether or not Mr Rose felt it would be there's relevance of going on site or not. Be, Mr Rose, um, I think I would. I'd, I, I think I would like uh, the opportunity to go and look into those other issues raised by the yeah. neighbour there about the, about the build, whether it complies with what's been approved, because that might that might factor into our determination yeah. and your yes. determination. And if yeah. we can do that and present you with the evidence and maybe more photos, then at that time, you yeah. can decide whether you have enough or, or not. Yeah, thank you. I've, 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 got, I've got deferral then. That's it, deferral. Councillor Davey. Yeah, I'm, I'm just questioning whether we need to defer this. Um, this is a retrospective application, but let's just assume for a moment that the hedge is still there. Um, and that we're being asked to sanction its removal and its replacement with a nice tidy little wall and fence. Um, and I think it's not just the visual um, impact of this, um, but it is pretty obvious that there is a considerable amount of hedging in that area. And I feel that every little loss of hedgerow uh, is going to add to the next person saying, oh, well, you get all sorts around here. Look, there's walls with fences there. Um, so it, gradually over time, those hedgerows will disappear. And it's not just the visual aspect. It is a loss of habitat. Um, you could easily um, have put a bird feeder in there and you're going to get loads of birds there because there's lots of cover for them. And uh, as nesting birds has been mentioned, but <clears throat> birds use hedgerows for all sorts of things, not just for nesting. They feed in them, 
um, because they're often uh, small insects that will uh, sustain uh, songbirds. They're vital for cover. Um, I have a little flock of sparrows around here, which are, by the way, in decline sparrows. Um, and the reason they're declining is that we are removing their life support systems. And this is yet another little incremental bit of pulling that away. <clears throat> so I think um, the hedge has gone, but uh, we're being asked to uh, sanction the removal of the hedge because it's in poor condition. Fine, replace it with a hedge. Um, so uh, I don't know if that is going to need a site inspection to ascertain whether a hedge could be replanted, but I, I think that's their problem. Um, we just say, uh, you want to take a hedge out, okay, it's in poor condition, but you replace it with one. And I very much hope that's what we'll put into our uh, new local plan as well. Um, I shall certainly be suggesting that. Um, so uh, I think that... Um, uh, the the removal of the hedge um, is is not acceptable on uh, both visual and biodiversity grounds, um, and uh, therefore they should replant it. Yeah, well, we, we'll await the report from the um, enforcement officers on yeah. that one. Councillor Pratt. Yes, I was going to say that, Chair. Uh, um, we just need to wait for a report uh, on the building issues and also the site issues. Um, and then we we can uh, then decide once we have those reports, and I hope there'll be detailed reports too. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Mrs. Shaw. Thank you, Chair. Yes, members. Um, I have a note that uh, there's a recommendation to uh, defer for further information as to the availability of sufficient land for appropriate landscaping and for information as to any breaches of conditions. Members, when your name is called, please would you indicate whether you support the motion to defer, whether you're against the motion to defer, or whether you're abstaining from the vote. Councillor Brown. Support. Councillor Chamberlain. Support. Councillor Davy. Support. Councillor Deseran. Support deferral. Councillor Gazard. Support. Councillor Lawrence. Support. Councillor Pook. Support. Councillor Pratt. Support deferral. Councillor Skinner. Support deferral. Councillor Woodward. Support deferral. Councillor Rag. Support deferral. I think that was you, Thank Lance. You. It was, yep. So that's um, recommended for deferral. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> how long do you think, Mr Rose, before that comes back to us when the officers can get out and have a look? Uh, well, we, we can go out fairly quickly, but given yeah. that the deadline for the next committee is this Friday, I think we're probably looking <laughs> at uh, the April committee for it coming back. OK, thank you. And we'll be in good time, will we? Sorry? We'll be in time. They, they won't go... I'm not, as I said, I said earlier, I'm not, I'm, given that there's concerns over what they've built, given the yeah. concerns about the, the hedging and the siting, yeah, I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I'm not concerned if they go on, if they want to go to appeal, Thank I you. think, I think they'll be, I think they'll be silly. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, I think they've been silly anyway. Um, agenda item 12, application 21, 14, 97, full, minor, building adjacent, Turbury, um, Dunkerswell, pages 94 to 111. And I'd like to welcome Councillor Barrow, the ward member, and David Burley, please. Um, over to you, Mr Rose. Thank you. Yeah, so we're we're in Dunkerswell here, and this is the the site. Uh, oh, before I start, I should say we've had uh, one further letter of objection in since the report was submitted, stating that uh, there's a need for this building to be retained in agricultural use, uh, and that it should, in effect, retain be retained in agricultural use. And they're concerned about additional traffic movements uh, associated with the proposal that I'll explain. 
And the proposal is to demolish this existing agricultural building and to construct five live work units in its place. And it's before committee as there's a ward member objection. Members might recall this site from uh, an application we had in, I think it was 21, uh, where there was a change of use from the agricultural building to a commercial use. So, but now we're, they want to demolish the agricultural building and construct five live work units. So this is the agricultural building on the site at the moment with an access down to the, the main road. Uh, so uh, uh, an exceptional agricultural building in appearance, bit, bit dated and, and poor. And then they're proposing to replace it with this run of five uh, live work units. Um, and they uh, appear like this, so much narrower plan form. Uh, we've got live area above uh, the work element uh, the downstairs, which is mainly uh, office or workshop use. Uh, so the, these are the images of the site. So this is the building. You can see there's all sorts of uh, paraphernalia on the site associated with it as well. Uh, it doesn't have a great appearance, bearing in mind we're, we're in the uh, AOMB. Um, and that's the view from the, from the road. So it's a large building at the moment. As I say, it's in the Black Down Hills AOMB. Uh, it's on a sort of high open a flat plateau. Uh, and you can see there's this, this building here with this large pitch roof at the moment. Uh, and the new building proposed sort of half the width of this uh, and it would be timber clad with an aluminium roof. And as part of it, they'd, they'd tidy up the remainder of this site. Um, so with regard to the principal, we're, we're in the countryside. Uh, Dunkerswell doesn't have a built up area boundary and there's been no local plan policy support for live work units in this location. But there is a live work uh, policy in the Dunkerswell neighbourhood plan, that's policy LE1, and that supports live work units uh, in the neighbourhood plan area subject to a number of criteria. Uh, the parish council and the ward member uh, wants that policy to, or read that policy to say that the, the live work unit should only go on the existing uh, industrial estate or the airfield. Um, and, but, and, and you'll see in the report, the, um, the policy is, is written out in there that, the, that it says that there's a um, preference. So preferably the units will be located on the industrial, industrial estate. Mm. Um, and the supporting statement to that makes it clear that it's not inclusive, exclusive to being to go in the industrial estate. And we've also had an appeal decision that says that, uh, that the policy doesn't, isn't restricted only to uh, exist, the existing industrial estate or airfield. So from that point of view, policy LE1 uh, can be applied to this site or, or any sites within the neighbourhood plan area, not just to a particular area. Um, as I say, and that, that position's backed up from appeal. So in terms of the principle of development, uh, it gains support under policy LE1 of the neighbourhood plan. Um, but then we need to go on to the impact on the character of the appearance of the area. Um, it's, it's agricultural at the moment, although it has sort of industrial uh, sort of appearance to it because of the para paraphernalia that is going on. So the site itself is fairly poor in appearance. Um, there's limited vantage points, although you do view it from the, from the main road, which is behind where this, this camera point is taken. Um, the proposed design of the build has changed during the course of the application. So we've got a, a, a smaller um, footprint uh, proposed. So we've reduced the, and this is now half the width of the existing building. You can see the dotted line of the existing building. The ridge has been reduced, so it's no higher than the existing ridge. And they've changed uh, some of the materials and so that we've got less scale and bulk. And they've also proposed um, landscaping to the site. Uh, and we have a landscaping plan in now that shows that landscaping for the scheme. So you can see various trees to the frontage, to the rear and around the parking area, which will, uh, in officers' views, uh, in view, enhance the site. Um, and should members um, approve permission, then I'd ask for a change to the condition, because uh, there's a condition recommended at the moment for submission of a landscaping scheme. But we, we do actually have that landscaping scheme now. The other thing we've uh, done is reduce the glaze into the new building to ensure that there's a minimal light spill uh, to the back. We've reduced the number of windows that are on the rear side facing out into the countryside and we've sought balconies that were posed on there to be removed. So that's, that's all to lessen the visual impact and to reduce any light spill in the AOMB. Um, and, in and that's also addressed the landscape architects uh, comments. So from that point of view, 
uh, officers are happy with the design and the visual impact and feel it will be improvement over the existing site. Uh, in terms of impact on neighbours, there are some neighbours nearby, nearby, but a, a, an office workshop use at ground floor and residential above um, is going to be less, uh, should be less intrusive than the fallback position of the industrial use that's granted or even the continued agricultural use of the building. And the environmental health officers have uh, been involved to ensure there'd be no harm from the use on adjoining properties or equally uh, any harm to the live element of this from the adjoining uh, industrial area. Uh, and also there's, there's trees on the boundary between to mitigate any uh, impact between the two sites. In terms of highway safety, the trips will be modest, modest and there's no, uh, no objection from the County Highway Authority. Uh, there's a condition to deal with surface water runoff, but given that the uh, footprint of the building is substantially less than the existing footprint, we're happy that that can be uh, dealt with by condition. So, uh, Policy LE1 of the neighbourhood plan supports the proposal in principle. Although there's a preference for this to go to the industrial estate, that doesn't mean that such uses can't go elsewhere. The visual impact is considered to be acceptable and an improvement over the existing with a better appearance of building and landscaping. And uh, in light of that and no highway safety or other immediate concerns, applications recommended for approval with conditions. Thank you. Uh, now, David Burley has withdrawn. So instead, we, we have Councillor Barrow. Welcome to the meeting, Councillor Barrow. You have three minutes. Oh, good afternoon. Yes, um, Dunkelsworth's Highway neighbor, uh, Neighbourhood Plan was um, accepted in November 29, uh, in 2017. The planning officer that came to Dunkerswell at the time said that this would now be the planning bible and would be followed to the letter. We have found that this is not always the case with the parish. We, the parish council uses its local knowledge and the true facts to mark, make our decisions, not the pipe dream reports that the agents very often come up with. Our neighbourhood plan, as far as we are concerned, clearly states that live work units or all right, and should be on the airfield, not dotted around as units. The Burley um, agents that have wrote this report have named three as comparisons. Turbury Farm we were against because it was a one of out in the open. Lodge Farm was established business anyway. The Gliding Club um, live work unit is on the airfield, and that complies with LE 147, 48 and 49 in our neighbourhood plan policy. Um, this is not a redundant shed. There was plenty of people willing to use it. As far as we're concerned, it is a bit of a con to get a new, uh, just a new building. They've not done a soak away test because it won't work there because the type of land there is in the lowest part of the field. And... Uh, it won't soak away, that's why they've not done one. They refer to the, uh, and the runs that they to refer to would run straight to the Madford, Madford River. Um, it was a sheep shed, and uh, as you all probably know, that the nature of the sheep's um, digestive system keeps a lot cleaner and, lot, and doesn't get the wet. That's why they've had no problem in the past. It will be more Arctic lorries going up that road, which has a weight limit of 7.5 tonnes. There's 23 acres of brownfield site on the airfield that is quite suitable for putting in these live work units, which we favoured there. And as you know, we, we agreed to one that you've passed for the block making company up there. We're dead against it going up this road because it's not necessary and we would really rather like to keep all the live work units on the airfield and contained because spreading around like this is only going to increase the spreading and you can guarantee that in a few years time they'll want to add to these down that field more and more. Um, as regards the, the um, foul drainage, we're strongly against that because the Madford has been polluted several times from up there and that's why we were quite happy <clears throat> when East Devon Tire or North Devon Tires took over the industrial site up the road and, and done away from pigs and things like that, which was causing more pollution. So I really hope you will consider not passing this because we know there is things on that Burley thing that are not all 
hundred percent true. Thank you very much. Thank you. And just to ask Mr. Rose, um, there is nothing from the flood risk manager at Devon County Council. So, um, um, so I take it they didn't have a view on this. Or would they consult that, that, that's that's correct and they, well, they, they we know they, from they, local knowledge that 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 piece of strict um ditch has caused pollution on the madford in the past and this is why we're concerned about that they've not done a percolation test because it won't work there because the subsoil is so um so deep in clay there and the topsoil is so minimal it just uh, they'll just be sending it straight to the stream they, 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 they haven't done a percolation test they, they'll have to do a percolation test as part of the condition, and if if the if the surface in isn't suitable for runoff, then they'll have to provide a tank that will then flow yeah. at a reduced rate. Um, yeah. And they, Devon County don't comment on all applications, and in this yeah. case, I'm sure they haven't commented because the the footprint of the hard surface of the building here is less than the existing building. Um, so from that point of view, uh, they'll be happy that uh, the runoff uh, can be can be dealt with by condition and control. Yeah, but on the other hand, the sheep produce a lot drier uh, basis than what the number of people in those lit Wernick unit will. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Barrow. I think you've had a good go at this. Um, now then, there's a statement, I believe, from Councillor Key, Wendy, to read. Yes, there's a short statement. So um, his statement reads as follows. The application for the conversion of the agricultural building to five live work units should be refused as it is against the Dunkiswell neighbourhood plan and the Blackdown Hills policy. The building was erected for agriculture and would not have been granted otherwise and should remain so. End of statement. Thank you. Right, to you, Councillor Brown, as the other ward member. I'm, I'm a ward member, but I'll come in with the committee. It gives me a bit more time. Well, you've got as much time as you want anyway. Yeah, now I'll come in for the committee to make a recommendation, please. OK, well, would you like to start off then? Because there's nobody else. Oh, right. Manager. I'm all by myself, right. Um, this site is one and three quarter miles from the main area of Dunkerswell. And if you was to walk it, you've got to walk down unmade roads to the only shop, which would take you about 35 minutes. Um, and it's in open countryside in an area of outstanding natural beauty. At the rear is West Oak, a commercial building which has trouble renting out its floor space at three pound a square foot. In February 2017, West Oak applied for one office to become a residential caretaker's apartment. It was refused. The reason given was due to its rural location, contrary to development in the countryside, and guidance in the National Planning Policy Framework. In June 2016, an appeal was dismissed on the road from Percy Cross to Lapid Common for an agricultural workers unit, which was no more than 200 metres to the main housing estate in Dunkerswell, and where the applicant kept his equipment. This was because it, it was outside a built up area boundary and it was refused for that reason. This application before us today is contrary to the Dunkerville neighbourhood plan, where they would like to keep development for this type confined to the airfield. This is an open countryside. On page 97 of the report, East Devon District uh, Council landscape architect states in his report that this should be refused due to landscape and visual impact. The Black Daniels AOMB on page 99 say there is no evidence for need of such development and it should be in a business industrial area adjacent to the airfield rather than in open countryside some distance from the village. The rural character and appearance of this part of the OMB is already compromised by existing development and as such further encroachment of urbanised development industrial use with accommodation plus associated <laughs> car parking, et cetera, and the creation of garden areas into undeveloped agriculture areas should be resisted in order to safeguard the rural character. Mm. We should be conserving and announcing the OMB. On page 100, the environmental health starts his statement recommending refusal 
and states it would create unsatisfactory living conditions for prospective residents. In further comments, he disagrees with the amount of acoustic benefits that could be achieved from the tree and the bank that has concerns in relation to noise. It does not meet policy E5 economic development in rural areas. It does not involve the conversion of an existing building. It is not on previously developed land, it's on agricultural land. It's on a greenfield site, not well related to the village in sustainable terms or in the surrounding area. Bearing in mind it is one and three quarter miles from Dunkerswell. In a recent appeal, 16th of November 2021, the inspector refused one affordable house in Dunkelsville Village because it was not included in the Strategy 70, 27 settlements in built up area boundaries. And it was not identified in paragraph 17, uh, paragraph 79 rather, of the framework for which promotes sustainable developments. And I therefore recommend this proposal for refusal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Brown. Um, Mr. Rose, would you like to respond to any of those points? But I'd like to ask something as well. I know when it comes to residential um, development, we have sequential testing in uh, areas at flood risk. Um, is there anything where there's a designated area as at Dunkerswell um, for industrial work, live work units? Um, is there any form of sequential testing for that, I, I'm not aware of it. Uh, taking that question first, no. I mean, in terms of live work in Dunkerswell, then there's policy LE1 and there's the criteria there that it mm. need, that would need to comply with. Mm. Um, and there, there, there isn't a criteria there about, uh, about its location or close relationship to service and facilities. Um, yeah. uh, there's, there's, a, there's a lot that Councillor Brown said that I agree with in terms yeah. of relevant policies that he quotes about other schemes. But those policies aren't policies that we're considering this application against. No. The, 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 the clear facts are that policy LE1 of the neighbourhood plan states that uh, the proposed units, so this live work units, would be well related to uses of the surrounding land and buildings and in brackets, preferably located on the industrial, industrial estate. Yeah. It says preferably located, not yeah. must be located. And in yeah. addition to that, there's the um, supporting text to that policy in the neighbourhood plan at policy eight, uh, paragraph 8.8 8, 8 .8, that says um, live work units uh, shouldn't be to the detriment of the area. And it says that they don't have to be located. Um, no, no, sorry, 8.7. Our policy LE1 is designed to facilitate the appropriate development of live work space, principally, but not exclusively on the existing industrial estate. Now, I understand what Councillor Brown's saying, but the neighbourhood plan policy is written to allow uh, live work units anywhere in that neighbourhood plan area. And I understand what Councillor Barrow was saying, but I'm afraid that the policy that they've drafted doesn't achieve what they believe it achieves or it needs rewording because if they want it to relate just to the industrial estate, then that's what the policy should say. Um, and when we've got supporting text that says it can go elsewhere, we've got a policy that says it can go elsewhere, and we've had an appeal decision yeah. from an inspector to say that live work can go anywhere in that neighbourhood plan area, our hands are tied. What it then comes down to, which this our report tries to go through, is an assessment of the, the visual impact on the AOMB. Um, and for the reasons I've stated in terms of it being a, a smaller building, probably a, a less intrusive use than the agricultural building or certainly the industrial fallback. And given the small scale of it, smaller building, I, I, I think it's going to be hard to say that this has a, a more harmful impact on the AOMB. Uh, mm. So, so for, for those reasons, I, I, I don't see how we would be able to justify a, a refusal, certainly not on the principal grounds. I, I appreciate the design and impact on the AOMB might be more subjective, but certainly not on the basis that the, the policy um, doesn't allow live work in this location, because it does. Thank you. And the sustainability <laughs> argument interests me because we, we turned down... Um, applications for holiday accommodation because they're not in a sustainable yes. location and yet it's at odds with what's being proposed here and that you know people will still have to travel to get to the shops and the services so uh, 
Councillor can, can I just come back, uh, Eileen? Sorry, I can't raise my hand. Um, you know, the, the, on page 99, the AOMB are not in supportive of this application, and they're the one who know the area. And Councillor Brown, that's why we have then negotiated uh, a different scheme in terms of reducing the footprint of the building, changing the windows, getting the landscaping in, working with the landscape architect that, that, that that's why we've made those changes to address those comments but i do yeah, appreciate yeah. it's now for you as office as, as officers <laughs> as as members to make that decision on is that good enough does that have a, a it, it does it have an acceptable impact on the aomb now or not but just to yeah, confirm the, the, those the, comments the, and those of the landscape architect were were before the amendments to the scheme yeah but they and, haven't come back with the new application with the new things that come in they have not come back and said yes we support that no, I don't think we've consulted them because we they feel we've addressed to. their comments. They don't need to. Um, Councillor Woodward. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, I think it's probably the first one this, today where I'm going to uh, concur with the officer's recommendation. Um, we can see that MPPPF 82 supports the application. And uh, with regard to the citing of it, we've had the reference to it being preferable only, um, and therefore this can go anywhere. And also putting it into context, it look as though from the very first, well, from the, the map that we have right at the beginning of the papers, it is right next door to an industrial estate, to a light industrial estate. So it's the context of this um, live work um, building seems appropriate. Um, I think it's, we are looking now 2022 towards diversification in rural places. So this I think would enhance the rural economy by providing offices and um, I mean, the offices, I mean, think uh, Councillor Barrow referred to articulated lorries. Well, I don't think there will be any articulated lorries um, going to what will be office uh, accommodation. It's more likely, hopefully, to be used by IT people and research and uh, desk base. So I don't think there'll be heavy lorries going up and down to the building. Um, as to uh, Councillor Brown referred to it using a greenfield site, well, it's actually a brownfield because it's an existing building, which is actually going to be occupying a smaller uh, footprint of that building. So it's a brownfield site, not a greenfield site. Um, as well as the e economic benefits, there's incredible housing benefits. These are by their nature going to be um, smaller, more modest dwellings. And I think it's a great opportunity to have a place where people can live and work in the same place. There'll be less commuting because they'll only be walking. Down the stairs. So I think that would be an improvement for their lifestyle. Uh, there's a number of issues around um, which have been addressed in the conditions. There's seven conditions. Uh, I think there'll be an improvement for the landscaping. It looks rather a mess at the moment. Um, so all in all, I think um, I agree with the officer's recommendation of approval. Thank you. Thank you. Now I go back to Councillor Brown who proposed refusal. Is there a seconder for that proposal? Councillor Desarum, happy to second. Councillor Desarum, would you like to speak to it? Yeah, thank you so much, Chair. Um, I note what Mr. Rose said to us about the appeal decision that live work units can go anywhere. But I think having worked on our own Exmouth neighbourhood plan for many, many years, I think that we as members need to support the spirit and aims of a neighbourhood plan, um, because clearly in this instance, it, it, it isn't suitable where the location is proposed. And I think we must also defer to our own landscape architect, Chris Haredes. He's He's been on many occasions our source of wisdom and guidance. And I think on page 97, as, as Councillor Brown said, he wasn't happy with it. And I, I think also on page 105, it strikes me as the report said that, however specified within the Black Down Hills management plan, natural beauty is not just the look of the landscape. There is also a duty to ensure the tranquility of the A&B and its sensory experiences. And again, the report goes on to talk about we've got issues with windows on the western elevation. So really, for all those reasons, um, I, I am quite concerned about it. Uh, and I feel that it does fail policy five on page 103 of LE1. I think that where it says there'll be no adverse impact. And I think that it would fail probably at least um, B, item B, the character of the natural environmental setting. So that's what I would propose uh, we would refuse it on. So those are, those are the thoughts that I've had. And I will now obviously go, open it back out to the committee again. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Lawrence. 
Thank you, Chair. And um, I just wanted a bit of clarification from somebody, really, because you touched on it just now. This this matter of sustainability. If this was going to be a new house, we would have to take serious concern over sustainability, closeness to shops, bus routes, and all the rest of it. Um, but it doesn't seem to apply in this case. Could somebody explain why? Yeah, through, through you, Chair, it's because yeah. policy LE1 of the neighbourhood plan doesn't have a criteria about location, about being needing to be close to services and facilities. So if there's no criteria in the policy to assess it again, th there's no requirement to assess it. OK, thank you very much. Sorry, sorry about that, because I, I, oh, I no, thought that, that all new buildings no, that's fine. have yeah, we, we, we need clarification that anyone has any question, don't be afraid to ask. That's how we learn. Councillor Skinner. Councillor Skinner. Thank you, Chair. And uh, yes, and I, I've uh, listened to this debate and I particularly didn't put my hand up. I, I had my view fairly early on. and But I wanted to listen to lots of people chucking in some different points of view. Um, and, and, I, and I'm going to I'm going to actually land on the side of, of, of I've always been uh, supportive of business and business growth anyway. So I'm actually going to support land on the support of uh, approval with conditions. And I can't remember. Sorry, was it Councillor Woodward who made a did he make the recommendation for approval and was it seconded i can't remember now well i think I, I was no, there was no proposal for approval well it's i'm gonna make it then. refuse i'm gonna make i'm sorry there was what the proposal is to refuse and that's been seconded ah, right okay well then and then i'll say more because i'm i'm going to uh i'll come back if i may because i actually think i'm going to be supportive of this uh this particular application and um uh, so I'll just leave it to that, I think, and then okay. uh, we'll, we'll see what get us up the vote, and then we can see where that goes. Thank you. Yeah, Councillor Gassard, you had your hand up. You've taken it down. Yeah, um, the point I was going to make, Chair, be made. Thank okay. you. Okay, Councillor Pratt. Thank you, Chair. Um, the officers of the Blackdown Hills AONB uh, partnership have made a statement, and. Uh, they are saying that this is encroachment of urbanized development into the undeveloped agricultural area. So uh, they say that it should be resisted in order to safeguard the rural character of the area and conserving and enhancing the AONB. So we have to take that into account. And uh, I will be supporting uh, Councillor Brown on this. Yeah, but um, Mr. Rose already explained that they addressed the AOMB's concerns, the Blackdown Hills. So that those concerns have been addressed and um, they haven't come back on that. So next um, we have Councillor Davy. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I've got some concerns about this application because essentially we are looking at housing in the open countryside. Um, and I know it's, it, it is live-work units, and I'm normally very supportive of those because they do cut down on commuting. But as has been pointed out, um, the uh, residents are going to need um, to use a car for almost any other activity, which could be quite considerable, possibly even more than commuting. Um, I just, uh, Mr. Roses, uh, in the report, I know it says that Dunkerswell has a, a limited range of facilities. I just wonder if he could tell us what facilities Dunkerswell has, because um, otherwise I'd have to go back to the strategic committee uh, report and look that one up. Oh, I can't, you got me there. I think Councillor Brown will probably be able to help. I, I know it's got, I think it's one short of having the number of facilities needed to have a built-up area boundary. So from that point of view, it must have, it must have four of the, of the five needed, uh, I think where it falls down, and Councillor Brown will be able to um, correct me if I'm wrong, is, is it's a fairly limited public transport. It, it, it's got limited public transport. It has no school whatsoever. All children have got to meet in the centre of Bank as well to be bused to their appropriate schools in the area. Um, it's got one shop. It's got no pub. Um, the only thing it's got that um, other villages or towns or cities haven't got, except for Exeter, is an airport. But other than that, it's got no facilities that one can speak of. No. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, and Councillor Woodward. I'm just wondering if you wouldn't mind indulging me, if the first slide could be put up by Mr Rose again, the very first one, just showing 
its proximity to the building next door. Well, we've got an industrial state right next door. So I'm rather bemused by the fact that it's, you know, referring to agricultural open countryside when it's just a stone's throw over a hedge. I mean, an industrial estate, so it seems to be a perfectly good place to have a um, commercial or office building. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, I'd like um, to ask can, can, I, can I, sorry to interrupt again, sh sh shall I explain where it is exactly? Uh, well, I think we can see it. We can see it, 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 it's got Brown, one industrial, it's, um, it's got, it has got an industrial unit next door, which was an old pig farm, which they can't have, have limited success in renting it out at three pounds per square foot. And a accommodation that was applied for there was refused for one unit for someone to be a, um, a caretaker for it. Okay, thank you. Can I bring Mr Rose in to respond to any of the points that have been made, please? Thank you. Yeah, just, just commenting on the, the reasons put forward for refusal. I, I, I admire Councillor de Sarum's, um desire to um, support Dunk as well and the spirit and the aims of the neighbourhood plan, but it, it, it's, it's about making a decision in accordance with the wording of the neighbourhood plan, which I shan't repeat, but, but says that you can have live work uh, anywhere in that neighbourhood yeah. plan area. So it, it's not, it, it's, that might have been the intention behind the policy, but if, it's not what it, if that's not what it says, then that, that's not what we can uh, rely on. Um, and just in terms of the uh, the landscaping and the visual impact, just to remind members that, you know, the fallback here is the applicant converting this building to an industrial in use, which was the application that was before members and approved in July 2020, change of use to, to uh, form two commercial units. So I think it would be hard to argue that there's going to be a greater impact on the ARMB from these live works than either the uh, employment, the agricultural unit that's there or the consented two commercial units. So it really does then come down to what's the visual harm on the ARMB? Now, our officer's view, view is that it's going to tidy up the site. It's a smaller building. It's going to have an improved visual impact. But if members feel that it should be refused on the basis of the, the impact on the character and the setting of the area, then I think I'd like more information on from, from what. What is, it, what is it about the building or the layout that's going to be harmful to that character or the setting of the AOMB given the existing building and the fallback? Thank you. Right, that's back to you, Councillor Brown and Councillor Desarum. Reasons for refusal, please, based on well, what Mr Rose has just said. The, 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 I've already said about the visual appearance of it. I mean, it's, it's, it's agricultural land at the moment and you're going to urbanise it by, by putting an industrial unit there with, with associated car parking. Um, you've got um, a gardens that will be de developed there. Um, everything that makes it industrial, everything that makes it commercial. But other than the um, gardens, you would have the um, industrial estate appearance and the car parking from the full back of the two commercial units. So yeah, but used two to commercial make... units, Chris. It's, it's two commercial units as against five commercial units. O on a building of twice the footprint, though. Bob, it's urbanising. I mean, you're, you're building in, in open countryside. You're building in the AOMB. But there's already a building yeah, there, and so to, was the change of use. So what is it about the new build that what is it about the new build that harms the AOMB? Mm. The garden, okay. I understand that there's there's some small gardens involved. That, surely that there's in its own gardens, isn't enough. There's parking. You've got, you're, you're left parking there. You're left people coming out on a road that is not suitable for it. You haven't got any feedback on the runoff from the water that's going to contaminate the river. Um, you know, you, you've got to see the area to appreciate it, what it's like. I mean, if members were to go there and have a site visit uh, and see what the area is like, they would agree with me that it shouldn't be built there. I mean, how many people on this committee have actually been to Dunkerswell? In fact, how many people know where Dunkerswell is? Don't repeat you know, me. They, yes, you know, I, 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 I see that. go there, they would see what, the, what it's like. The worst way is we need a site visit. Well, we've got a proposal to refuse, and that's been seconded. Councillor Pratt. Yes. Uh, going back to the Blackdown Hills AONB project uh, partnership, 
Um, <laughs> they do say um, in, in their statement on page 99 that uh, their original response still stands. And that is, uh, they are uh, resisting uh, approval of this application. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rose, do you want to comment on that? Um, I think the difficulty for the Air and B teams comment is that I do agree with them that it, we wouldn't usually be introducing business units into the Air and B. Similar discussion that we had about that shop blasting earlier. But the the difficulty we've got here is, I mean, look at the image on the screen in front of you already. It, it's hardly reminiscent of a, of, a, of, a, of a lovely site in the Air and B. We've got an agricultural building on the site and we've got this fallback of two industrial units. So yeah. I think I agree with the ARMB team's comments. If, they, if this was a new build going on in Dunkerswell in, in a field, then I, I, would, I would totally have sympathy with their comments. But I think there are other material cir circumstances here that, 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 that mean it's going to be hard on appeal to, to justify that what, what's proposed as part of this application is, is more harmful than, than either what you're seeing in front of you at the moment or the fallback of converting that to two industrial units. But, but, you know, I, 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 as for members to members to decide. Right. Over to you, Mrs. Shaw, to sum up, please. Yes. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm sorry. I haven't got a clear note of actually the reasons for refusal. No. But there has been mention of various things, urbanisation, which suddenly popped up, as well as... Um, we were trying to get to the bottom of the impact on the AOMB, um, car parking and gardens, but hey. that's... Uh, and I think that was, Shirley, I think that was related to policy LE1 uh, right. AVB, the character of the natural environment and setting would be harmed. So yeah. and, at and first... E E5, I said. So adverse impacts are the reasons for refusal. Yeah, policy yeah. five, economic development in rural areas. It doesn't comply with that. Thank you very much. Therefore, members, you have before you the motion to refuse. Please, would you indicate when your name is called, whether you're in support of the motion to refuse, whether you're against the motion to refuse, or you're abstaining from the vote? Councillor Brown. Your support. Councillor Chamberlain. Abstain. <sighs> Councillor Davy. Against refusal. Councillor Desaron. Support refusal. Councillor Gazard. Against. Councillor Lawrence. Support. Councillor Pook. Against. Councillor Pratt. Support. Councillor Skinner. Against. Councillor Woodward. Against. Councillor Rag. Against refusal. Thank you. So we have one abstention. We have one, two, three, four votes for refusal and one, two, three, four, five, three, six votes against refusal. So that has fallen. Right. Can I make the recommendation, please, Chair, to approve? You said, and Councillor Skinner. Good. That's it. That's, that's just it. That's it. I don't need to add any more. We've had the debate. I'm just making a recommendation to approve the officer's recommendation as written on the papers. Thank you. Yeah. Second of the vote, please. Thank Sounds you, Woodward. Word. Over to you, Shirley Shaw. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Now, I don't know whether members remember back when Chris was originally doing his um, presentation to you, but he did mention about amending Condition 5 to remove the reference for a submission of a landscaping scheme only as that has already been received. Does the mover and second, uh, uh, second that qualification to their recommendation to approve as on the papers? Absolutely. Yes. Thank you very much. Members, when your name is called again, please would you indicate whether you support the recommendation to approve, whether you're against the recommendation to approve, or whether you're abstaining from the vote. Thank you. Councillor Brown. Sorry, um, I, I don't agree with the recommendation. Against. Thank yeah. You. Councillor Chamberlain. Abstain. Councillor Davy. Support. Councillor Desaron. Against the recommendation to approve. 
Councillor Gazard. Support. Councillor Lawrence. Against. Councillor Pook. Support. Councillor Pratt. Against. Councillor Skinner. Support. Councillor Woodward. Support. Councillor Rag. Support approval. Thank you. That one has been approved. Thank you. Uh, right. Agenda uh, item 16, application 213211, full minor application, London Building, southeast of Courtney Springs, Hawk Church, Corsa Springs, Hawk Church, pages 142 to 152. I'd like to welcome Matthew Dalton Aram and Ward Member Councillor Hayward, please. Chris, can you present your report, please? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so as you say, we're, we're at Hawk Church here, and the site's on the screen in front of you, and it's conversion of a redundant building to residential use. This application's here because the applicant's related to a, a member of staff. Um, so you can see the location of the site here that will come clearer from the aerial photo. So there's the existing commercial building here and they want to convert this part to, to residential. So you can see we've got a barn, a store and a log store. Uh, and there's the elevations of those uh, part stone base and walls. Uh, and then we get the, the external store removed and this building converted two floors over this bit and then the, the single story uh, section at the rear and in elevation form you can see the stone retained and the cladding added and then the the, the roof put on the top uh, and these are the photos of the the site at the moment so this is the building uh, in question here and you can see how um the uh, this is a, an old image of the site when it was in, in operation uh, and images of the sites uh, over the years. And this is the most recent. So you can see that it's being cleared. The current applicant has purchased the site. And as part of that, they've started clearing all this, uh, this rubbish uh, from the site and from the former workshop. Uh, and there's open fields that, that surround. And we're just outside the settlement uh, of Hawkchurch. Um, so there were former business activities on site that became lawful through the passage of time. And I, I don't think there's, anyone's going to argue that they became a, an, an eyesore over time, uh, uh, as shown by, by those photos uh, with, the, uh, with, with the road running down, running down there. Um, and as I say, uh, there's volumes of scrap and waste have been removed since the site, from the site since this current applicant uh, purchased it. Um, and in terms of history, there was a former uh, cottage and garden on the site going way back, although that doesn't really have uh, any uh, bearing on the, on the current application. But back in the 1800s, I think there was, there was a, a cottage on this site originally. So in terms of the, uh, so this is the, the view from the, the main road looking into the site. And you can see through that, that how it's been tidied up and the views back across. And again, you can see the stone walls to the building and inside of the, the workshop to be converted and the view from, from the road. Um, so it's outside of Hawkchurch settlement, but we've got policy D8 of the local plan that does allow conversions of existing buildings to residential uh, where they are located near to um, uh, settlements with a range of services and facilities. That policy has got a number of criteria. Uh, it says the dwelling should not be out of character with the area. Uh, and it's feel that it's been a sensitive conversion that won't be out of character. The, the building should be structurally sound, which it is. The design should be in keeping, which we feel it is. There should be no highway safety concern. In fact, the highway safety situation will improve because of all those, those vehicles and that previous uh, use of the site ceasing. There should be no harm to agriculture, what there won't be. It should enhance the site, which I think this proposal clearly will from the work that the applicant's doing to cease that, uh, that previous uh, harmful business use. Um, and then there's the accessibility criteria. Um, and Hawk Church does have a, a store, a primary school, public house, uh, a hall, and a church, sorry, and we're about 800 metres from the edge of the settlement, 900 metres to the school, and it's considered that that's a reasonable walk, and it's close enough to those services and facilities to comply with policy D8 in terms of allowing the conversion of a, of a, uh, of a rural building to residential use. Plus, uh, alongside that, as stated in the report, we've got the benefits here from the applicant clearing up uh, this site. So it's considered for those reasons to comply with policy D8. 
There's no flood risk concerns. Uh, there's no wildlife concerns. A survey has been done of the building and the business on the site uh, ceased, ceased a while ago. So it's, it's not as if there's a loss of a business there. It's about the current people tidying up the site. So in conclusion, there's clear benefits here from tidying up the site. It complies with policy D8 in terms of the location of the conversion close to services and facilities. And it's considered to be a, a well-designed well -designed scheme that will enhance the appearance of the site. So for those reasons, the application is recommended for approval. Thank you. Um, Matthew Dalton, Aram, welcome to the meeting. Um, and you have three minutes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we are thankful for the Parish Council and officer support. The application is before members as the, the applicants are related to a member of council staff. Um, we would concur with the officer's assessment of the proposal's merits. The applicants have recently acquired the land, which has historically been used for a variety of business industrial uses by members of the same family, uh, both of which are sadly no longer with us. While a resumption of the historic use of the site would technically be possible, a business or industrial reuse is considered to be incompatible with the nature of the surrounding area and would give rise to adverse impacts on the surrounding highway network, as well as causing conflict with neighboring dwellings in terms of noise and disturbance. Consequently, ceasing the site's historic use, which the applicants do not intend to resume, would have clear benefits to the local community. In addition, the applicants want to tidy up the wider site and have already made considerable efforts to do so. This would have environmental benefits and will considerably enhance the appearance of the building and its setting. Further, the site has not been economic, economically active for several years and the reuse of the existing building and land for residential purposes would not harm business or employment opportunities in the local area. We would agree that the proposal would deliver a benefit in terms of increasing the supply of housing and through the creation of jobs and economic benefits during the construction phase. While we would respectfully disagree with the officer's view that the site is not isolated, we would agree that Hawkchurch benefits from a relatively good range of amenities for a small rural village. Opportunities to walk and cycle to the village also exist to reduce the reliance on the use of a car. We also agree that the development would help support services and facilities within the village, therefore promoting sustainable development in rural areas through locating housing where it will enhance and maintain the vitality of rural communities. A structural survey is submitted in support of the application, which demonstrates the building is capable of conversion. Uh, and while it, a new dormer window is proposed to provide additional accommodation at first floor, we would agree with the officer's view that this inclusion would be a, a relatively modest and unobtrusive addition to the building. In addition, the modest enlargement of the building would be compensated by the removal of a large ramshackle structure to improve the building's immediate setting. Finally, the access to the site would be safe and satisfactory for a single dwelling um, and is unlikely to harm the, the highway network, particularly when set against the traffic generation associated with the site's historic use. In addition, there is an adequate distance of separation between the proposed dwelling and nearby dwellings to ensure that no adverse immunity impacts would arise from the proposal. We would therefore respectfully request that members recommend the application be approved. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Haywood, is he in? Yes, thank you, Chair. Yeah, off thank you, you go sir. then. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I, I'm in a bit of a, a quandary here. I, I have on paper, I have no objections to this at all. It looks very, very, well-designed, well-thought-out structure. Um, and yes, it will tidy up the site. I know Hawk Church very well. Um, my reticence, and I suppose this is where I come back to the point that we actually just alluded to um, by the, um, the agent, is that it is isolated. You know, it, it, it's not in Hawk Church Centre, it's in Corche, which is, a, 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 you know, a, a conurbation of, of houses. But really, you're not going to find them unless you live there. It's... it's you know, it, it's it's off the beaten track and it's delightful. I mean, it's a gorgeous place. And I suppose my only reticence is comparing this to an application which came before you a while back for Heatherbell, which was refused um, on exactly, it's actually the, the diametrically opposed grounds. So that was uh, converting an old garage in a, in, a, in, a, in a garden. It was dilapidated and... All of the officer uh, recommendations were virtually identical, other than the fact it's not near a range of services. So 
this is uh, a walk along unlit country roads to get to the village centre. And the, the middle of Hortchurch is pretty much the same as the middle of All Saints. You know, it has a pub, has a, a school, has a church, has a village hall. Um, there's a bus service uh, along the way. Um, and the walk from this one, I've just done, used the mapping tool on my PC, is 1.1 kilometre to walk along those uh, unlit roads. And in the case of Heatherbell, which was refused and has now gone to appeal, it was 1.8 kilometres. So, you know, 0.7 of a kilometre, I mean, it's, it's nothing really. And I just would like to listen to the committee to hear your discussion about this, because the only difference, and again, I'd, I'd welcome, you know, Mr. Rose's interpretation, he's the expert on this, is that one was a little further away from civilization than the other. And both were seeking to do exactly the same thing. And, and I opposed the conversion of Heather Bell um, because I thought it was inappropriate and it was actually to create holiday accommodation. And on that, there's a slight difference. So there would have been lots of, I imagine, different people attending. Um, there could have been conceivably nuisance. Um, so that's why I opposed that. And, and, count, and the committee eventually came down on the side of refusal. It's gone to appeal. This would be a domestic dwelling for uh, individuals, but they too would have guests who would come and go. So whether it will result in less vehicle movements, I, I'm slightly skeptical about different vehicle movements, certainly. Um, but so I'm, I am torn chair and members because on one count we refused one and on this count we're accepting or ex considering acceptance and approval. The difference being that this is uh, an applicant related to a member of staff. And I know that this committee, when I sat on it, that would make no difference to your consideration, nor must it, because you do it on planning terms. But I, I just, at the moment, I can't, uh, I'd like to support, but because we've opposed the other, I, I would have to put my view forward that I think it's, it's a bit speculative, but again, I, I, I really look forward to hearing what the committee has to say. Thank you for your indulgence, Chair and members. Thank you, Councillor Hayward. Could I, first of all, go to um, Mr Rose for any clarification then, and then back to Mr Matthew dalton Aram, who has his hand up and might be able to shed some light on it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I suppose there's, there's, there's two differences uh, between this one and the, the other case that Councillor Hayward talked about. One, one is this one is closer to the, the those services and facilities. I think we've even put in the report, though, that we think this is at the, you know, the, the extreme distance of what we would allow. And given that the other case that Councillor Hayward talked to was was even further away from those services and facilities, that, that's the difference that we've drawn. We think this is at that, that outer edge of what's acceptable. And there is the element of tidying up the site. And I think a combination of those two are the difference between this scheme and the, and, and the other scheme that uh, the Councillor Hayward uh, spoke about. Thank you. Um, Mr D D Dalton Aram, is it in relation to what's just been said? Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dispute the, the points Chris has made. But the, the only, the only thing I would say is that, obviously, in in planning, each application must be dealt with in its own individual merits. So I, I don't really see the relevance of bringing a, an application in a different site for a different development. Um, so I, th you know, I think we should stick to to the matters at consideration, really. But I, I'll leave you. it there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Skinner. I think, um, Councillor, uh, sorry, Mr. Matthew Dalton, I actually hit on my point. I mean, the, the opening gambit from Councillor Hayward was that I don't have an objection to this application, but I am reticent. Uh, and then comparing that with another application, we're dealing with this application that's in front of us here now today. And this application in front of us um, is, as far as I'm concerned, is fairly clear cut, so far as I'm concerned. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't be bringing in uh, what, a previous application what got said or what didn't get said uh, along with this application and, and I don't actually think that's what Councillor Hayward meant really to be fair I think he was just in a quandary saying hang on you know there's one here I objected to and there's one here I can see why and, and just trying he's just trying to get a bit of clarity as to what's what as far as I'm concerned it's been written up very well it brings lots of benefits to what it is 
whatever kilometers from, from from the area i mean we we talk about making areas for people to go walking into the countryside and all the rest of it well you'd have to be a bit of, do a bit of that then if you wanted to walk to the shop is 1.1 kilometer that ain't very far for goodness sake and that would do your healthy walk into the shop and back if indeed that's what you want to do otherwise these remote areas are going to drive by the car of course they're going to put drive by the car let's wake up and smell the coffee you get into the rural areas you've got to drive a car if you don't drive a car there's no public transport there's no choices here so this is where we are so that's that's what that's what that's what it's about so i'm going with the recommendation the officer's recommendation of approval with the conditions that are put in front of us thank you very much i'll second is it it's tony woodward i'll second it now thank you would you like to speak on it tony I would. thank you very much chair yeah i mean this is an effect of sort of a brownfield site it was pretty ugly and um i think that the benefits from the increased housing stock would be very beneficial and it's going to support a local business that has referred to the parish council that a, a young family is going to take this on so um i'm very much in favor of this development thank you thank you councillor gazard now my points have been made thank you chair thank you councillor desarum uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. I was going to say that everything is on page 145 where it said is, is not regarded, I said, because it's part of a cluster of about nine dwellings of Corsier, um, and there is support for policy D8. And if you look at the first picture, you can see how ramshackle and, and horrible it looked. So I, I think this is a very positive um, attempt to tidy up this area, uh, and it gets my meets with my 100% approval. Thank you very much, Chair. Councillor Lawrence, anything to add? Um, just I used to live in Hawk Church, well live in Hawkchurch. I was about two kilometres out from the centre. Um, there's lots of buildings around there within that sort of distance. And I, I just think this is a fantastic opportunity to clean the place up and, and make it presentable for somebody to live in. Thank, Thank you, you. Over to you, Mr Shaw. Thank you, Chair. Yes, members, you have the recommendation to approve. When your name is called, please would you indicate whether you're in support of the recommendation to approve, whether you're against the recommendation to approve, or whether you're abstaining from the vote. Councillor Brown. Support. Councillor Chamberlain. Support. Councillor Davy. Support. Councillor De Sarum. Support, support approval. Councillor Gazard. Councillor Gazard. Sorry, oh, support. Come. Thank you. Councillor Lawrence. Support. Councillor Pook. Support. Councillor Pratt. Support. Councillor Skinner. Support. Councillor Woodward. Support. Councillor Rag. Support approval. That one is unanimous, uh, recommended for approval. Thank you. We go oh. to agenda item nine, application 22865, full minor application, land to the rear of 15 Townsend Road, Seaton, pages yeah. 53 to 67. Sorry. Yeah, I, have, I have to leave the meeting now anyway, and I'd have to leave, so it's perfect timing, so I'm now leaving the meeting, so. Okay. I can't persuade you. Thank you for your input. Thank you. Um, right. Welcome to Martin Lee, who is the agent. And over to Chris to present his report, please. Thank you, Chair. So, yeah, so there were a site called Land Rear of 15 Townsend Road in Seaton. So you can see the extent of the site here. There's one uh, probably dilapidated property on the on this large site. So the applications for the demolition of this dwelling and the construction of eight dwellings. Uh, and as you've heard from Councillor Pook, there's member interest in this, which is why the application is, is before you. And I'll start by saying this is well within the built-up area boundary. So the principle of redevelopment of this site is acceptable in principle. Um, there's a, as I say, large detached house uh, on here at the moment in a, in a poor condition. Uh, and as you can see, more dense character surrounding the site, although I point out that these are bungalows that, that surround the site, although there are two storey dwellings a bit further afield, mainly bungalows that surround the site uh, and a uh, um, health centre to the eastern boundary. And we've got an application for five, four beds and three, three bed houses with an access uh, similar to the access position uh, at the moment. Um, 
and then we move on. So this is the layout for the for the site. So you can see the eight dwellings and the access uh, off the road. And I'll come back to this. And then we've got the design for the uh, units. Uh, so that's that plot, plot one. Uh, and then we've got the second plot two, which is here. And then the next three are of the, the same design. So they, they've got rooms in the roof. Uh, and then we've got the other three. So these are the sections uh, through the site of the, the buildings as proposed. And yeah, and these are the design of the, the, the three buildings off Townsend. Uh, so these are the images. This is the building on the site at the moment. And so you can see it poor condition. There's one tree at the entrance that's mentioned that's uh, a TPO tree, as you can see, not in, a, not in a great condition. The rest of the site surrounded by hedgerows and, and overgrown. So this is the view looking back. This is the house on the site. This is the, one of the boundaries. Uh, and this is the other boundary uh, looking down town's end towards the, the health centre and the tree. This is a view looking back from the site for the neighbouring properties. So to, just to uh, bear in mind that these neighbouring properties here that I'll mention again in a minute are set below the level of the site. Uh, so they're yeah, looking back at the, the, the site boundary. Um, and this is from within the site looking to the west boundaries. So again, you can see the sort of dormer bungalows on the opposite side of the, the road overlooking the site. This is back to those properties on the southern boundary down to the health centre. Um, so as I say, it's the site's surrounded by bungalows and chalet bungalows. There's two storey nearby, but not adjoining. Uh, and the medical centre is you, uh, to the eastern boundary. Um, it's elevated above those properties on the southern boundary, though, from these, as I mentioned, if I go back to the layout. So these, the site is, is raised above these, uh, the gardens of these properties uh, here. Um, and it's considered that uh, a two-story development across the site will stand out and be contrary to the prevailing character of the area. And that, that, that's not just because they're two stories in an area that's by, by bungalows, but because of the very tight-knit nature of, of this scheme. We've got uh, barely five metres, I think six metres maybe, to the boundaries of these properties. Uh, the same with these large properties. And in some place here, only 1.8 metres to the, to, the, to the boundary. So very limited uh, garden areas. And from that point of view, uh, and from the fact that, I mean, all these gardens here would be overshadowed by the two-storey properties that they have minimal gardens. It's considered that a combination of this tight grain of this development and its two-storey nature compared with the fact that there's bungalow surrounding will make the scheme look out of uh, character with the, with the area. So from that point of view, uh, it, it's considered to be a, a, a less than good layout that, that's harmful to the character of the area, which, which weighs against the proposal. And then in terms of amenity, um, we're concerned about the impact from these three plots on the rear of these properties here. So they're raised above and although they've got rooms in the roof, they've got windows at first floor level that will look back down into these garden properties. So again, we feel that this close relationship here um, is unacceptable from those roof lights. Um, and as I say, bearing in mind the, the raised land level. So again, we consider that to be a poor amenity for those existing residents, uh, which weighs against the proposal. Uh, the, the TPO tree at the front is of a poor quality and the tree officer accepts its replacement. Uh, the report then goes on to talk about ecology uh, and there is mitigation proposed in relation to any impact on badgers, bats and birds, there's an ecology survey that's done, but the report goes into some detail about reptiles and slow worms. Uh, a translocation program has been put in place. So there's been, I think it's 55 slow worms found on this site that have been translocated elsewhere. But whilst that's okay, the, the requirement is not just to transfer them off site, but, but to protect the habitat that they go to. There's no point moving them off site and then them getting killed, you know, wherever they go to be built on. Um, so from that point of view, it's necessary that there's a conditional legal agreement uh, to ensure that where they're relocated to is, is protected in perpetuity to protect those slow worms. We don't have any mechanism in place to do that. We know the slow worms have, have been removed. We know they're remote from the site, but we don't have any ownership details and we don't have any protection in place to ensure that uh, there won't be any harm to them going forward. So that, and there's no monitoring of that either. So that, that, that's contrary to uh, policies and what we should be doing in terms of protecting ecology. So that also weighs against the proposal. And finally, in terms of drainage, um, 
the surface water was originally proposed to go to the public sewer, uh, which Southwest Water objected to. They've now shown this tank, you might be able to see this dotted line under the roadway, uh, which may be acceptable, but we've had no percolation tests and we've got no details of where that tank itself will drain to. Uh, so from that point of view, in, in, in light of those uh, lack of details of where the surface water drainage is going to go to, Southwest Water have raised concerns about the proposal because it should only go into their sewer as a last resort and we should be ensuring that before that uh, it's adequately dealt with. As I say, attenuation tank might be appropriate, but we, we haven't had those details, calculations. We don't know where that's going to flow for it too. So there's a lack of detail uh, on that as well, which weighs against the proposal. So whilst the scheme is acceptable uh, in principle and we'd welcome redevelopment of the site, uh, we feel that there's issues here with the, the density of development, the, the two-story nature, some of the small gardens, the overlooking and relationship to these properties. And then in addition to that, there's the concerns about the lack of uh, securing of the mitigation for the slow worms and the lack of information regarding drainage. So in light of that, and, in, and, and despite the fact we would like to support a scheme or the right scheme on this site, uh, this application is recommended for refusal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Martin Lee, is Martin Lee here? So look. Yes, he is. Uh, welcome to the meeting, Mr. Lee. You have three minutes. Thank, Thank you, you, Chairman. Uh, members should be aware of the following timeline for this application. Uh, Pre-application inquiry was submitted on the 23rd of July 2020 and responded to by officer letter dated the 2nd of October 2020, confirming residential development on the site would be agreeable. This current planning application was then submitted on the 20th of December 2020, some 15 months ago. Despite consistent chasing by email and telephone with the case officer and senior manager's meaningful contact in the form of a video call was not secured until the 3rd of August 2021, some eight months after submission. Uh, following this discussion, amended drawings were submitted on the 19th of September 2021, addressing the officer's concerns in relation to layout and neighbouring amenity. Floor levels associated with plots two, three, four, and five were all lowered, and plots three, four, and five were reduced from two story to one and a half story and from four beds to three beds. These revisions addressed concerns over amenity and density. We'd like to reiterate that density of the proposal is closely comparable to both Thornfield Cottage, approved in 2017, development of eight dwellings, and Barnard Hill Lane, approved in 2017. Um, both applications give rise to plots of a very similar density mass scale as the new Townsend site. The revised drawings detailed only floor plans and site plans, as it was anticipated this would initiate further dialogue with the case officer, working together to seek an agreeable proposal following which full elevation would have been compiled. It was then confirmed by the case officer that the application would be determined based on submitting drawings and that only one amendment to any application was permitted. Suggest that this represents a failure of the part of the EGC planning team to engage constructively on the application and adhere to the guidance contained in the NPPF, which directs authorities to actively seek to enable sustainable development using the full range of tools at the authority's disposal. The officer's report also highlights uh, Southwest Waters' comments and ecology concerns as two further reasons for refusal. But we can confirm that the amended site layout drawing was submitted to Southwest Water on the 17th of January 2022, and they've revised their response and confirmed to officers on the 25th of January that they now accept the amended details address their requirements. So the officer report is therefore incorrect in its assertion that Southwest Water object to current proposals. On the subject of ecology, due to the length of time it's taken to consider and determine the application, the applicant has been compelled to secure the safe relocation of slow worms from within the site to a newly provided suitable habitat. This translocation has been completed by a licensed ecologist, JG Ecological, in September and October 2021, following surveys undertaken on site in May and June 21, in accordance with the original preliminary ecological report prepared in February 21. The officer's report cites the lack of a legal obligation to secure the translocation site for slow worms is maintained in perpetuity as a reason for refusal. The applicant has confirmed they're happy to enter a simple legal obligation to safeguard the compensatory habitat provided, and yet officers have failed since submission of the ecologist's translocation completion report to provide the applicant with the obligation they wish completed. The refusal reason advanced on this issue is therefore unreasonable. These errors further illustrate the woefully poor 
level of engagement the application has received. In comparison, we draw members' attention. In we draw members' attention to planning application 210891 FUL, the hook and parrot. This application was reported to the committee on 19th of January within 40 weeks of validation and has been subject to two separate officer negotiated amendments. It's clear the current application at Townsend has not been given a similar level of officer engagement despite proposing eight residential dwelling houses with all the attendant benefits the local community and construction industry. A total of 50 weeks have passed since validation on the 1st of March 2021. The applicants are concerned that lack of apparent consistency of service and engagement for an application which should easily have been determined within eight weeks of validation and as such we ask members to consider granting permission for the amended scheme. Chair, thank you. Thank you Mr <laughs> Lee <clears throat> and um, I think I should speak and say that the planning department has been under considerable pressure uh, due to uh, staffing resources. Uh, and that of course has been exacerbated um, by the pandemic. Um, it's been difficult for, for everybody to get used to a new way of working, um, including members here. But I'd like to invite um, Mr. Rose to respond to any of the points made, please. Thank you, Chair. I don't. Uh, I suppose there's only two things I would say. I, I don't. I can't disagree with the dates that Mr. Lee's put forward. What the two things I would say is one: the pre-out from 2020. Mr. Lee fails to mention the fact that we raised concerns about the layout, which is almost identical to the one that's submitted here. So we did do pre-out. We raised concerns about the layout that wasn't addressed or taken on board. And our, our working practices are: if you don't take on board the comments at the pre-app stage, then we won't necessarily engage with you any further because we, we've done that through the pre-app. So it was disappointing that those comments about the layout at the pre-app stage weren't taken on board. The only other thing I would say is Mr. Lee's been aware of a draft of this report since uh, early January in terms of the issues in relation to Southwest Water and Ecology, and no further information has been submitted. So we're determining the application on the basis of what we have in front of us, which is an insufficient information in terms of the drainage and the ecology. I don't doubt those issues can be addressed, and I hope that Mr. Lee will address those if the application is refused for a resubmitted scheme. But at the moment, we just don't have enough information to be able to condition those. And uh, sorry, there was a third point. I, I note that Mr. Lee hasn't really said anything in relation to the, the scheme being out of character or the small gardens no. or overlooking of the neighbours, which, which is the other reason for refusal. So I, 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 it has taken longer than normal for the reasons that you've stated, Chair, um, but we, we haven't got there. And I hope that this report will enable Mr. Lee and the applicant to, to go away and resubmit a scheme that we, that we can support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Skinner. Uh, and really, uh, lots of it's already been said, and I don't know that there's much need for a big, long, protracted uh, debate no. about this one. I mean, I, I'm actually, I, I think it's a great opportunity to do something there. really is a great opportunity, um, knocking the house down and putting in something. But it needs to really work with the area in which they sit. But we don't want, we don't want applications coming in and being out of sync with the character. We had a discussion about this in Sidmouth area, uh, earlier about, the, about yeah. the impact of that. So, you know, we've been over this ground quite some time so i'm actually going to go through you chair if you don't mind i'm going to go with a recommendation that the officers have put forward over refusal and and uh, sort of leave it at that really if others want to carry on well i think most of it's been said and mr rose is absolutely bang on to the money for me thank, thank you councillor david you have your hand up did you want to second that uh yes i will do thank you thank you um Yes, I mean, my problem is with the density there. If you look at the picture we've got on the screen at the moment, you can see the curtilages of the, the surrounding buildings, um, which we're told are, are largely bungalows as well. And you can see that those have fairly generous gardens. This is totally out of keeping. Um, and I think we all discovered over lockdown how important gardens are to people. Um, and I think the, the amount of space provided around those houses is absolutely minimal. Now, to some people, that might be a dream, but I think most people like a little bit more elbow room. So uh, I'm totally for redevelopment of this site. Well, I just think they need to come back um, with uh, something that won't try and cram in so many houses um, and uh, we'll be more in keeping with the local area. Thank you. Councillor Gazard. Yes, I was going to second chair. My point's been made. Thank you. Thank you. No more hands up. Over to you, Mrs Shaw, to sum up. 
Thank you, Chair. Yes, members, you have the motion to recommend approval with the conditions as set out. Oh, I beg your pardon. Oh. A motion to recommend refusal oh, for you. the reasons <laughs> as set out in the report. <laughs> in a long day, surely. It has, it has. Um, when your name is called, please, members, would you indicate whether you're in support of the recommendation to refuse, whether you're against the recommendation to refuse, or whether you're abstaining from the vote? Councillor Brown. Support. Thank you. Councillor Chamberlain. Support recommendation to refuse. Councillor Davy. Support refusal. Councillor De Serum. Support refusal. Councillor Gazard. Support refusal. Councillor Lawrence. Support refusal. Councillor Pratt. Support refusal. Councillor Skinner. Support refusal. Councillor Woodward. Support refusal. Councillor Rag. Support refusal. That was unanimous, so that application is recommended for refusal. Thank you. And now we move on. Item 13, application 21, 28884 is minor application for Higher Moorlands Farm, Luppet, pages 112 to 122. And what would like to welcome Eve Vergano um, and the committee member, um, board member, Councillor Brown will speak as well. So over to you, Mr. Rose. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so Luppet in, is the uh, location for this application, High Moorlands Farm. It's an application to replace two agricultural buildings and to change the use of land to extend the garden. So you can see the access down to the, the uh, property here. So there's buildings run along here at the moment. So the idea is to replace two of these buildings and then to extend the garden of the house into this area shown uh, within green. And it's here because there's a ward member objection uh, and we are in the Blackdown Hills AOMB. So this is the, the scheme of the site. So we have granted an extension to this house that's, which uh, negated the removal of these uh, two uh, agricultural buildings. So this application seeks to uh, rebuild a building over here and to put a new uh, agricultural building uh, here. You can see just off the footprint of where there was a, a building before and then to relocate the garden hedge down here to give them a larger uh, garden to the, to the property. Um, and then these are the elevations of the, the, the two sort of sheds, uh, buildings that are proposed. Um, nothing grand in scale, sort of eight metres by three metres high. Uh, and again, this one's 10 metres by 12 metres. Um, and here's the aerial of the site. So you can see the site here in the context of the other farm buildings surrounding and the fact that it's set way back from the, from the road. So this is, this is the house where the extension has been proposed. So part of these buildings would be demolished. The, the garden would get extended into this foreground here in this picture. And then we get a new agricultural building uh, shed built on, on the side there. And this is the view from the other side. So there's the house. This is the buildings that would go. The garden would be extended and then the new store put back uh, in this part of the photo. And then we've got this new store being built here for the, for the business. And again, this is looking back the other way. So the house is off to the left. This building would go, extension built. Uh, and then we've got the new one down the end. And then there's just some photos here to show that it's very hard to view the site from any, 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 public, uh, any public domain. So as I say, it's in the countryside, in the AOMB, and it's a farm complex, uh, dwellings and outbuildings with a private access. There's similar footprints that they're proposing uh, through this scheme. Uh, so instead of the buildings being here, they're moved down here. Um, and there's support for ongoing farm diversity. We've got policies in the, in the local plan that support that and support new agricultural buildings where there's, where there's a need for them. Uh, and as I say, there's been consent granted here to remove these barns to, to allow an extension to the house. Uh, and the new, the new buildings to be replaced uh, will have solar panels on them to help with their sustainability. Um, the, when we granted the extension to the house here, it didn't extend the garden. So there's certainly some logic into allowing it an extended garden for the property there. So in terms of the principal policy D7 supports new agricultural buildings. Uh, it's considered that these are of a suitable design. They're right next to the existing buildings in the complex. 
there's no policy support for garden extensions in the countryside, but they are generally accepted now that, you know, you can have uh, an extension to an existing garden as long as it isn't taking up too much space or it doesn't have any wider visual impacts, which, which this doesn't. Um, the parish council and the ward member are concerned that the, the buildings are, are, um, are too far from the house or too large, but I don't think, you know, we're not going to end up with any greater floor space of agricultural buildings than were, were previously on the site. As I say, it's sited next to these existing buildings. The applicant has all, all also said that by removing these buildings in the middle, it opens up the light into these uh, uh, retained buildings. I think the new buildings relate well to the, the setting and the surrounding properties. And as I say, there's no, there's no wider impact, visual impact. So there's no harm to the AOMB uh, and the loss of land to the garden is, is, is minimal. Um, it's not gonna be harmful to their, their farming practices given that it's a 30 something, uh, I can't remember what it is exactly, but 30 acre farm, something like that. Um, so there's support from policy D7 uh, the replacement buildings will support the farm. They're next to existing buildings. They have a suitable design. There's no harmful visual impact. It's not considered that the extended garden area is unreasonable. Uh, so in light of that, the application is recommended for approval. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Um, Eva Garno, the applicant, one of the applicants, um, welcome to the meeting. Um, you have three minutes to present your case. Hi, uh, can you hear me? We can. Okay, brilliant. Hi. Um, my son's just woken up, so hopefully he's going to uh, stay quiet. Um, so, hi, my name is Eve, and my partner Ollie and I own the farm. Uh, we bought it four years ago. It's a 30-acre farm with huge potential. We have 20 acres of permanent pasture, a small farmhouse, farm buildings, and a woodland. There are plenty of rare plant species, birds, and wildlife here. When we first arrived, not much had changed from when they built the farmhouse and outbuildings in the mid 50s. The barns were built quickly and cheaply with poor block work and asbestos roofing sheets. Over time, we've been imp improving and modernizing the farm and developing our vision for the future of our business here. And the latest application is part of this plan. We've been rebuilding things in a more functional and attractive way. Uh, we use local wood for construction and have solar panels in our designs. So sustainability is a key consideration. We currently raise cattle, sheep, pigs and chickens for meat, which we sell locally to customers. Um, we also plan to run a market garden supplying boxes in the future. We had a baby last year and already have permission to expand the house. Um, at that time, we should have requested to extend the garden as well. With the help of the mid-tier stewardship grant, uh, we've put in considerable efforts to improve, maintain, and plant new hedges and plan to plant plenty more trees in the future. Farming and developing the farm in a way that is sympathetic to the AOMB and increasing biodiversity and habitat for wildlife is a priority to us. We feel that our planning applications are wholly reasonable and necessary for the business. Although we have moved barns away from their original footprints, we've kept the same square meters of building footprint. Um, the emphasis being on improvement rather than expansion. Um, the enlargement of the garden is proportional to the size of the house and will mean that we have a safe enclosed space for the children to play. The land isn't suitable to agricultural use anyway, as it would be directly next to the farmhouse um, and access isn't straightforward. Um, there's also a boundary hedge already in place that separates this land from the fields adjacent to the proposed garden site. Um, just to finish, we see the countryside as a living, working landscape. Uh, this is what it's been for hundreds of years. And if we're to protect and preserve this heritage and the AOMB, we need to see thriving small farms. Thank you for giving me the time to speak and please support our application. Thank you very much. Um, Ward member, Councillor Brown. Um, and thank you, Chair. Um, I personally have got no problem with this application. Um, I'm here representing David, uh, Councillor David Q, who can't be here today because he's um, having an operation on his eye, and the Parish Council. Um, the Parish Council are supportive of the family and in principle have no major objections to the changes being applied for. 
And in the future, I hope that the family will be able to employ one or two people. The concerns are the distance from the new, from the new buildings are from the house and the loss of agricultural land to a domestic garden, especially as the young family living and working there have enthusiastic plans for a livestock market garden enterprise. And there would be need for agricultural land, which is class grade three, the best and most versatile agricultural land. If the units were to be moved closer to the house and there was less domestic garden, their concerns would be removed. Um, but I'll leave it up to the committee to make it their opinions known. Thank you. Thank you. I'll go to Councillor Woodward next. That's very kind of you. I hope um, Councillor Skinner was up before me. Um, I'm happy. Yeah, Councillor Skinner goes first quite a lot, so I'm trying to share it out. <laughs> okay, well, I'll try not to take up too much time. And <laughs> That's so, right. Um, hopefully, we'll be on the same page. But um, uh, I support the uh, officer's approval. Um, I think we should be helping a, a young family with their business for diversification um, within the countryside with the market gardening. Um, I would hope over time that might um, overtake the livestock from a personal point of view. But um, I think also the extension of the garden, it's, it's going to be garden that can usually be uh, re-established for food if there was a wartime emergency. Um, so um, I propose a put forward a, um, approval of the um, officer's recommendation. Right, thank you. Councillor Skinner, you were next to speak. Did you want to support the proposal? Absolutely. I have one question for the young lady. So Eva, was it? Was it Eva? Uh, yes. Uh, Eva, on your, on your plan uh, that we've got in front of us on the scheme here, you've got A, B, C, D, E, F, O, P. What is O? Um, o is, it's currently it's being used as the duck house. It's just a kind of a... What's a chet very, shed? A what, sorry? Chet. A chet shed. Where did chet. you say that? C-H-I-C-K-E-D. A chicken shed. Oh, there we go. That's all right. That's all right. Right. That's all that sorted. Then I know yeah, what that is then. I thought that was something new. There, basically. <laughs> There you go. OK, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to add any more. I think it's great. I'm right. I'm supportive. I think it's great. Young family and investing and trying to do the best. And uh, yeah, let's crack on. And I'm, I'm in full support. Thank you. Councillor Lawrence. Yeah, I was just going to echo those sentiments. I think this is 100 percent supportable. Um, I think it's fantastic what they're trying to do. Um, and lots more people should be encouraged to do the same. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um... No more hands up. Over to you, Mrs. Shaw. Sorry, sorry, trying to get the mute off. Yes, members, you have a motion to recommend approval subject to the conditions as listed in the report. When your name is called, please would you indicate whether you're in support of the recommendation to approve, whether you're against the recommendation to approve, or whether you're abstaining from the vote? Councillor Brown. No, I'll abstain. Thank you. Councillor Chamberlain. Support approval. Councillor Davy. Very happy to support approval. Councillor DeSaron. Support approval. Councillor Gazard. Support. Councillor Lawrence. Support approval. Councillor Pratt. Support approval. Councillor Skinner. Support approval. Councillor Woodward. Support approval. Councillor Rag. Support approval. <coughs> thank you. That application is recommended for approval. And um, thank you, um, Eve Vergano, for coming along and every success to you and your family for the future. I'm sure that on behalf of the committee. Thank you. Um, right. Now then, where am I? Here we are. Um, agenda item 14, application 21, 1972, full minor application, land east of the old rectory, Rock Pier. This is an unusual one. Pages 123 to 133. I'd like to welcome John Hames, the applicant. Um, and over to you, Chris, to, uh, to present your report, please. 
Thank you, Chair. So as you say, land east of the old rectory, rock beer. We've got an application here for a change of use from the of from agriculture from this field to a dog walking area, uh, plus a small uh, timber uh, shed or cover uh, and a hard standing area. And it's here because there's a, an objection from the ward member. So you can see the location on the site here. Uh, it's the same area for it's an area for uh, dog walking or training so maybe those dogs with behavioral or social issues that won't you know mix on the beach or be able to go to other areas so there'd be this field here where people would be able to rent the area take their dogs train them uh, and, and get them to be able to use that space there's an existing access that would be used you can see there is a, a neighbor set in from this planted uh, boundary here the access to the site would be code uh, coded for access uh, and the shelter is just uh, uh, three meters by three meters in size to provide some cover and a store. Uh, so there you can see its relationship to to rock beer, not that far from rock beer. And there's the there's the cover. Uh, and there would be this uh, mesh fencing put around the site inside of the existing hedging to, to stop the dogs um, from escaping. And, and this is the, the field in question and the access. So in terms of the principal development policy, RC4 of the local plan supports recreational facilities in the countryside. Uh, this is one of those facilities we feel that could fall under that uh, uh, policy. And there's no known similar facilities in the area, although we're seeing more and more of these, these type of facilities, particularly following the uh, amount of people that, that have got dogs now following lockdown. So a countryside location is considered to be appropriate uh, and, and this one just being outside of rock beer is also considered to be a suitable location. There'll be minimal visual impact. You won't be able to perceive the fencing up against the uh, existing hedging as it's not solid and the shelter is small within the site uh, and won't look out of character. And as I say, the existing access would be would be retained. There is a, this property to uh, that boundary there, but you can see the, the screen in between the site uh, and the boundary. Uh, and it's about 30 meters from the site, but there's still potential there for, for noise nuisance. Um, but the intensity of the use is proposed to be low. So the applicant's only proposing to let it to one, uh, one person at a time. So it won't be that you can get groups of people or dogs there. Uh, as I say, the screening to the boundary, environmental health have approved a management plan that details how they will deal with complaints, <laughs> which is sort of on a, you know, if they start getting complaints about the same people, then they'll have a register and they won't be allowed to, to come back to the site. There'll be hours will be restricted from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., along with a restriction on the number of dogs that would be allowed at any one time. So it's considered that with those uh, restrictions in place, it will protect the immunity of, of the nearby residents in the wider area. Um, the access is, is suitable, there's space to park outside the site to pull in to open the gate. Um, so in conclusion, there's support for policy RC4, there'll be minimal visual impact. I think the amenity impact can be controlled by conditions. The land could be put into agricultural use in the future uh, if it needed to be, and there's no highway objection. So in light of that, the application is recommended for approval. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, John Hames, welcome to the meeting. You have three minutes. Thank you, Chair. Can you can you hear me? We can. Yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, members. My name is Johnny Hames. I'm an applicant, and of course, I'm speaking in support of this application. I'm a tenant farmer who's diversified by converting one of my fields into a dog walking field in August 2020. It is a securely fenced field that people are able to book for their own private use. Uh, there's been high demand for the field from the start, and it is used by a number of different people. People whose dogs have bad recall, people with reactive dogs, people whose bitches are on heat, and sometimes people who have concerns that their dogs will worry livestock. The high demand for this field brought me to look for other fields elsewhere and to the field at Rock Beer. I am aware that there have been some local objections to the application, which we have looked at closely. Uh, to briefly touch on these, in terms of noise, um, so our existing field has a care home on its boundary. The care home provides support for people with autism and learning disabilities, some of whom are sensitive to noise. The home has confirmed that they have had no issues with noise over the last 18 months or at any point since the field has opened. Uh, nevertheless, I've agreed this noise management plan um, with consultation with the environmental health uh, in case any noise issues do arise. Um, and, and environmental health have, have no objection to this application. 
there, there were some concerns over traffic. Um, so we changed our plans so that cars could come off the road during a changeover period. This, together with low number of trip generations, means that the highways agency have no objection to the application. Lastly, some people worry that there may be um, dog feces left in the field. Uh, and I want to stress that although the field is unmanned, it is certainly not unpoliced. We, we, went to, uh, we tend to have regular customers who value and respect the field, so are careful to pick up their dog's mess. I do, however, undertake regular checks to ensure the field is clean. Finally, I would just like to thank the planning officer for her time on this application and her recommendation of approval. And I hope that this view is supported by the committee as the field will provide an important resource for so many people. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mr. Haynes. Uh, right, ward member, Councillor Lawrence. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, normally I'm not averse to having a change of agricultural land to, to, to another business, but I just, um, th this business is a remotely operated business. Um, the applicant, um, I believe his other site so is down near Plymouth somewhere. Um, the, although there's a booking system online, um, there's no reason why somebody can't book the space and then half a dozen people turn up because there's, there's no policing on control over the numbers of people and dogs who can use it at any one time or indeed the hours of use. He specifies as hours of use, but there's nothing to stop people going there. Once they've got the, the pass to get in for that day or the next day, um, there's nothing to, to stop half a dozen of them turning up. Um, I don't really agree with this idea that people will always pick up after their dog. Um, there's no bin on site. And even if there was one, the applicant would have to arrange to empty it and dispose of the contents himself because East End District Council doesn't have the manpower to extend their collection service to this location. Without this facility, it is likely that a lot of customers will not bother to pick up after their dogs and after a while it could present a health hazard. Environmental health officers have twice objected to this application on the grounds that there would be there were a number of noise sensitive dwellings in close proximity. And this would lead to unacceptable levels of noise pollution. This is their, their words, not mine, to local residents. And they actually went on to say that they considered that this was not the right location for this development. The applicant has then, as he said, has submitted a noise management plan. But I just wonder whether a noise management plan that's been submitted will actually carry any weight because it says that um, any noise complaint should be made by email um, and should include the date and time of the noise occurring from where the noise was heard and the nature of the noise barking or other multiple or single dog well then once you've once you've sorted all that out you then the, the person within the field at that time will be registered as a not on a noise complaint log and if they have um I think it's three different ones within three months. They'll be contacted to discuss ways to mitigate the noise. Well, you can't stop a dog barking. I mean, it's, it's just, well, um, anyway, um, it goes on. Um, um, the procedure will be, will be included in their terms and conditions, but because there's no actual policing on site of, of people who are going, I just wonder how much they, they can actually do to, to, to stop the, the, the thing being misused. Um, Policy E4 permits diversification where it can be shown that it's complementary to or compatible with agricultural operations, which I think stretches the point somewhat because I, I can't see that this is actually compatible with agricultural operations. Um, there are a number of objections from local residents regarding this application. There is no benefit for the village, no employment proposed, and there are ample alternative sites for dog walking nearby, particularly the parish field in the centre of the village, and nearby on the outskirts of Cranbrook with the Cranbrook Country Park. Um, according to the applicant's website, um, each visitor can book the site for up to eight dogs. So how are you supposed to determine which dog it is barking and which isn't? And the other thing is the Devon County Highway Authority have, have based their recommendation that a maximum of one vehicle per hour in each direction. But there, again, there's no way of policing this. There's no way to say that you can't phone up a few of your friends and say, look, I've got this field for the afternoon, um, all come along and, and join in. Um, I, I just think it, 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 it's, it's a good idea, 
And I think outside Plymouth and, and on the outskirts of Exeter and, and other major cities, I, I think it's, it's a fantastic idea, mm. but not right out in the middle of the countryside at Rockbeer. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. I'd like to go back to Mr. Rose. Mr. Rose, uh, Mr. Haymes said that there have been no uh, complaints about noise, um, particularly from the care home. Also, although the environmental health officer had objected, um, his or the last comment is thanks for sending through your noise management plan. I've reviewed the plan and I am happy with the content. So we assume from that that um, the environmental health officer is not objecting any longer. Could you add anything to that, please? Yeah, thank you. I think I think the applicant was. I assume he was talking about his other field that hadn't received uh, any complaints ah, since it was operational. Okay. Um, and yeah, and in terms of uh, environmental health, they 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 uh, objected to the application originally, and then once we had had further discussions with the applicant about the the hours and the number of dogs which you can see is controlled under condition three, and mm. then the noise management plan uh, that was sent to environmental health, and they've accepted the environment uh, the the health. Uh, the uh, noise management plan and are now content with the proposal. Um, I, I, I take Councillor Lawrence's, yeah. I understand Councillor Lawrence's concerns, but you know, I, I think this isn't a dog walking field where people can walk for free. I think it, it, it will be targeted at those people that have got dogs that might have, well, as you said, behavioural issues, uh, dogs that might be in season or what other reason that they might want to uh, want to rent it. And uh, yeah, I mean, should should there be complaints, then that that noise management plan is in place, and we've got those conditions that we would put on the application to to enforce and stop. Uh, you know, if there were an excessive numbers or it went outside of those hours. So I, I understand uh, his concerns, but I think um, those conditions will be adequate to to control the use. Yeah, thank you for that clarification, Councillor Woodward. Thank you, Chair. I have to say I have some experience of uh, this type of facility. There is. Um, the Exmouth dog field at Lower Holsden Farm, which is in my ward, which is, a, as it says, a dog field. And it has a very similar setup. Uh, you book a slot online uh, and then you uh, pay your money online and you get a time slot and you can take your dog and you have um, a code to get into the field. Um, so it, we ought to reiterate that it's not for necessarily for ordinary dog walking. It's for dogs that may have issues being around other dogs, but also it saves those people in Rockbeer that might be inclined to go walking in the fields where there's no pavements uh, and the fields may have livestock. So it's, it's a safe place for everybody around to have dogs there and not walking, uh, worrying livestock, if that's, um, and you can let them off the lead, which uh, would be advantageous. Mm. So it's recreation in the countryside. I think that needs to be promoted. It's diversification. It's a field. It will remain a field. So you're not losing agricultural land. You can easily put it back to a field for producing food. Um, with the Exmouth uh, dog field, the times there are 7 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. So in this case, uh, this will be a more restricted time. So all in all, I think it's a very good idea. I think it'll be really helpful to local residents. It was said there'll be no benefit, but there will be if you have a dog and you want to have a safe place to take that dog. So um, I um, propose uh, approval of the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Is there a seconder, please? Yes, Councillor Gazzard. Thank you. Would you like to speak? No, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Then we go to Councillor Desarum. Anything to add? Yeah, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'm, I share Councillor Lawrence's concerns for several reasons. Uh, firstly, he, we have a, a lack of the bins. Secondly, there's going to be no supervision of the site. Uh, thirdly, it is possibly not policy E4 compliant. Um, fourthly, it's better in an urban setting. Um, examples was given of Cranbrook, Plymouth, and in our own Exmouth, the dog field in Halston. Um, fifthly, was that you can have up to eight dogs. And sixthly, there is the number of vehicles per hour. So I'm not against it in principle, but those objections that I've just listed, I don't think the report has overcome them. Um, and so for that reason, I would not be able to give it my support at this time, um, simply because there is a lot of issues which it hasn't ironed out. Um, and I'd like to see uh, it properly sorted out so that these issues will be dealt with. Th thank you so much, Chair. Thank you. Um, I don't know if Mr. Rose would like to respond to the bit about the um, picking up after the dogs or the bins. 
I think, well, I, I suppose I'd say the, I think the applicant uh, covered that in his, uh, in yeah. his statement in terms of, you know, if you are a um, responsible dog owner and the yeah. sort of person that would spend money to rent this field, I think you're the sort of person that does, that, that would pick up after your dog. Um, so I, I don't have any concerns of uh, concerns about that. Um, we have got a condition in terms of the hours and the number. And I suppose the only thing I would say is, is it's very difficult to find these sort of things in an urban in an urban environment where you yeah. you know where you can find fields that aren't wanted development or are suitable. And the owner would have ultimate control oh. over who he allowed in the field if if a, if a dog wasn't being picked up after. Uh, the owner would soon know, the field owner, Mr. Hames. So, um, Councillor Skinner. Thank you. And uh, I wonder if I could ask uh, Mr. Rose, is this, this isn't any change in any land designation then, is that correct? No. Well, well, it'll be a change of use to a dog walking area. So, in effect, it comes out of agriculture. Because that, that's basically what they're applying for, to use it for dog walking. Um, but, you know, there's one small building and a, and a small area to park a car. So from that point of view, it could easily revert back to agriculture yeah. at any time. Mm. But does it, does the, the question, I think, really, I just wanted to know, what designation does it fall under? What's the planning for? What does it fall under? If it moves out of agriculture, it moves I, into... What? I think it'll be a, a sewer use. I think it's a class on its uh, own. It doesn't yes. fall into a class. Yeah. Sewer general use. Yes. Sorry. I, 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 yes, that, that's it. Absolutely. Yeah. You've answered it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Davy. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just a bit concerned about this uh, the dog mess issue. Um, I understand that people are going to pick it up. They're going to put it in a bag. Um, my concern is what happens to it after that. There's no provision to do anything to it on, uh, on site. So they're faced with taking it in their car. And I just wonder if there'll be a temptation to chuck it in the nearest hedgerow rather than bother to take it home with you in your car. I'm not a dog owner, so I can't comment on uh, the responsibility of dog owners when it comes to doing that, but I certainly see enough plastic bags lying around in the countryside to know that not everybody takes theirs back. Um, and it, 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 there's no way of policing that either. It's a very interesting proposal. I must say I've learned a lot today, um, but uh, I've do have some concerns about what's going to happen uh, to the dog mess. Well, I think those concerns could relate to anywhere, Councillor Davey, wherever you take a dog. You have to rely on the, the responsibility of the dog owner to clear up and um, take it to a place where it's supposed to go. Councillor Woodward. Well, just, just thank you for that, Chair. Just to carry on uh, the second point about where you take it, uh, EDDC bins, um, litter bins take dog poo so yeah. you don't have to find a red bin you can find uh, one of our black bins as yeah. long as it's not for recycling yeah quite thank you right over to mr shaw to sum up please yes thank you chair members you have a recommendation to approve with the conditions as set out in the report when your name is called, please, would you indicate whether you support the recommendation to approve, whether you're against the recommendation to approve, or whether you're abstaining from the vote? Thank you. Councillor Brown. Uh, against. Councillor Chamberlain. Support the recommendation to approve. Councillor Davy. I'm going to abstain on this one. Councillor De Serum. Against the recommendation to approve. Councillor Gazard. Support. Councillor Lawrence. Against. Councillor Pratt. Councillor Pratt. Support, sorry. Thank you. Councillor Skinner. Support. Councillor Woodward. Support. Councillor Rag. Support approval. Thank you. So we have one abstention, one, two, three against approval, and one, two, three, four, five, six in support of approval. So that's recommended for approval. Thank you. And um, thank you to Mr. Haynes for coming along. Uh, item 17, application 21, 24474. It's a minor one. This is where I've just realized. I've got to come out of the chair for this one. So I'll hand it over to the vice chair because this is in the town ward, which I represent. Thanks. 
Thank you very much, Chair. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so next we move on to agenda item 17, application number 21 forward slash 2447 full. Minor application is the fifth Exmouth Sea Scouts hut in Exmouth, which can be found on pages 153 to 169. I'd like to welcome to the meeting Paul Humphreys. Are you in the meeting? Yes, hi Wendy. Oh, that's lovely. But first of all, I'm going to pass over to Ed, I believe, to present his report. Oh, if, if only it was Ed. Oh, uh, it's, it's, it's Eddie. Yeah, I <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought I was going to get a break then. If <laughs> what he says. <laughs> we'll pass so, it to Chris then. Thank uh, you. As you say, it's Ex Exmouth Sea Scouts in Exmouth. So this is the location of the site. I expect mo most people will be aware of, uh, of where it is, particularly the Exmouth members. And it's an application for demolition of the, the club and boathouse and construction of a new club and boathouse. And it's before you because it's on land uh, owned by uh, the district council. Um, so this is the access route in. This is the, the site at the moment, two buildings on there and notes and trees that I'll refer to in a minute. And we're, we're right off of the off of the water here. Uh, and this is the proposal. So to have uh, one new large building put on this part of the site, but also, as you can see from these dots here, to put new tree planting surrounding the site, uh, again, on land in, in our ownership. This is the layout. So we've got a uh, hall and boat store and training rooms, uh, office, kitchen and, and facilities in there. Uh, that's the roof plan. And here we have the design of it, uh, as you can see. So single story, but a couple of pitched roofs, some solar panels, uh, vertical timber clad in uh, an external deck area. Um, and these are the, the visualizations of the of the new building. Uh, and this is the aerial of the of the location and note those those trees and these are the photos of the the buildings on site at the moment which i think we can say of uh, of of lived their course let's put it that way um so in terms of the principle we're in the built-up area boundary we've got policy rc6 that supports recreational facilities there's also a policy in the neighborhood plan that supports uh, new and replacement community facilities which this is so principles clearly acceptable of having a, a, a new club and boathouse on the site of an existing uh, club and boathouse and obviously the the investment in the facilities here uh, that are proposed is welcome and will, will enhance that and improve those facilities. In terms of the visual impact it's a slightly larger scale and floor area than the uh, buildings proposed uh, slightly higher uh, uh, but no no more harmful in the visual landscape and in fact the, the 0.9 nine meter raise in the roof isn't harmful the variety of roof forms uh, breaks up the building and the uh, materials and design are, are considered uh, enhanced and lift the site uh, certainly compared to the, the the buildings that are on the site at the moment i did mention the trees so there's a uh, there's a group of trees here that that would need to be failed to make way for the for the building to the southwest boundary they were planted originally we feel to help screen the site uh, from further afield but You'll see from the report that they're, they're unmanaged. They're in quite a poor condition. They've got a limited life. They were planted too close together. So in light of that, the tree officers agreed that, uh, that it's best for those to actually be failed anyway and for, and for the new replacement planting to uh, go uh, around the site. Uh, and that basically in the longer term, that's going to be a gain for this area because these trees have got a, a limited lifestyle, so a lifespan, sorry. So if they were retained, give it a few years, they're going to be in a poor condition or need removing anyway. Um, but that does mean that there'll be tree planting on East Devon land. And for that, there's a there's a legal agreement required. Hence, the uh, recommendation here is to approve it, but subject to conditions and a legal agreement. Uh, there's no concerns in terms of flood zone, although we're in the flood zone because these are, these are water compatible uses. So they're uses that are acceptable uh, in this flood zone. And the building's been designed with raised floor levels to, to to, to deal with those uh, issues. The existing access remains unchanged. There's no harm to residential amenity. And as I say, there's wider recreational educational benefits here. And the environment uh, and uh, Natural England have agreed the uh, appropriate assessment uh, that forms part of the report. So uh, there's policy support for the proposal. It's a good design. It'd be an improvement visually. There's compensation for the loss of those uh, trees that are, are only category Cs anyway. Uh, so low value trees. 
no amenity or highway safety were concerns and there's the wider recreational and educational benefits that have come from this new facility so in light of that the applications uh, recommended uh, for approval but as i say subject to those conditions and the legal agreement to secure those replacement trees thank you thank you very much mr rose so next we move over to committee ward members first on the list i've got councillor davy yes. Chair, I think Mr. Humphreys is there, isn't he? Yeah, yes. that's what I was going oh, to remind is. you. Apologies, I'm skipping ahead too quickly. I do apologise. Thank you very much. Yeah, Mr. Humphreys next. Okay, many thanks, um, Councillor Chamberlain. Um, so the application has been as a result of some extensive dialogue between uh, the District Council planning officers and also bearing in mind the sensitivity of the site, many statutory consultees and our practice, um, and we're grateful for this. Uh, you'll be aware from what Mr. Rose has said that uh, it has resulted in the officers supporting, um, including those statutory consultees and general support of the application from neighbors, uh, the community, the Paris Council, the district council um, officers, and the Exmouth Society, and I quote, Support given to youth organisations promoting high standards of behaviour and good citizenship. Um, in this age of uh, equality, it should be understood that the Fifth Sea Scouts is open to all, including uh, girls and young ladies. The plans as submitted uh, are, we feel, in line with the objectives of the regeneration of the Camperdown Creek and policy E5 of the Exmouth. Neighbourhood Plan 2018 and will not detract in any way from the much valued character of the creek, whilst at the same time continuing with Exmouth seafaring tradition, which has spread over many centuries. Furthermore, the application seems to be in line with the District Council's own document, the Exmouth Master Plan. Um, the scouting facilities to be created are very much in keeping uh, with Exmouth community wishes uh, to enhance the life and youth of the town. Um, and in light of this, they believe that the application should be given every encouragement and support. Um, in tandem to this, uh, they understand, as we now understand, that the District Council now have granted a new 40 year lease um, on the site, therefore enabling um, development, but more importantly, also funding because lease, lates of leases on land um, are predicated exactly on that. As Mr. Rose has pointed out in terms of the aesthetics, the design, the materials, um, massing and setting in the context of the water is considered um, an appropriate response to that uh, context. There is further uh, enhance, enhancement and uh, ecological enhancement as a result of the trees and the wider landscape, which I think is, is very important actually. So the officers have carefully assessed, uh, considered and assessed all of the issues which have been outlined within the report and recommends approval. And so accordingly, um, it is hoped that the committee indeed support the good work of your officers and enact the clear support of the community for this very worthy project. By way of update, uh, the Sea Scouts have worked very hard um, to raise funds over many years to get this current submission. Uh, the original facilities go back to 1964 uh, and the granting of the planning permission will release further and we hope final funding uh, that is currently being negotiated. Uh, finally, then the application is subject to nine conditions as outlined in the officer's <coughs> report. Uh, and I've consulted with my clients who are happy to accept all of these imposed conditions. Thank you for the time and opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, Mr. Humphreys. Next, we now move on to the committee ward members. First of all, Councillor Davey, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, support this application. I have actually been in that 
building uh, during the Exmouth Festival because it has been in use as a sort of changing room and a, it was very shabby and a, a bit embarrassing really that it, it was uh, being used by uh, by artists. Um, it's also uh, been prone to vandalism uh, over the years and uh, people have been uh, spotted tearing panels off it to use as firewood and all sorts of things. And in fact, a local resident uh, from Camperdown Terrace, who I've been in touch with uh, on various issues since I became a councillor, um, and uh, who's also known to me anyway, uh, had been in touch with me about uh, people vandalising the building. So uh, I thought I'd ask him uh, if he had any uh, pointers on this so uh, this is what he, he wrote to me he said the old HQ has held them back is devoid of any services no water sewage or electricity it's old-fashioned and has been vandalized they have a waiting list for new members but are not able to expand the modern building will allow them to progress and concentrate on their invaluable youth work uh, boys and girls deserve better, and I absolutely agree with that. Um, their, their tireless volunteer leaders deserve better. They've designed a relatively modest HQ that will meet their needs for the foreseeable future. And uh, he just uh, adds that the residents of Camperdown have raised several thousand pounds towards the rebuilding fund and will welcome a tidier site on their doorstep. Um, so I am very happy to uh, support this application and I look forward to seeing it going up. Thank you very much, Councillor Davey. Is that a proposal? I'm happy to make it one, yes. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, do we have a seconder? We're going yes, to go I'll second that. Rag next. Lovely, I'll thank you, Councillor Rag. Thank you. We'll come over to you to speak now. Thank you, yes, thank you. This is long, long overdue. I remember having the, uh, the Camperdown Working Group uh, over 20 years ago when um, the Sea Scouts were promised a state-of-the-art building together with the Sea Cadets. Well, this, that didn't happen because the Sea Cadets have an armory um, and uh, they have the backing of the Royal Navy uh, and consequently, they had uh, over £800,000 building erected in Camperdown Terrace. Um, Councillor Davy has already outlined the problems there with the vandalism. And Dave Radford, who's kept the, the ship afloat, if you like, for so many years, always over there, banging in missing planks of, of wood and... Um, as Councillor Davies said, no main services. So this is long, long overdue. It will make a difference to the area. It will make it safer because what's there now is prone to vandalism. And um, that I know that the residents who I've had contact with many, many times over many years uh, will thoroughly welcome this. It will make Camperdown Terrace a safer place. Um, so for all those reasons, I'm more than happy to support and um, can't wait to see it go up. And it's also an area where artists go uh, and the X is famous in paintings. There was Stanby's Sunset, which hangs in the Royal, um, in, the, in the National Gallery. Um, he's buried at St John's. Um, and it, it's... Uh, famous area for artists very often you see them down there um painting the scenery uh, and, the, and the boats and the estuary so uh, it's a lovely area to think that around that area used to be the old dump the tip the municipal tip and now it's been landscaped um and it's a credit it's a credit to the ex estuary so wholeheartedly support this Thank you very much, Councillor Rag. Um, so next we've got committee members. First of all, we've got Councillor Skinner, please. Oh, sorry, I didn't realise I was next. Um, no, I'm just all for it, so I don't need to add anything. Thank you. Oh, it's all been said, and I'm I'm right behind. It. I think it's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Skinner. Next, I have Councillor Desaron, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice Chair. Um, I think that this is a, a great example, as your paperwork can show, of the benefits of having a neighbourhood plan in place. 
And I think it's another, it's an example of a revitalized project coming to Exmouth, which will deliver a, a, a form of urban regeneration. And lastly, I would say it's an excellent, outstanding design, which hopefully, if designed properly, will be an award-winning design, which will again reflect well on Ex Exmouth and, and the town as a whole. Thank you, thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Desarum. Next, I have Councillor Woodward, please. Very much, Vice Chair. Um, yeah, the old building was uh, was a disgrace, really. Um, I'm sure it must have put off a lot of younger people wanting to go in there, wondering what was going to happen to them. Um, but I think this new building is um, really attractive, and I hopefully they will have a lot new of uh, new recruits uh, to the Scouts. I think it's an excellent idea. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Councillor Woodward. And <laughs> uh, last on my list, I have Councillor Gazard, please. Thank you, Vice Chair. Yes, like my colleagues so i really welcome this uh, application it's been as already said it's been long overdue and the, the present building is is so uh, in so much in disrepair and probably is dangerous um the design that we have in front of us is absolutely first class and the tree planting that is going to go around it is going to hopefully keep it uh, safe for many years to come but, um, you know, there's the amount of work that, um, and, and it's been mentioned that, that Dave Bradford does, and that is absolutely outstanding. And the community take uh, the Sea Scouts to their, to their hearts, and um, we wish them all the very best. And like everybody else, I look forward to seeing and going into the new building. Thank you, Vice Chair. Very welcome. Thank you. Councillor Gazard. So we have no more hands up. I have a proposer, Councillor Davy, seconder, Councillor Rag. It's over to you, Mrs. Shaw, please. Thank you, Vice Chair. Yes, members, you have two elements to the recommendation. Firstly, to adopt the appropriate assessment attached to the report and to approve subject to conditions as set out in the report and subject to an appropriate legal agreement to ensure the planting of additional trees on the adjoining land. Members, when your name is called, please would you indicate whether you support the recommendation to approve and the adoption of the appropriate assessment, whether you're against the recommendation to approve and adopt the appropriate assessment, or whether you're abstaining from the vote. Councillor Brown. Support. Thank you. Councillor Chamberlain. Support both, please. Thank you. Councillor Davy. Support approval of everything. Councillor. Thank you. Councillor Thesaran. Support the recommendation of approval and to adopt the assessments. So support everything. Thank you. Councillor Gazard. Support both elements. Councillor Lawrence. Support everything. Councillor Pratt. Support. Councillor Skinner. Support. Councillor Woodward. Support both. Yep. Councillor Rag. Support both. Thank you. Thank you. That's recommended for approval. Great. Thank you very much, Wendy. Back over to Councillor Rag. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, agenda item 18, application 21. 3182 full for 6 Stevens Lane, Sidmouth, pages 170 to 174. And this application is here because um, the applicant is uh, our relatives of two council employees. So um, over to you, Mr. Rose. Ed, it says Ed. <laughs> I know, it was my, it's my fault, sorry. It's all right. Minded. Very long day. <laughs> uh, uh, so we've got an application here for a single story rear extension, as you say, related to member of staff. Members may recall this site because there was a recent application before you, but for a flat roof single story extension. That was approved on the 24th of November committee, and we've now got a proposal for to replace the conservatory with this rear extension, but this time with a pitched roof. Uh, and relocation of the of the doors. So we get this extension, but this time, rather than the pitched roof, uh, rather than the flat roof, we get a pitched roof. You can see it's a site in quite a large plot, single story to a bungalow, so no harm, no overlooking of neighbouring properties, and there's no concern in terms of the adding a, a pitch to the roof. 
So here's the existing conservatory. So instead of a flat roof extension, we'll now have one with a pitched roof that, that matches the character of the area. So yeah. the design's in keeping, no harm to the neighbouring amenity. Materials are acceptable and therefore it's recommended for approval. Councillor Skinner. Thank you. Go with the recommendation. I've had nothing else to add. Thank you very much. Second, Second that. Yeah. Tony Woodward. Councillor out. Oh, Councillor Woodward. Anybody want to add anything? Do you want to speak on it, Tony? No, it looks a wonderful idea. Yep. Right, thank you. No more hands up. So over to you, Mrs. Shaw. Thank you, Chair. Yes, members, you have a motion to recommend approval with the conditions as set out in the report. Please, when your name is called, would you indicate whether you're in support of the recommendation to approve, whether you're against the recommendation to approve, or whether you're abstaining from the vote? Councillor Brown. Support. Councillor Chamberlain. Support. Councillor Davey. Support. Councillor De Serum. Support approval. Councillor Cazard. Support. Councillor Lawrence. Support. Councillor Pratt. Support. Councillor Skinner. Support. Councillor Woodward. Support approval. Councillor Rag. Support approval. And the final one is recommended for approval. Thank you. Well, members, that brings our meeting to an end, and I'd like to thank everyone, including members of the public, for their attendance. Also, all the speakers who've been along here today. Um, members, can I remind you that until the Democratic Services team confirm that the live streaming recording has stopped, you can still be seen and heard, and any comments made may be recorded. I'd like to th thank the officers. Um, for all their help today and to you members we've had some interesting applications today and I think we've all learned something so thank you as ever for your input um I quite enjoy this committee now <laughs>